On January 30th, 2024, Ancient Faith Radio released an audio documentary entitled The Orthodox Deaconess, Examining the Call for Restoration. In that one hour and 45 minute documentary, there were 16 diverse voices representing Orthodox Christians who were both in favor and opposed to the restoration. In the audio file you're listening to now, you'll be able to hear the complete interview or comments of all 16 individuals. The description provides timestamps so that you can easily find the person you are interested in hearing more from. As we mentioned in the documentary itself, our goal was to provide a forum for reasonable, respectful discussion that furthers the Ancient Faith Ministry's mission to educate, edify, and evangelize. While we never intend to present material that is not in line with the teachings of the Orthodox Church, there are topics where the Church does not have a unified, stated position. And this is true of our topic today. People have conflicting opinions about the history and function of the female diaconate and whether that role should be restored today. So, in light of that, you need to know that we at Ancient Faith do not necessarily endorse the opinions of all the people we interviewed. We do, however, express our gratitude for their willingness to speak to us. Next, we're talking with His Eminence, the Most Reverend Saba. He is the Archbishop of New York and Metropolitan of the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of North America. And Your Eminence, we are honored that you would speak with us today. Me too. So what are your feelings about the role of women in the Antiochian Orthodox Church today? In other words, what ministry is open to them? Usually in the Antiochian Church, Women uh, is existed in many fields of the church ministry, especially the charity uh, societies, in the parish councils, and uh, in the council of uh, the archbishop, archbishopric everywhere. So, uh, in the teaching and the Christian education, women um, in the Ethiopian uh, church. Uh, don't feel that they are out of the church or out of the church ministry. And Your Eminence, in light of the venerable history of the See of Antioch, which goes back really to the New Testament itself, what can you tell us about the practice of ordaining female deacons throughout the centuries of the Antiochian See? Well, the New Testament is the clear from the beginning, women were a group with Christ and his disciples. They used to help them and to, to be with them and to accompany them in different um, places, as we can understand it from the New Testament. But when Christ uh, established the uh, Last Supper and Eucharist, he asked uh, just his disciples to be with him. That means priesthood is a ministry of the male people, not female. That is, the, we understand that on the talent uh, background, there is talent or gifts for each uh, sex of, of the people. There is something for the male and something for the female. So we understand that from this viewpoint, priesthood was given by Christ to his disciples, not to the women who were with Christ and accompany Christ during his uh, visits and journeys uh, around Palestine when he was on our earth. He gave them, for example, the ministry of preaching when he told the women for the before he told the disciples that he was resurrected from the dead. He is alive. So there is talents. Uh, we need to know our talents in the church. For everyone, men or women. I look at, uh, at this question from this viewpoint. 
And so uh, we do have history uh, from the Byzantine era uh, and obviously from the New Testament with uh, Phoebe, who was first called a deacon or deaconess in Romans 16. And I'm just wondering if there is any history of female deacons in the Antiochian archdiocese or in the patriarch of uh, Antioch. Now we don't have. But there are some voices who want uh, to have a deaconess, but uh, they wait and they study because we should know what the function of the deaconess was in the first centuries of uh, the church. This is the first point. Second point, we should know well and very well why we have no deaconess after the fifth century and completely we have no after the nine uh, ten centuries why this ministry was stopped uh, the third point also uh, we should know very well why we need and we want deaconess now do we need deaconess now because we want to activate the pastoral ministry in the church because our complicated society needs many new ministries, many workers in the field of God, or because we are motivated or influenced by the humanistic movements which are everywhere now and in all the media. The motivation which is behind this ministry in in the church is very, very important. We should do everything in the church, whatever we need, whatever we want, we should be done, should be done by a pure mind and loyal to the faith and to the Orthodox tradition. So it appears as if, uh, as of now anyway, there has not really been any discussion at the synod or local level about ordaining female deacons in our time uh, today. Would that be correct? Uh, yes, but in the Antiochian church uh, in general, uh, deaconess is not so crucial issue or uh, to have debate about it. Uh, I'll give you um, some examples. There is an archdiocese in Lebanon where there are three girls who want to be deacons to work in the church and they want to uh, consecrate their life to the service of the church. So the metropolitan accepts them because they are his spiritual daughters and he ordains them at last after some years, he ordains them uh, nuns and they uh, wear the nuns clothes uh, and they live as nuns but instead they uh, work in the land uh, or in sewing or in something inside the monastery they work in uh, preaching and the christian education and helping the youth and the and women and some families this is one one example i give you an, an example from uh, greece because I was interested, and I still interested, by diaconate ministry in the church in general, not just female. Yes. That diaconate, uh, diaconia ministry. I was in uh, Greece in 2007, and I visited a huge uh, center for Lydia Fellowship. Lydia Fellowship, it is from the Lydia, the name of these women who received uh, St. Paul in Philippi uh, city, and she was the first European to accept a Christian faith from St. Paul. Uh, there are about 150 women. This is a huge center, nine floors. They have publishing house. It, it was at that time the most uh, technical in Greece. And uh, they do many, many ministries, some of them work in their cities as teachers, as doctors, uh, in the media. They have television TV, religious television TV. They receive at that time 300 
children from Kosovo and Bosnia, uh, they came to, to help them psychologically in their center. I want to say that they have a huge ministry. They wear uh, what we call it a suit of long skirt and jacket. They put nothing on their head, but they have different uh, style, unified style for their hair. Uh, very simple. I met uh, them and they received me very well. I met uh, their uh, spiritual father, who was very pure man, he was old man. Where we were talking, he told me that there is a debate between them and uh, Gregorio Monastery in the Holy Mountain. They call themselves a nuns. The Gregorio Monastery doesn't accept that they are nuns because their life is not traditional according to the uh, monastic life in the Orthodox Church. They go out of their monastery and they do ministry, they minister in different fields. So during our discussion, I told him why you don't call them yourselves a deaconess. Hmm. You work like like deacon in different ministries, but not in liturgical uh, field. Yes. So why you insist upon naming yourselves nuns? The monastic life, according to the Orthodox tradition, especially after St. Basil the Great, has a sikhiya, the prayer life. You don't live in such a way. So why you insist to be named nuns, call deaconess? He couldn't understand mm. me. So I tried to give him some example. I told him, you work like the Latin orders. Of course, he was so upset, he couldn't. Mm -hmm. he, he, he supposed that I accused him. I told him, little bit further. Do you know what Latin nuns work? He told me, no, I didn't meet one time Latin nuns. So I explained to him, even in the Catholic Church, some orders now call themselves mercenaries, not nuns, because they started to see that they don't live according to the traditional monastic life. So. That means why I am saying this example. I believe that there is a debate in the Orthodox Church to find a ministry to the women, but they don't know what is the position of women until now. So I believe we should think, we should pray, we should discuss to find the best position but not because we are influenced by humanistic movements. Whatever these movements are good. Our motive could be what the church needs and how we can be loyal to our faith and to our church, not to do our witness. That's really very interesting, uh, Your Eminence, and I, I greatly appreciate the examples of both Lebanon and Greece, churches who were reacting to a genuine need and commissioned women to help meet that need and had them do specific things, uh, dressing a certain way, but not looking like nuns. And so you rightly asked, well, obviously they're not nuns. Aren't they more like deaconesses? And uh, so I think that is kind of at the heart of what this debate needs to center on, because you are absolutely right. Why? Why do we ask for deaconesses? Is it so that we can say, well, we are treating men and women alike? Look, uh, women have just as much presence in the church as men do. Or are we reacting to a genuine need that the Holy Spirit is instructing us to address in some way? Would, That's would, it. That's that, it. Yeah, okay. That's it. We should we should open the way. We should not prevent the Holy Spirit to not still working 
But at the same time, we should wait his word, not do our own works and say this is the Holy Spirit work. It is something very sensitive, very accurate. We need prayer life. Uh, we need intensive uh, purification to know, and we need to ask is our each each other. We need counsel cons to counsel the others, to ask the opinion of the other, not to insist upon just my mind, hmm. my mind. We are community in the church. We are one one group in Christ. So we should talk with each other, and we should be patient and honest at, at the same time. Because today, whatever the step we we have or we decide, it is not easy, it is dangerous. Because of the feminist movement, which press upon some Orthodox people to do something in the church under its influence. Mm. We should be aware because at the same time, many of the loyal Orthodox people uh, are uh, in fears because what step, a new step we do, maybe it is a first step to priesthood. So we should be so aware, be attentive to the unity of the church at the same time. I really appreciate you saying that because those who have expressed concern to me about the restoration of the female diaconate Many of them come from liberal Protestant backgrounds, where in the yes. Episcopal Church yes. or the yes. liberal Lutheran Church, they have seen female deacons become priests and female priests become bishops, and that worries them. And I really appreciate the wisdom and counsel that, that you would give to Thank you. be patient Thank you. and uh, let's Thank talk you. together. Let's not assume bad motives. And I and what you're saying and how you've articulated is exactly the heart of what we're trying to do with this documentary. So thank you so much for that. Now, Your Thank Eminence, you, T. Thank you, John. Yes. Ah, yes. I was brought into the Orthodox Church through the Antiochian Archdiocese, and I'm very grateful for that. And one thing I noticed early on is that the Antiochian Church is one of a few churches that will take female infants behind the altar as part of the churching service. And you don't see that often in, in other jurisdictions. And I just wonder uh, what is behind that and what message should that send to uh, women today? Let me correct first. Please, yes. Not all the archdiocese, and not all the priests who do that in the Antiochian church, uh, archdiocese. Okay, all right. But let me tell you uh, the history of the, this practice. After the fall of Constantinople, we know that Ottoman Empire dominated over the majority of the Orthodox Church's countries, even Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, Egypt, Greece, Serbia, you know, around the Mediterranean. Yes. So, and we know that the Orthodox Church had very dark time at that time. And liturgical and theological situation of the church deteriorated. We, we had degradation at that time. Because I tell you, in, in Syria, Lebanon, in Antioch countries, all the monasteries were destroyed. We had no monastic life at that time. The monks uh, used to uh, serve the parishes as priests because we have no educated priests. And later, priests were so ignorant because we had no uh, monasteries where uh, seminarians used to be learned how to be priests and to know their faith and to study theology. So one of the degradation we had is in the liturgical field. And many practices started to be influenced by the society values. For this reason, you find in the old books, not very old, it's books from the 18th century or uh, 19th century, uh, you see the practice for the new infant baby who comes 
with his parents for the first time uh, to the church. This practice or instruction says if he is a baby, a uh, male baby, uh, the priest pray for him in front of the uh, icons of Constances, icon of Christ and the Philotokos, and then he came in, he come in, comes in, uh, the sanctuary and turn around the holy baby. If he is a, a female baby, he doesn't come in. This is not the true. This is not the true. The orthodox practice is all the infants, if they are not baptized, should not come in the sanctuary. The general rule in the Orthodox Church, sanctuary should not be entered by unbaptized people. This is the rule, the real true rule in the Orthodox Church. So in the last years, some priests start and some people start to say, why male baby can go in the sanctuary and uh, female baby cannot? So they are equal, they are Christian of God and something like that. But the real practice is the both should not come in. And now, thank God, our patriarch is lit liturgist. He has doctorate of liturgy. And he is a monk in the Holy Mountain. He was ordained in the Holy Mountain yes. as a monk and stayed two years there uh, in St. Paul Monastery. So we have some corrections of different practices during the last 30 years, but we have to do more. So step by step, as we say in Greek, siga, siga, mm -hmm. we do some correction here and there. But this is a true tradition. Unbaptized people, infant, old people, whatever, should not enter the sanctuary. And for those of According our listeners who are new to the Orthodox faith, uh, you should know that what we're talking about is at the churching service, and the churching service happens before baptism. And so what His Eminence, yes. I believe, is saying is that because the baby, male or female, has not yet been baptized during that churching service, That's it. That's they, sh they should not. But first, okay. But first, uh, at first, uh, John, the Orthodox people and the Orthodox priests should accept this real and true practice. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> because what, what you used to do be, becomes... Uh, as a tradition yeah. sometimes and believe you can't leave it easily for this reason we should be patient with each other mm. but we should teach the true uh, and the straight face and the practice of our face very well put thank you for that so let's say that the move toward uh, the restoration of the female diaconate in our time today kind of picks up some steam, and now maybe you'll have one jurisdiction in the Assembly of Bishops saying, you know what, we're going to do this. Uh, we feel it is time to restore uh, the female diaconate, and so we are announcing an ordination service for so-and-so, and they do it. Would that be a concern to other jurisdictions who are a part of the Assembly of Orthodox Bishops that could potentially affect unity if you did not all make that decision together? First, I have no uh, enough information about Fiji uh, movement. What they are doing, what they are planning for, I don't know. But I think whatever any jurisdiction does alone have negative influence upon the other jurisdictions and the unity of Orthodox the churches and jurisdiction about the unity of orthodoxy in, in America. We should be aware of this. Our unity means our witness to our true faith. When our unity is broken, that means our witness is broken also. This is more important than anything else, according to my mind. So, Your Eminence, we have people listening to our interview today who are both 
in favor of a restoration of the female diaconate today and who are opposed to it. And I just wonder what message would you like to send to both of those groups as this matter is being discussed uh, in the church today? I can say whatever your position is, we should be patient with each other and we should pray fervently and we should wait, wait a sign from God. Do not do from ourselves. Do not do our will. We should help each other to do the will of God in the exact time. For this reason, we need, we need patience and prayers. And love, love, love. Yes, I'm glad you, I'm glad you added that. Sometimes we get so passionate about what we want to see happen, we forget that we are speaking yes. with uh, other people who are made in the image of God and who really come to the same chalice as we do on Sunday mornings. I mean, these are our brothers and sisters, whether we agree with them uh, or not. So thank you for adding that. Yes, you know, purification is the most important step in the Orthodox tradition. Hmm. We should work hard to purify ourselves. We cannot do it by ourselves. We need the grace of God and we need the help of the brothers and sisters. We are one family. Mm. I don't work for my own salvation. I am saved by my brothers and sisters. Let us remember the word of Saint Silvan of Asos. My brothers is my salvation. That's His Eminence, the Most Reverend Saba. He's the Archbishop of New York and Metropolitan of the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of North America. And I'm John Maddox. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Edith M. Humphrey who is the retired William F. Orr Professor of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and still teaching classes uh, there. And uh, we also know her from uh, her wonderful podcast, uh, A Lamp for Today. And uh, Dr. Humphrey, thank you. You've been on with us before, but thanks for coming on again. You're welcome, John. Really good to be here. So we're talking about the female diaconate, and your perspective, I think, will be very helpful to us because we'd like to know the historic precedent for the female diaconate in Scripture and the early church, and relatedly, was it universal? So certainly the female diaconate was not universal in history, but it was found in certain prominent places like Constantinople, and it was certainly more prominent in the East than in the West. It died out quite quickly in the West, and the reasons for that are a little obscure. But in the East, it continued, and we have some very good evidence for that, including our dear golden mouth saint, St. John Chrysostom, who speaks um, with fondness about um, a particular uh, deaconess. So we do have historical precedents for it. Um, there are gaps in the historical evidence, but silence doesn't mean that women deacons didn't exist. Sometimes we just assume because we don't hear about it that it wasn't going on there. In some cases, their role may have been taken for granted. There was no controversy, so there was no need to talk about it. Uh, we have various uh, indications that there was some debate and some controversy as to uh, what women deacons should do. There are some very early documents that talk about their role. And there are some canons that regulate the role, not all of which agree with each other. And um, there are some prominent uh, theologians like Origen and Chrysostom and Clement of Alexandria and Theodoret who all talk about women deacons and trace them right back to the apostolic witness to the New Testament. All right, then let's talk about St. Phoebe herself. In Romans 16, as you well know, mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul commends Phoebe, the deaconess. And so uh, do you see a role and a function as deaconess in the New Testament, starting with Phoebe, that carried forward in the uh, early church? So this is really difficult because we only have 
two brief verses talking about Phoebe in Romans chapter 16. And there she is called deacon. The word is the same as for male, but it has the feminine pronoun. So we would say deaconess, but there actually is a Greek word that means deaconess. It's just a female deacon at a particular church. And um, the Romans are being asked to receive her as befits the saints. So There is not here an appeal to her status, but the fact that they are saints and she is a saint, she's a sister with them, and to help her in whatever um, she requires because she has been a helper of many and of myself as well. So Paul sees her as someone who is a kind of patroness. There were um, both male and female patrons in the past, and she was continuing rather the role of the women who followed Jesus and the apostles during their ministry and helping them in everything that um, they had to do. We don't know what her role was. We do know that she had a particular, well, we don't. There is actual debate as to whether that word deacon simply in in this case means someone who is in service. But it looks a little more formal than that because she's the first that he commends to them. And it looks as though he has some particular thing that he has in mind for her to do. So that probably the historian would say there's some kind of special role that she has in the Church of Cancray that takes her away from there and um, is taking her to Rome and that she is running messages and doing various things for Paul and for some of the other apostles. Very interesting. I suppose regardless of what she specifically did, there definitely was a tradition of the female deacon in the very early church. You had mentioned St. John Chrysostom, but there are others as well. Can you talk about that in the very early church? Sure. So the earliest um, actual reference that we have to them is uh, a reference by a not a Christian, Pliny, who talks about how two women ministers or deacons, uh, and he says called deacons, so he gives them that title, they're called deacons by the Christians in the church, had been arrested and refused to forswear Christ and were tortured. Mm. So that's our first reference. Within Christian literature, we have reference in the early third century in the work known as the Didascalia and in the Apostolic Constitutions, the fourth century, which is more than just mention. It actually talks about various things that women deacons did. And um, the Apostolic Constitution actually gives us the earliest liturgy that we have for their Was it an ordination? Was it an appointment? That's a debated matter. So they're not just mentioned there, but they are actually talked about at some length in those two documents. Um, Origen and Chrysostom and Clement of Alexandria and the theologian Theodoret read the Old Testament references to Romans 16, that's the Phoebe reference, and to the women Um, who are talked about within the context of the diaconate in 1 Timothy chapter 3, as actually referring to an early order that was apostolic. We also have archaeological evidence, such as tombstones that name women deacons, and one of them actually nicely says, this is the new Phoebe. Oh. So, and then there are canons that mention them, how old they ought to be, whether they can be married or not, and these don't all agree to, with each other, and so on. And then uh, after that, later on in the 8th century, there's a Byzantine rite in which we hear how women were, in fact, either ordained or appointed. And again, that's a debated matter. So are they to be considered uh, part of the, uh, the equivalent of a deacon and therefore part of the three higher orders? Or are we talking more about a tonsuring? Um, a kind of appointment in which they would be somewhere around the level of subdeacon or reader. You know, if we want to talk about levels in the church, that that's problematic in itself. Yeah, so and the a... problem is different words are used, yeah, right? So yeah. were these words always being consistently used to mean different things? No. So we, we really don't know. Yeah, and, and I like that approach that you're taking and not being dogmatic about something that we, we don't really know because as I've done these interviews, I've heard some make strong cases for there being uh, minor orders, you know, like a reader, like a subdeacon. Others are making strong cases for there being major orders. And what I'm finding is both opponents and proponents are making kind of sometimes the same argument and sometimes different. So uh, I like your approach. I said, well, maybe <laughs> let's... I mean, let's not get too dogmatic here uh, about what they were. 
And it may not have been consistent across the board. Mm. It looks when we look at some documents as though they were being classed uh, alongside the deacons, although they never had exactly the same liturgical function ever. Ah. Um, and it looks in other cases like they were being classed with the lower orders. And, um, you know, history is messy. Mm-hmm. Um, not the same traditions across various jurisdictions even today. So why would we expect that to be the case in a time when um, there was less travel and less communication? Things developed. And in the West, women deacons, uh, as I say, they died out quite early. And, and some of the academic work that has been done, this, the strongest academic work that has been done in the case against women being ordained comes from the Roman Catholic tradition, where in the West, the women diaconate um, died out quite early. Mm. And so I think we need to take that seriously. And perhaps some of our Orthodox theologians need to do their own work and not be dependent just on these uh, larger tomes from the Roman Catholic conservative side. Well, that's a but, good point. Yeah. Because so when you think about the West, you know, we we usually think about the Roman Catholic. But if we're talking pre schism mm-hmm. we're talking Orthodoxy. And yes. so uh, were there differences East and West pre schism about how the sure. differences were Absolutely. As I say, the West early became very suspicious of the role of of women. And I do think that that, that this has something to do with their rigid hierarchical attitude towards the body of Christ, Mm -hmm. where you have the Pope on the top going down to the into the cardinals, going down, going down, going down. In orthodoxy, we have much more of a family idea, and we don't spell things out distinctly in this way. So when a a male layperson becomes a deacon in orthodoxy, you know, we've had a permanent diaconate for some time in Roman Catholicism. That died out right? And it was just reinstituted back in the 60s. So they had idea that that this is a stepping stone up to a priest and then up to a bishop if that consecration takes place. Whereas in Orthodoxy, that that was in the East, that that was never the assumption. The deacon had a particular role and and the deacons and the priests and the bishops together had ministry, by the way, along with the rest of the laity. Dr. Humphrey, you're really raising some great thought-provoking questions here. And and so one of them it makes me want to ask you about relates to function. So let's talk about the diaconate as a whole first, uh, as we know Mm -hmm. it today. And right now they are male deacons only. You know, that's a given uh, in most places. The role of what the deacon has become in the Orthodox Church, how does that compare with how it was intended, uh, if you even go back to the Book of Acts, and then in the Byzantine era and the early centuries of the church, has that role evolved? Because it seems like the deacon today is basically a liturgical function. Right. I mean, that isn't the way it is in our parish. No, interesting. Our deacons, of course, have our deacons, of course, have a liturgical function, but they are very involved in the well-being of the community and the well-being of the people. And they head up things like um, community um, outreach. They spur people to prayer at particular times. You know, we have an Advent time of, of reading the Psalms. They are involved in more than just liturgy. So it is true that um, in some places, the liturgical function of the diaconate is um, uppermost. But I think that the other helping ministries um, have not died out everywhere. And I think that that is a really, really good thing because the priest can't do everything and the laity need guidance in how to minister to each other and how to minister to their communities. Going back to Acts, um, certainly there was a debate in the early church with regards to whether the Greek-speaking and these are still Jews, right? But the Greek-speaking Jewish Christians, the Greek-speaking Christians um, and their poor were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. You remember they held all things in common or the daily distribution of funding. Yes. And, um, and so the deacons were appointed from among them in order to carry that out. And so that there would be no question with regards to fairness because they came from that Greek-speaking community and they worked alongside 
the apostles in doing this. But very, almost immediately, as the Hellenists are given these deacons, remember, they have to be men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, and they're going to be given the duty of the daily distribution. But almost immediately, the very first thing that we hear is that Stephen, who's the first one who's mentioned, who's full of faith in the Spirit, starts to perform miracles and preaches and witnesses to Christ. So he's not just doing daily distribution of the food. He is already exercising a prophetic and instructive ministry right there. And that's approved, obviously, by Luke the Evangelist, who talks about how he has a face like an angel, and uh, Stephen becomes the first martyr. And the same with Philip. You know, he maybe is supposed to be seeing to the distribution of goods, Mm -hmm. but he ends up going and talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. So right from the get-go, they're doing more than just help. They're helping, but they're also proclaiming. Now, as for their liturgical function, who knows? Nothing said about that. Nothing. Yeah, and I want to get to that. Uh, And it occurs to me that, uh, you know, in churches where uh, deacons are primarily playing a liturgical role, there may be very practical reasons for that, not the least of which is that uh, on Monday they go back to work (laughs) in their secular jobs. And so uh, they're not exactly a lot of time available to them uh, any more than the rest of us who uh, work for a living, or some of us used to. And (laughs) we... uh, uh, we need to be, you know, give them a little more uh, credit for desiring to do it, but maybe not having the time. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about function. So I want to read to you something from the St. Phoebe Center for Deaconesses, who are part of our documentary, and we greatly appreciate that, because I'm trying to dial in on what is being proposed, uh, because the purpose of the center is the restoration of the female uh, diaconate. And as we can see, historically, it cannot be denied that there were female deacons and they played roles. But in their document, which is relatively recent, where they are proposing some guidelines, and I want to emphasize this is a proposal. I'm sure they are just trying to float some things and see uh, you know, what kind of feedback they get. But when it comes to function... Here's what it says. With the major orders ordination, so there's an assumption there that we're talking major orders, a deaconess would meet the traditional criteria for fulfilling a variety of liturgical roles. These would include all of the liturgical functions in which male deacons serve. For example, a deaconess could offer petitions, sense during vespers and orthros, read the gospel within the liturgy, join in processions, small entrance, great entrance, vesperal entrances, etc., help with preparing the holy gifts, give sermons during the liturgy, help with giving communion to the faithful, and take the sacrament of communion to those who are ill or confined to their homes. All of these liturgical duties are the extension and expression of the sacramental ministry of the deaconess conferred upon her in ordination, connecting the church and the world in the traditional expression of diaconal ministry. So, my question for you, what is the precedence for the role of a deaconess, a female deacon, to serve liturgically in the history of the church? Are we talking restoration here, or is this something new? It sounds like something quite new to me. Uh, When I look at the evidence that we have about what the female diaconate was involved in in the past, the liturgical role was very limited. It looks like it was there in some places. For example, in monastic communities, someone who had it was an abbess who had been appointed or ordained, and again, I'm leaving, I'm leaving that open to the role of the diaconate, had some access to the altar, just as she can have today sometimes when necessary. There can be some helping of uh, the bishop at the altar in some situations in the past when there is no male deacon. It's always a default position. In some places, it may be that she read the epistle publicly or the Psalms. That is very limited. If she taught, 
Her teaching was confined mostly to women and to children in the past. If she took the sacrament to ill people, it was to women who were at home and to younger children so that they would not confuse her. It looks like here I'm interpreting so that they would not confuse her role with that of the deacon or the priest. So in the liturgy, she it looks as though she had the role to keep order, just as deacons kept order in the male quarter, women deacons kept order in the female quarter to make sure that they, the women were paying attention and not talking. And her role was to be the main prayer at the front of that group at her ordination or her appointment, whichever we understand that to be. She is allowed to communicate herself with the chalice, but she does not immediately then go out to the people and give communion to them. She communicates herself and replaces the chalice back on the altar. So she has a limited access to the holy mysteries, but not the same access male deacon. And that's very clear. We have no no sense of her leading in prayer in the liturgies. There's no record of that. So these various contemporary roles that are being suggested for the woman deacon by this document actually lean on the word extension, right? This is supposed to be, they say, an expression and an extension of the role. Well, this these are certainly extensions, and they see this as possible because they understand that a lot of the limitations that were placed on women deacons in the past had to do with cultural context, and we no longer are in that cultural context. This is not saying we're looking at the past and we're reclaiming it. This is saying we're looking at the past and we are adapting it to our situation today. And whether that is legitimate or helpful is a question. All right. So let's let's explore that just for a second, uh, because you did say this is quite new and you also just kind of reiterated that. So we almost have two questions related to whether or not you would be in favor uh, of a reinstatement. And I don't know if the answer is going to be the same to both. We'll find out. So would you oppose the reinstatement of deaconesses with the vision that the St. Phoebe Center has about uh, what you call an enhancement or adding the liturgical function similar to the male deacon? Let's start there. So, yes, I would at this. Well, I would, period. Yes, I would. Um, And the reason why is because I do not believe that we have done the historical work carefully enough. And I do not believe that we have thought about the interconnection of the role of the woman deacon with questions of theological anthropology. That is what it is to be a male and female with Christology and with Trinitarian doctrine. This is not a standalone issue. Father Tom Hopko of Blessed Memory said the debate about women is in a real sense a debate about the Christian faith itself. So it's a very complicated question that we don't have all the background answers to yet. The orthodox doctrine of what it is to be a human being is not fully developed. That's the question of our age. And when we look back at different fathers, we see that they say different things, for example, about the nature and permanence of our human condition and two sexes. We have to work this through, just like they worked through Christology back in the time of the Aryan uh, debate. We're in the middle of a debate about what it is to be a human being. And so to introduce something in this way hastily with assumptions that she is going to have a parallel role to uh, the diaconate such as it is today, the male diaconate, it's, I think, going to cause more problems than good. All right, then let's ask that second question uh, related to, apart from that liturgical role, if what is actually being proposed were restoration of the deaconess in the same roles as existed in earlier church history, uh, and those have been available to see both uh, early church and even in the Byzantine era, there were functions that were carried out by female deacons. Uh, Should that be restored? Answering this is going to be a little bit less definite. I think that we need to make a difference between what may be in principle good and what would be helpful for the church right now today. 
and we have a lack of clarity also with regards to whether we're talking about the female diaconate in terms of an ordination or in terms of an appointment, which would need to be discussed and need to be thought through very clearly. Um, It's not just a matter of a kind of a slippery slope argument. It's a matter of our being in this day and age confused generally about what is the the, um, mode in which a female Christian is made in the image of God and shows forth the excellence of God and the way in which a male Christian does that and how we do that together. We have unanswered questions. So first of all, what would we be ordaining them? Would we be ordaining them or appointing them? You know, that's the first question. The second would be, how will the faithful understand the role of this particular woman? And what is to be gained by making something formal that could be done with the bishop's informal blessing or the priest's informal blessing within the family of God the way it is right now? Now, so that's the negative side. The positive side is that I can see particular situations where a woman would be particularly helped by a wiser woman who's been authorized to do this by the bishop and or the priest. So cases of sexual abuse, uh, delicate questions that have to do with sexuality, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, menopausal women who've been counseled by, say, some uh, rigorous monks that they shouldn't be having um, relations with their husbands anymore, women who've gone through traumatic birth experiences, women who are ashamed about uh, their sexual behavior, about abortion, all those kinds of things, um, I think, cry out for wise women to be of help to other younger women and women who are their peers in the church. And so in principle, in principle, I think that a limited female diaconate would be helpful in the church. However, I'm not sure, again, that it might not cause, if we make this to be a formal thing right now, good because of the general confusion that we have with regards to males and females today in society. And that's led right into the church. So that's a lot of people think in the church today, the only difference is is physical and there isn't a particular um, female charism or male charism, which um, the tradition tells us clearly that there is. I would imagine, though, they could make the argument that when when will that ever be the case? When will there not be a cultural confusion about uh, gender identity? Are you basically relegating this to never? Well, I guess I would say when you, those of you who are advocating for female diaconate, stop using sleight of hand and telling us that it's certain that they were ordained and not just appointed. And when um, you stop uh, wanting to envision, here's a, a word of, of one of them, envision the church is capable of considering the other ordained ministries for women opening up the conversation uh, to uh, having women in the priesthood and the diaconate. And also when many of you who are about uh, the female diaconate stop talking also about same-sex relations and the importance of um, of opening up the community to those uh, who are presenting themselves as, as having a particular identity and who are not in Um, agreement with the church's stands, when that happens, then I think that we might be ready to actually have this discussion and to move forward. So you see kind of an association of these cultural uh, arguments uh, kind of playing out in the call for the uh, deaconess? I I do. I do. Um, And sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's not so subtle. Certainly, um, though there have been clear statements that we're only talking about the diaconate, we're not talking about priests and and, uh, bishops. There have been uh, both clear statements and subtle statements opening up the possibility of um, the discussion moving beyond the diaconate among those who are 
uh, proponents of the female diaconate. For example, or, ordaining deaconesses will inevitably lead to a conversation about women in the priesthood. Or in another more subtle case and, and much more careful, another proponent said it would be foolhardy to rush out as a proponent for the ordination of women to the other two orders based on this view of theology. But then this person goes on to say um, New theological investigations would necessarily explore the spiritual reality undergirding all three orders of ordained ministry. So it's being left open as to whether this is a first step. Okay. And so it's not a matter of slippery slope. It's looking at the arguments that they are giving when they insist that this is uh, ordination and given their understanding of the three orders being a unity naturally the other questions are going to come forward. And and um, once that happens, um, those of us who are concerned about the iconic representation of males and females, I think we have cause to be um, a little worried that that richness will be lost and will uh, simply be a flat church without a response and call between um, those who are leading in the liturgy and those who are responding. Mm. So, Dr. Humphrey, you have beautiful grandchildren, as I do. And uh, imagine a conversation with a, a young lady who comes to you and says, you know, I don't get it. Uh, why are females treated differently in our Orthodox Church? Why don't I ever see uh, a female priest or a female deacon? Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't seem fair to me, and it seems like you are limiting me. Uh, I want to stay Orthodox, but I, I worry about that. Um, and so here is a non-seminary trained, non-historian, uh, basically what they see before their eyes concerns them. How can we help them understand where we are today and why it should not change? Right. Well, I think, first of all, the church as a whole does need to admit that in some cases, the expression of faith of women in the church has been uh, muted and has not been understood as a natural part of our life. And that's a shame because from the New Testament on, we have the Holy Spirit descending upon men and women, children and old. Uh, you know, that, that wonderful passage that Peter, um, uh, where Peter speaks about this in the Acts, um, and he quotes the prophet Joel, that your men and women will prophesy. So we do have this full-blown idea of the ministry of the whole people of God. But we have it also alongside a family understanding of how we fit together. And so I would try to um, put before this young person an imaginative view of a family in which every single me member matters but that doesn't mean necessarily that what one does, the other does. And I would also think, and this could be something that we could work on as a church, we need to stop thinking about the ordination of certain males to priesthood and a diaconate and episcopate as, in the first place, an honor. Yes, we honor them, for sure. There are leaders, they need our honor, they have a lot to deal with. But in the first place, this is a service to the church. We think of, you know, Jesus himself, who didn't come to, to be served, but to serve. We think of the Jesus who made himself of no reputation and took on the form of a slave so that he might be raised up. And that's our pattern. And so if the ministry of men is seen as a service rather than a dignified position. And it's put forward that way. And the men who are involved in this, and I know many who do, um, have that approach to their congregation, then that changes matters, I think, for this young woman. I would say to her also, look, you know, in the normal run of things, women are always serving at the table. Look at the amazing picture that happens at the altar and at the chalice where a male does the serving. 
And look at how that tells us about how the greatest one, the highest God of all, made himself of no reputation and came among us to serve us. Mm. If you put a woman there, you're not going to see that dramatic, wonderful event of the one who is the greatest becoming the least for us. You're just going to see what you see all the time in society, women doing the hard work. So that's the vision that I would put before her. And then I was saying, and here are the things that we would love for you to be involved in. There and go. there should be many. There should be many. Yeah, yeah. And I just wonder, let's uh, look around our own nave and look at the iconography and maybe take a tour with these yeah. wonderful young ladies to show them the heroes of the faith that are female, that uh, we have more than any other Christian tradition, I feel, a celebration of the role of strong, godly women who yeah. uh, served the church, whether we call them equal to the apostles or you know the holy mother of God, yeah. the Theotokos. Uh, yeah. These are just wonderful examples of, of strong women who served mightily, yet humbly, uh, the Indeed. Church of Christ. Indeed. And, and I mean, some of these women um, were very necessary to nurture the work of the theologians that formed our faith. Without them, we would not have the theology that we have. And of course, you know, when Protestants come into our sanctuaries and they see the Theotokos um, presenting, uh, they don't always notice she's presenting Christ, but they see the Theotokos in the apse there. Mm -hmm. um, they're offended. They think, oh, well, you know, are you worshiping her? Well, no, but here is the woman who represents the entire faithful community who already is glorified body and soul and shows us where we are headed and gives us the model to say yes to God and to, and, and to do what he tells us to do. I mean, the female um, presence is very strong in orthodoxy and carries over into our, our iconography when we think of the church as being feminine and the bride to Christ's bridegroom. And I wonder if also those of us who came from evangelical backgrounds are carrying with us a remnant of a view of equality that is uh, really dysfunctional in terms of the role of women in theological terms. And they're, I mean, just look at you, your education, your ability to teach. And many of us, male or female, will listen with rapt attention uh, when you or uh, Presbyteria Jeannie Constantino or so many others speak because God has gifted you. You've been trained and now you are using the those gifts to help teach all of us. And that's something that was kind of unusual in the evangelical world I grew up in. Uh, women are not to speak. Women are not to teach. Uh, and there were very restrictive roles that maybe some carry over into orthodoxy uh, unnecessarily so. Is, you think that's fair? Yeah, that could be. I mean, that, that was not my experience because I was brought up in the Salvation Army where women become officers. Oh, sure, but very, sure. But very interestingly, one of the major reasons why the Salvation Army, there were several, but one of the major reasons why the Salvation Army stopped having the sacraments was because in the 19th century, it wasn't appropriate for women to give the sacrament. Okay. It was considered all right for them to teach. Now, the teaching thing, it's it's problematic going back to, to the New Testament where you do have a few passages which talk about women not teaching and talk about women keeping silence. But we also have uncriticized examples of, for example, Priscilla who teaches. And in um, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, we see a really interesting picture in front of us where there is both order and mutuality. Hmm. And that is associated, and that's why I said earlier, the whole business of theological anthropology, what we are as a human being, is connected with other things like how we understand God. So Paul begins by talking about Christ having a head, the second person of the Trinity, he doesn't use that language, we do, having a head in the Father, and woman having a head in the man. But then he goes on and says, but in Christ, they are dependent upon one another, 
um, because just as from um, man came woman, so now and from woman comes every man. And so there is both a mutuality and an order being suggested there. And that's a really complicated picture for us to get our head around. So I think that in reading the evidence, some um, groups that only have the Bible and don't have tradition have stressed the order, and others have stressed the equality, and there's been no bringing of the mystery together. But I think that the Holy Trinity helps us to see how it's possible mm. for there to be distinct persons who are one, who are ordered, but who are also in complete mutuality and have equal dignity. And to see that as a kind of pattern for what it is to be male and female. Hmm, that's a beautiful picture. Oh, thank you. Well, Dr. Humphrey, anything else that uh, you would like to say on the topic that we're uh, exploring? So I just hope that we can continue to have a good discussion about the possible help that uh, the deaconess role might have without using sleight of hand on either side. So, for example, you know, St. Paul talks about how we should, uh, in 2 Corinthians uh, 4, about how we should put aside uh, shady and, um, and dishonest arguments. And we need to be really careful when we're reading the evidence and talking about the situation today that we don't overstep. So I don't like to see, for example, somebody reading the passage in 1 Timothy and adding so there's a place where it talks about deacons being serious and then the women and adding a little phrase like the women who are called to this order. It's not in the text, hmm. right? But I also, on the other hand, and so that would be from the side of those who are trying to, to say this goes right back to the apostolic age. I think it did, and I think we can show it, but we don't change the text in order to make it clearer than it is. And then on, that, on the other side, I really worry about people who dismiss the interpretations of, say, a St. John Chrysostom or a Clement of Alexandria, who did read this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3 as referring to women deacons and just saying, oh, well, they didn't know what was going on. They had no uh, no access more any more than we do to the apostolic period. Well, in fact, they did. They were closer to it. So we don't want to present the material in a tendentious way, clarifying what is not clear or obscuring what uh, clearly the church fathers had to say about this. We want to be honest in our argumentation and fair with each other and have open faces. So that's what I would like to see in this discussion. Well, you've just beautifully described and articulated the heart of what we're trying to do with this documentary. So <laughs> thank you for that. We may have to use that in our promotional package uh, because it was just beautifully stated. And uh, would that we all would listen more and argue less. Uh, there's a lot we can learn from each other. Doesn't mean we have to agree. Doesn't mean we have to change our position. But let's at least give grace and uh, benefit of the doubt uh, you know, when we can, of course. So, Dr. Edith Humphrey, thank you so much for joining us. This was valuable to our project, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you more on other topics in the future. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, John. Really good to be with you. Dr. Carrie Frederick Frost is the chair of the St. Phoebe Center for Deaconesses. She received her doctorate in theology, ethics, and culture from the University of Virginia. And we want to say thank you for taking time with me today, Dr. Frost. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm eager to have our conversation. Oh, I am too. So I'd like to begin with your understanding of the historical precedent for the female diaconate, which would support your call for a restoration of the office. Sure. So we have many sources from the first thousand or so years of Christian history that validate and also illuminate the ordained order of deaconess. And this is, of course, really important for us as Orthodox Christians, because we, as you may have noticed, place a great deal of value on precedent and our history. We have scripture, we have St. Paul telling us of the deaconess Phoebe and his letter to the Romans. 
and the orders of the clergy were not fully formed by Paul's time, but the Orthodox Church understands Phoebe to be a member of what later developed into the ordained ministry of the diaconate. We also have all manner of textual and architectural and material culture evidence about deaconesses. There's been a great deal of excellent scholarship done in the last 50 or 100 years or so. We have inscriptions from the ancient world. We have things like tombstones that refer to women as deaconesses. We have, of course, deaconess saints on our church calendar. We have canons of the church that mention things like requirements for deaconesses. And we also have the service from the 8th century uh, that was used to ordain deaconesses. And so from this evidence, all this different evidence, and of course I'm, I'm being brief here and just giving an overview, there's much more, we see not only a witness to the fact that there were deaconesses in the ancient world, but we're also given a picture of how deaconesses ministered in different times and different places. Now, because the ancient world was so gender divided, deacons typically ministered to men and deaconesses ministered to women. So we hear that deaconesses, for example, visited women in their homes, took the Eucharist to women who were ill, helped with adult female baptism and catechesis, and escorted women when visiting a priest, among other things. But then we also hear that there are other roles fulfilled by deaconesses that don't seem to have been gender determined, such as participating in processions, serving as the agents of the bishop in tasks of hospitality and philanthropy. But what I really want to underscore when we talk about the history of deaconesses is that our history informs us. We rightly value precedent. Our history informs us, but it doesn't determine us. I think the question today is based on our history and our theology, how can we best live out the gospel here in the 21st century? And I believe that one way to do that is to ordain women as deaconesses once again. So the first half of your keynote address at the recent 10th anniversary celebration held in November of 23 for the St. Phoebe Center referenced the 1988 Rhodes Consultation in Greece, where there was a call for the restoration of the female diaconate. So here we are, early 2024, almost 36 years later, and I'm just wondering how you feel about the progress toward heeding that call. Great question. Thank you. So you're correct that the the pan-Orthodox event of the Rhodes Consultation, in which Orthodox churches from all over the world came together to talk about women in the church, produced a document that in clear terms recommended that the church ordain women as deaconesses once again in order to minister to contemporary needs. Now, I know people who attended Rhodes in 1988, and they left that consultation thinking that there would be deaconesses within a year. So on the one hand, there's been some disappointment and a feeling that the church has kind of kicked the can down the road. But on the other hand, I would say so much has changed and happened since the Rhodes Consultation. We have more and more clergy and laity around the world supporting having deaconesses in the church again. The St. Phoebe Center for the Deaconess just celebrated our 10th anniversary And it's evident to us that our work on education about the history and need for deaconesses is bearing fruit as more people join us. There's growing hierarchical interest and support. Metropolitan Callistos Ware was a founding advisory board member of the St. Phoebe Center, and both the current and previous ecumenical patriarchs have encouraged the church to do this again, to have deaconesses again. The process of having deaconesses again has already started in Africa since 2017. Several women have been consecrated as deaconesses there and their plans to ordain women in the future. And so combine all of this and and other things as well with the fact that women's roles have increased in the church in the last 36 years. I've been Orthodox my entire life, and it's been really fascinating for me through my 50 years to watch women step into all sorts of roles in significant numbers really for the first time in Orthodox history. So I'm talking about things like readers, chanters, parish council and diocesan leaders, iconographers, scholars of different types, seminary teachers, and so on. So seeing women naturally step into these roles, I think, has woken up the church to the possibility of once again having ordained deaconesses. 
And all this makes me think that the Rhodes Consultation, as well as other efforts of the late 20th century, set into motion something. It set into motion a movement that I believe will ultimately culminate in the ordination of deaconesses and what I hope is the not too distant future. Well, let's dive in a little deeper then. Uh, at that same conference in November, uh, one of your board members, Teva Ragul, said, quote, for over a thousand years, the church has ordained women to higher orders. So what does higher orders mean? Is that the same as major orders as we understand it today and as it relates to the ordained clergy of the church, deacon, priests, bishops? Well, higher orders and major orders are not really precise technical terms, but the way they're used is, yes, usually synonymously you know, as you say, to refer to the three ordained orders of clergy, the diaconate, meaning deacons and deaconesses, the presbytery, meaning priests, and the episcopate, meaning bishops. And this trio of, you know, what we call major orders or higher orders began to emerge as early as the first century. Together with bishops and presbyters, deacons were regarded by Ignatius of Antioch as an essential part of the structure of the church. And of course, over history, these three offices developed over time, each with a distinct ministry. The bishop as the spokesman and as the defender of doctrine, the priest as the celebrant of the presence of Christ in the local community, and the deacon or the deaconess as a service ministry, which complements and completes the circle of unity that happens in these three major orders. So the distinction I think Dr. Ragul was making is about the way we understand the ordained orders of clergy as being distinctly lifted up by their communities. We have scholars like the late Dr. Evangelos Theodoro, Dr. Kiriaki Fitzgerald, and Dr. Valerie Karras, to name just a few, who have quite clearly shown us that deaconesses were part of the major orders and that they were ordained. The historical ordination of the deaconess took place in the context of the Eucharist, at the altar, by the bishop, and at the same point in the liturgy <clears throat> as the male deacon. So we have historically over time drifted away from a fullness of the understanding of these three ordained orders. And my work um, is about the church benefiting from a revival of the entire diaconate of deacons and deaconesses of male and female so that we have this focus on service as a ministry in our church. So some of the functions that we currently associate with a male deacon today include serving at the altar, uh, doing the litanies during divine liturgy, reading the gospel in the liturgy, uh, bringing the Eucharist and giving the Eucharist in the liturgy to the faithful, uh, processing at the little and great entrances, etc. Do these same functions fit your vision of the restored deaconess? Well, the heart of the diaconate, of the order of deacon or deaconess, is service. This was true in the ancient world. The diaconate was a service ministry that was about caring for the members of the community caring for the poor, making sure that the church's resources were shared with those in need, and so on. And I believe that this service ministry is what is so sorely needed today in the church. Today, the role of the male deacon has often been reduced to little more than a liturgical helper. You know, this is what many of us see, even if we see deacons at all. Um, this is a reduction of the fullness of the order that the whole diaconate had that was about diaconia, that was about service. The Orthodox Church would greatly benefit from a revival of the whole diaconate, male and female, with this authentic emphasis on service. Now, to speak to liturgical matters, we certainly have examples of deaconesses involved in liturgical things, processing in the liturgy, deaconess nuns reading of the gospel, and as the Orthodox Church today moves through a discernment process of what the roles of deaconesses might be, we will need to collectively decide what kind of liturgical roles a deaconess might have or not have. But any emphasis on liturgical roles, I think, misses the larger point because the Orthodox Church needs a revival of the entire diaconate 
because of the good that could be generated by reviving this the service ethos of this ministry. So there was an article that came out of your recent event from the Religion News Service that said that the African Orthodox Church under the Patriarchate of Alexandria and Owl of Africa, uh, there a woman was expected to be ordained a deacon before the end of 2023 by the Metropolitan of Zimbabwe and Angola. And the article said that in 2017, earlier, Patriarch Theodorus II of the Alexandrian Patriarchate consecrated nuns as subdeacons in Congo, but did not ordain them reportedly because donors outside Africa threatened to pull their funding. Can you comment on that? And do you know if that ordination did indeed take place? Yes, what's happening in Africa is so interesting. It started really in 2016 when the Synod there, the Synod of Alexandria, discussed and decided to pursue the revival of the ordained order of deaconesses on the continent of Africa in order to minister to local needs of communities, such needs as catechesis, helping with baptism, leading reader services in the absence of a priest, supporting women and woman-to-woman ministry, and supporting the growth of the entire African church. These roles were and are already being done by women in Africa, but the Alexandrian Patriarchate wanted to give these women the training, the oversight, the authority, the support of the church by making them deaconesses. As I understand it, there was a threat of financial punishment if women were ordained as deaconesses. So in 2017, as a concession, the patriarch consecrated or blessed women as deaconesses. So more like a subdiaconate, but still the term deaconess is being used here. These women were actually both lay women and nuns. And since then, there have been several other women who have been consecrated in other countries in Africa. Now, it's my understanding that an ordination of a woman is still being planned in Zimbabwe, but Zimbabwe has been dealing with a cholera outbreak of frightening proportions, and gatherings of certain numbers of people are banned for now. So we will see what happens in the coming months. But in the meantime, The Patriarchate of Alexandria is really an inspiration to the rest of the world because it is a precedent for reviving the order of deaconess from which other Orthodox churches might be inspired or follow. And it's also an example of good church order, of bestowing the church's support, oversight, and authority on women as deaconesses. Now, I know you and your board at the St. Phoebe Center have worked hard to address the expressed need for a woman-to-woman ministry, and you used that term even earlier in our interview, that you feel could be more effective than what a male priest could address. Uh, Talking about very personal issues here involving sexual and physical abuse, pain, miscarriages, a deep inner turmoil, where you feel a woman truly needs a trained female to more effectively serve her needs. So my question is, to what degree is that happening already in the church, and how would ordination make that more effective? A priest recently made an interesting observation to me on this topic. So he told me that he had been skeptical to ordaining women as deaconesses and the Orthodox Church because his feeling was there's so much societal change going on outside the church. He felt like the church should just hold the course, you know, and not change anything, not rock the boat. But he told me that he changed his mind because a few women had recently come to him for spiritual advice about their lives as women. Some of the issues that you just mentioned, miscarriage and abuse. This priest told me that the light bulb went off for him, that he is not going to be able to ever fully support women in these situations because he's a man and he cannot understand their experiences as women. He said to me that he is now praying that the church ordains deaconesses again because he understands that this is needed to support and care well for Orthodox women. So some of the support certainly does happen informally in the church today. Some parishes have things like women's groups in which invaluable peer-to-peer support is offered. And some women are blessed to have an older, you know, spiritually adept woman in their lives to whom they can go 
for counsel and advice and support. But not every woman has such resources, far from it. Furthermore, we are a church that understands and appreciates order and authority. We send our future priests to seminaries so that they are theologically and pastorally trained. And we vet them to make sure they have what it takes to serve in this capacity. And once ordained, they receive the oversight and support of the hierarchs. When we think of it this way, it makes sense that we would want the same church order when it comes to the ministry of women in the church. So then what are the limiting factors that currently hinder women from meeting those needs without full ordination? So when people are ordained in the Orthodox Church, they are lifted up for a particular ministry in the church, and they receive the training, the vetting, the oversight, the support, the accountability, and the authority of the church. This changes the relationship between the ordained and his or her community. The community understands this person's ministry, and it is known by all that this is a trusted and capable person. Ordination also links pastoral care to the sacramental life of the church. Peer-to-peer ministry between lay women, which I believe is wonderful and would not be replaced by having deaconesses, it lacks these qualities. It lacks the training, vetting, oversight, support, accountability, and authority of the church. It lacks this kind of clarity. Personally, I don't want to be a deaconess. I see my own gifts in the church as otherwise, but I want to have a deaconess to go to with my experiences as a woman. As it stands now, there are not women with these qualities, with the training, vetting, oversight, support, accountability, and authority for me to turn to. I feel this lack, and I hear nearly every day from women in the church that they feel this lack. I also feel from Orthodox women who have left the church because they felt this was missing and this was such a significant part of their spiritual life that they didn't have. So to be faithful to our past and to best minister in a rightly ordered kind of way, the ordination of women as deaconesses makes good sense. So I've I've heard a concern expressed that your cause is really more rooted in a sense of inequality when talking about the male-only clergy of the Orthodox Church than it is in a real need. Is there any element of truth to that concern, or do you feel that's unfair? Well, let's be really clear about this. Women and men are, in fact, equal in the Incarnation. This is the clear understanding and teaching of the Orthodox Church. For example, St. Gregory of Nazianzus wrote, Did Jesus Christ die for the man? The woman also is saved by his death. They too shall have one flesh, so let the one flesh have equal honor. This understanding is a certain type of equality between male and female, and it is native to our theology. It is not something foreign. It is not something coming from the outside. Now, on the other hand, the term equality, um, you've probably heard me using it kind of in scare quotes, because it does have a whole other host of connotations and concerns outside of the church. So I think there's sense in being kind of careful of how we use this term. Our concern as Orthodox Christians is that we are equal in the incarnation. Also, as Orthodox Christians, we understand that just as women and men are equal, they are not equivalent. We respect that women and men have different bodies, different minds, different experiences, different spiritual lives. So in terms of those of us at the St. Phoebe Center and other people who I know of who are working for deaconesses in the church, our concern is the life of the church. Our concern is about dressing real needs in the church. Our concern is about the church living up to its own lofty standards. Our concern is about using the talents and gifts of those within the church to build up the body of Christ not larger societal standards or agendas. It's really clear to me that we would be better able to do this by ordaining women to the diaconate in order to better minister to women's bodies, minds, experiences, spiritual lives, and to better minister to the whole church and the world by reinvigorating the whole church with a diaconal ethos. In fact, I think there's a conservative argument to be made for ordaining women as deaconesses once again, because it would be an affirmation of women 
as women. You mentioned a little bit earlier about hierarchical support, but let's uh, explore that a little further. What, what have you seen so far? Sure. Well, the Orthodox Church in Africa, as I mentioned earlier, the Alexandrian Patriarchate is enthusiastically going through a process right now of reviving the ordained diaconate for women to meet local needs. The Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew has many times encouraged the church to pursue the revival of deaconesses, as did his predecessor. We have the late Metropolitan Callistos Ware, may his memory be eternal, who was a initial advisor to the St. Phoebe Center Board. And then here in the United States, the St. Phoebe Center is in touch with many hierarchs across jurisdictions who are interested in seeing deaconesses in the church again. I would say there's a range of feelings and opinions and thoughts from these hierarchs on the topic. Some are very enthusiastic. Some are of the mind of not quite now, maybe later. There's a variety of thoughts and reactions. But part of our work for the St. Phoebe Center is communicating with our hierarchs and moving with them through a process of reviving the order of deaconesses. And this is something the St. Phoebe Center is actively doing, actively communicating with our hierarchs. And we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens over the next few years. Well, I don't have to tell you that the term women's ordination is quite volatile for many. And my understanding is that uh, what you are seeking is at the diaconate level. And assuming that's accurate, should the ordination of a woman be limited to deaconesses? Or do you feel it should eventually include the female priesthood as well? And as you know, this is the crux of the concern for those who oppose your mission. We have ample historical precedent for deaconesses, but none for female priests. So deaconesses would be a revival of a historical tradition whereas priests would be a total innovation. I will note that there are many Orthodox Christian groups and people around the world, including the St. Phoebe Center for the Deaconess, that are actively educating about and advocating for deaconesses. I know of no group that is educating about and advocating for women priests. The ordination of women to the priesthood is simply not a live issue for the Orthodox Church today. There is no secret agenda here. The advocacy for deaconesses can and ought to be distinct from the question of women priests. All this being said, it's my opinion that ordaining deaconesses will inevitably lead to conversation about women in the priesthood. But I don't think we should be afraid of this. A healthy community should be able to talk about anything. And that not ought to deter us for, or from ordaining women to the diaconate today, to this ministry that is so sorely needed. In your keynote, you said fear of division should not be our yardstick. Rather, it should be truth. Uh, and this is the keynote at the 10th anniversary celebration in November of last year. But both sides are convinced that the truth is on their side, which makes this more a matter of conviction, it seems to me, on both sides. So in light of that, how can reconciliation happen without compromising those convictions so that schism can be avoided? Well, let's talk about the language here. I strongly object to language about future schism or even about taking sides on this issue of deaconesses for a few reasons. The theoretical future threat of division is a boogeyman. It is a scare tactic. When the church begins to ordain deaconesses once again, it will be through a thoughtful and discerning process. That process will bring people together in the church. Also, the church is ultimately a robust organism. It's not a fragile thing that we need to treat with kid gloves. Instead, it is a living, breathing, 2,000-year-old reality that can and does handle change. Second, I'm not convinced that we as Orthodox Christians are actually concerned about division. If we were actually concerned about people in the pews, so to speak, we would consider the women and men who have already left the Orthodox Church or who are leaving the Orthodox Church because of the larger issue of women in the church and the lack of deaconesses. 
that's an actual population of people who have left the Orthodox Church, not a theoretical group of people who might leave in the future. But we don't appear to, as a community, care much about this group that is leaving. Third, the word schism is not quite accurate here. You know, schism is a word we use to describe doctrinal, dogmatic breaks in the church. Ordaining deaconesses, once again, is not a dogmatic issue. It is a matter of practice. It is a pastoral issue about what we do in our churches. So I ultimately believe that ordaining women as deaconesses will not be a significant source of division, but in fact will be healing because of the process we will move through to do it and because of the blessings and the benefits that will result. So if you could say one thing right now to an opponent of restoring the female diaconate, what would that be? Well, again, speaking about language, um, I'm not crazy about the word opponent here because it has, of course, an adversarial connotation. It suggests to me that there's a debate with two sides. And I don't think this is a helpful or necessarily even an accurate way to think about this conversation on deaconesses that's happening in the church. In fact, it's this sort of language and this sort of promotion of the idea of a divide and the church that has made me reluctant to appear on this ancient faith documentary, frankly speaking, since ancient faith has taken recent steps to limit conversation about women in the church. I don't want to reinforce or feed this kind of thinking. What I see happening is actually a conversation in the Orthodox Church about deaconesses and about women more generally, a conversation with a variety of views and opinions and perspectives, not just two sides. And this conversation is, for the most part, respectful and entails a community-wide process of discernment, not a winner of a debate. A healthy community can talk about anything. So to those who are skeptical or unsure, I might have something to say to them, which is, if you feel that you just don't know enough about the issue of deaconesses, or, or if you are insert, uncertain, I invite you to learn more. There are plenty of resources and material on the St. Phoebe Center website, orthodoxdeaconess.org. And I invite you to enter this conversation and this church-wide process of discernment with faith and love. And finally, Dr. Frost, what are your hopes for deaconesses in the church today? My hope is that given the precedent, the clear need, and the promise for the mission of the church, that the Orthodox Church will thoughtfully, lovingly, prayerfully begin to ordain women as deaconesses once again, and thus be able to experience the benefits and blessings of women serving in the diaconate. These benefits and blessings will help the whole church thrive, will be to the glory of God and the benefit of all. Will having deaconesses in the church solve all of our problems? Of course not. But it will address real needs within the church. As Father Thomas Hopko said on many occasions, including on ancient faith, if there's a need for this ministry, the church should restore it for the sake of good church order. Ordaining women as deaconesses again is needed, and it will bring us closer to expressing the kingdom here on earth by creating new possibilities for service, healing, and hope and the life of the Orthodox Church today. It was Dr. Kerry Frederick Frost, the chair of the St. Phoebe Center for Deaconesses. She received her doctorate in theology, ethics, and culture from the University of Virginia. And we want to thank you, Dr. Frost, for talking with us today. Thank you, Mr. Maddox. Well, I appreciate your time, Father Stephen, as we tackle this important but often confusing topic. And first of all, uh, I want to start with the theology of the male priesthood. Are there theological reasons that the church has historically insisted that bishops and priests must be restricted to males? But uh, just before you answer, I want to play for you a brief excerpt from an interview I did with Metropolitan Callistos Ware of Blessed Memory in 2011, where I asked him about women's ordination. And to give context, he had just told me before that that he would not simply dismiss the topic because the church over the centuries has not fully explored the why of male-only priests. But then I asked him this. 
Your Eminence, what about the Trinitarian argument, though, the communal relationship between the Trinity, God as Father? Is there anything there, in your view, that would support an ongoing position of not ordaining women to the priesthood? Here I think you are touching on what is probably the strongest argument against women priesthood. Yes, we believe in God the Father and God the Son, not God the Mother and God the Daughter. Christ is the bridegroom of the church. The church is the bride. The human soul in relation to Christ is essentially feminine. There is here a deep symbolism, and we would be very foolish to try and throw this overboard. Okay, so then what would you say about the theological reasons of a priesthood restricted to the male gender, Father Stephen? Well, I think even that framing of the question, right, has a, has a little bit of prejudice in it, in that it's sort of stated negatively. Okay. In the sense that, you know, the priesthood, the episcopacy, and really the diaconate as it's understood in modern terms, or the terms of a deacon who might be serving in a local parish, right? Saying that that's restricted to men, again, sort of biases the case a little. A more positive way of putting that might be, you know, why is this a role that's designated for men? Okay, I like that. To play within the, within the community of the church. Because then it gives a better understanding of the parity that there are also roles that are designated for women within the life of the church and, Very good. and the parish community. But it is true, as Metropolitan Council said, that this isn't something that a lot of ink has been spilled, at least not a lot of surviving ink, uh, from, <laughs> from the church fathers and from other uh, ecclesiastical writers. Part of that, I would imagine, is because, in general, the things that we find written about in great detail uh, are things that were challenged or someplace where the practice or teaching of the church was challenged, then you get a lot of writing defending and explaining the church's position. And there frankly weren't any cultural challenges to that for most of, of the history of the church, which shouldn't surprise anyone regardless of where they stand on the issue, right? Yeah, <laughs> sure. There w wasn't a push for women's ordination in the 13th century, right? Got that, it. that shouldn't be shocking to anyone. Um, and even in the in the early church, what we now call priestesses, in quotation marks, in terms of pagan religious practice, I don't want to be graphic unnecessarily, but that was a very different role within pagan religious worship than what the male priests did. And there is no coordinate role in the Christian church because of issue. This was primarily a sexual issue related to sexual rights, related to pagan pagan worship. So even in the early church, there was no pressure like, oh, well, the pagans have priestesses, why don't we, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there, it, it was a very different understanding. And so it does now, now that this is being challenged, right, that it, it does behoove us to do the work of articulating and defending why this has always been the practice. And the act of doing that work does not mean that the answer is in doubt any more than when St. Basil the Great or St. Gregory the Theologian are articulating the doctrine of the Trinity uh, between the First and Second Ecumenical Councils, there was some doubt as to what their conclusion would be. They were defending and explaining what the church had always taught and would continue to teach and continue to do. So I don't think, I know there are people who have criticized Metropolitan Callistos for that and acted like he was wishy-washy on the conclusion because he said we should do the work. I don't think that's an a accurate reasonable. representation yeah. of his position. Yeah. So in, in terms of the direct question and doing a little bit of that work, and I'll try to do this in summary fashion because I've bloviated a lot about it in various <laughs> places that uh, people can find on the Ancient Faith website, amongst other places. The truth is, as we discover biblically, and the development of the idea of priesthood, is that what we come to later call priesthood 
is essentially identical with the biblical vision of masculinity, of what it means to be male. What it means to be a man is to be a priest. We have to understand also that there are different priesthoods. So in the Old Testament, there is a priesthood that is restricted to Aaron's family, right? <laughs> and particular members of Aaron's family, the high priesthood. There is a priesthood that is restricted to the tribe of the Levites. But there's also a priesthood that the nation of Israel as a whole had in relationship to the other nations of the world. So we need to be aware that, and this is carried through into the church, there is a priesthood that the church as a whole has in relationship to the world. But that is not exclusive to, and this is the difference between for example, Luther's teaching of the priesthood of all believers, that is not exclusive of a sacramental priesthood, hmm. right? There are different levels and different areas of priesthood. And one that hasn't been brought out enough is biblically that fatherhood is a priesthood. Before there is any kind of separate independent priesthood, as you read through Genesis, book of Job, another example. The person who is offering sacrifices is the father of the family, the head of the household. He is going out. He is offering sacrifices and prayers for himself and for his family. And the core of priesthood here is that he is representing God to his family and his family before God. And so this is what it means to be a man and a father is to exercise this capacity of representing God to the people over whom you have authority and representing those people over whom you have authority before God in prayer and intercession. This later on, due to some issues with Moses that I won't go into super detail on here, and then at the episode of the Golden Calf, the priesthood gets separated off into this sort of separate priesthood with the Levites and with Aaron. And so you don't see just the family of every, every household offering sacrifices. But there is still a priesthood there for the father of the family. So it's the father who leads the Passover celebration for the family. It's the father who kills the lamb. It's the father who answers the questions with the son and is responsible for passing this on. And so... This is what it means to be a man. And making this point and exploring this is important for men, right? Because our society has a very deviant view of what it means to be a man. It means apparently now to eat raw meat and spend all your time in the gym admiring <laughs> yourself. Or it means to be kind of brutish and dumb. Or it means to be violent, right? Et cetera, et cetera, right? It means to be sexually promiscuous, whatever. Uh, that is not the biblical view of what masculinity is. The biblical view of what masculinity is, is to be a priest. And so the priesthood is a calling, and I'm using priesthood here broadly, right, when it comes to the priesthood within the church to include bishops, priests, right, uh, deacons. This is a calling that's placed on every generation of men within the church to become the next generation to take on that responsibility. And those who aren't ordained within the church still have that, are called to that kind of priesthood within their families, within their workplaces, within their, right, where, wherever they are, uh, to exercise that kind of priesthood. Because even, you know, a student in a school can do their best to represent God to his fellow students and his, and his teachers and to represent those people before God in prayer. Yeah. And so that's a way of approaching all of these things and a way of embodying uh, masculinity. Let's take a family today, a broken family, and there is no male in the household, and the mother is a single mom trying to do her best to be both father and mother. What can we say that would be uh, empowering, encouraging to this family where there is no male priesthood? Right. Well, first we have to admit, and I don't think any of the people actually involved in this real situation would need to be told this, right? They would understand that there's something wrong there. 
there's something that's been broken there. So sometimes through no fault of anyone, people are widowed, right? But there is a lack there, and you don't have to tell the actual people involved that. Now, there are people outside of those situations with agendas who want to, you know, try to argue that they're, oh, no, that's, there's nothing wrong there, right? But everyone understands, it's, right? It's not the ideal. It's, it's, it's not the ideal situation. But also, insofar as, right, that single mother now has to try to make up for some of that fatherly role, I would say that this is how that's done. So, for example, when you discipline children, often disciplining children takes the form of, I told you not to do this. You did it. You have disobeyed me. You have violated my will. You're not doing what I want you to do, which is a very prideful and self-centered way of dealing with discipline. (laughs) And now you will be punished because I am angry. Right. Whereas if you approach it from this perspective of priesthood, right, if the parent even in this case, if it's, if it's just the mother doing this, is approaching this as the way I would approach hearing someone's confession. You have done something, you have acted in a way that has broken your relationship with God and with the other members of this family. And now we need to work to repair that and restore that and fix that. So lacking then the ideal uh, for, you know, reasons outside of their control, this family, this broken family with a single mom doing her best is really forced into playing the role that should be played by the male priesthood. Is that, would that be accurate? Right, right. And this is, as I say, sometimes that family situation happens through no fault of anybody, right? Other times it happens because some male has failed to answer what they're called to do and who Mm. they're called to be. And there are plenty of examples of this in in the scriptures. One of the most major ones is uh, the book of Judges, story of Deborah and Barak, where Deborah, the prophetess, steps up and sort of becomes the first female judge of Israel. But if if you read the story, it's actually Barak, this priest, this male priest who was called upon to stand up and become the judge of Israel, but he was scared and lacked the trust in God he needed to do that job. And so when he basically refused to step up and answer that call, God brought a woman to come and answer that call in part to sort of shame Barak. Interesting. (laughs) To say, you know, well, I'm going to get it done, but this was your calling. And so someone might and, and people have tried to argue from that, that like, well, okay, so women can be admitted into these things in certain circumstances, but that sort of misses the point, right? Mm-hmm. And what we don't want to do is say, is sort of remove that call from men to say, well, so many men aren't answering this call that just, well, anybody can do it, I guess. Therefore, we abandoned the original <laughs> ideal, right? Right. Yeah. And, and But then men don't experience that call. Right. So if, if the church is in an era where we can't find priests and deacons and bishops, that should be a cause of repentance for the church, hmm. not a cause to try to open that up to other people other than the people who should be doing it. Right. It should be a call for repentance by the people who are called to do it and who are not. So I've actually heard some say that one of the results of the fall was this situation where from now on the woman is subject to the man and they then use that argument to make a case for this restrictive role of women in the church. Could you comment on that? And then uh, I think you just gave us your model for the priesthood and masculinity, but is there something there that we should pay attention to or is it, you know, come on, you are, you're not reading the scripture correctly? Right. Yeah, I I mean, ultimately, it's the latter. Ultimately, that's not reading the scripture correctly. <laughs> okay. um, but that is, especially the way it's translated in English, that is a very difficult phrase to understand. Yeah. Right. So what's going on there is, as man and woman are created in Genesis chapter 2, there are sort of two parts of what God does in creation in Genesis 1. And at the beginning of creation, we're told that the world is without form and void. So it's formless or it's chaotic and it's void, it's empty. And then God over the first three days sort of puts the creation in order. And then the second three days he fills it with life. 
in parallel. But then when he creates man, he says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So humanity is called upon to continue the work of God in creation. And with man and woman, each one is called to specialize in one part of that and then to participate with the other in the other one. So let me, that probably people didn't follow that. But so man is called primarily to sort of specialize in putting things in order, right? establishing justice, putting things in the correct order. And then woman is called to fill the world with life. Not just in a literal sense, not just biological reproduction, mm. though obviously this is something that happens within a woman's body, uh, but beyond that, filling the world with life in, in all sorts of ways. Now, obviously, for her to fill the world with life, just using biological reproduction as an example, man has to participate, right, for that to happen. So it is not she does one thing, he does another thing. It's she does one thing and he participates. Yeah. And in the same way... She participates in his putting of the world in order. And so in Genesis 3, when God is sort of enumerating the consequences of the fall, what he's explaining is that those things that they were called upon to do, they're still called upon to do, but it's going to be with difficulty. So Adam is still going to bring forth food out of the earth by cultivating and putting the world in order, but now it's going to be by the sweat of his brow and there's going to be thorns. Pain and, and sweat, right? yeah. Blood, sweat, and tears, right? And woman is still called to fill the world with life, but again, exemplified in biological reproduction, that's going to be painful and difficult. Mm -hmm. And then the phrase that you quoted is pointing to the fact that in addition to that, in, addi in addition to each of them facing this pain and, and struggle in fulfilling the will of God, there's also going to be strife between them in terms of the cooperation. There's also going to be this back and forth and this struggle as the two of them try to accomplish these things together. That's really what that's about, right? That now they're, and, you know, not just men and women, humans in general, <laughs> we now know we have difficulty getting along sometimes. Yeah. Um, even when we're, we're in the church and we're dedicated to trying to do the work of God in the world, we still struggle with each other when we're all on the same goal. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. But that cooperation is an interesting concept that I had not heard for, both in the procreation of the human race, uh, but also continuing there beyond to, uh, to, to work out together life's work. Yeah. And this is reflected in little things like the titles and they're different for different local churches, but the titles we give to a priest's wife is an acknowledgement that she is in a certain way participating in and enabling, right, the work that the priest is doing, right? She isn't up there at the altar <laughs> right, during liturgy, right? But in some traditions, she's basically called, I mean, presbytera basically means priestess. It's just the feminine form of presbyter, which is yeah. the priest's title, yeah. right, in Greek. So the, the reality of this is acknowledged in various ways in the church. But that participation is not the same thing as the wife also being a priest okay. right, and, and exercising a sacramental ministry. Well, then what about other roles for women in the church? I mean, you hear different people saying different things and, uh, you know, can they teach? Can they preach? Can they lead the, be the head of the parish council? Uh, does anything about this priesthood and fatherhood being male affect what a woman can do in the church? Right. So... I'm me, so I'll just go ahead. So I think a lot of those questions flow out of what is ultimately a bad Protestant theology of ministry, which has a fundamental misunderstanding of ordination. Because, of course, ordination in almost all Protestant circles is not considered a sacrament. And so it's seen very differently. And the fact that it's not a sacrament, the fact that this isn't sort of a, a designated person through whom God is working from our Orthodox perspective or from a Roman Catholic perspective who has received certain graces, but is just a person who does certain things, right? 
he's the one who preaches the sermon on Sunday. He's the one who uh, exercises a teaching office. When you define it functionally, you run into trouble. Because there are, of course, women who can write and speak in terms of delivering a homily better than a lot of men. If we're just talking functionally, right? Like rhetorically. There are uh, a lot of women who are smarter than a lot of men. There are a lot of women who have studied the scriptures more than a lot of men. There are a lot of women with much better singing voices than a lot of men, if we're thinking about liturgy. There are a lot of women who have incredible gifts of teaching yeah. that a lot of men don't have. Yeah. And so this, this naturally, when you have this functional kind of definition, it, it raises these questions. But I would submit that from our perspective, ordination is not a question of competencies in performing certain functions. I've said before, a chimp with a parrot on its shoulder could do the divine liturgy just as well as me. If we're talking about functionally. <laughs> yeah. You could teach it to swing a censer. You could teach the parrot the words, right? You know, and if the parrot was imitating somebody with a better singing voice than me, it might even be better from some people's perspective. <laughs> So it's not that I can do something that other people can't do right? that, is, that has caused me to be ordained as a priest. Because of that, I don't think there's any need, if we're just talking about activities, right? So if we're, if we're just talking about the activity of giving a spiritual talk or the activity of teaching, or whatever else, being the, the president. I mean, parish councils aren't in the Bible anyway. So, I mean, you know, right, right. all bets are off. They're not? Uh, it's lawless. It's, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, there's that. <laughs> but, you know, or, or that kind of thing, right? Or being the treasurer. Yeah. Or the, I mean, the treasurer has Judas's job for Pete. Um, <laughs> True. The, so, but I, I don't think there's any reason to, to bar women from that because, again, Ordination is not a question of competency at functions. And so if someone is competent at serving a function, by all means, right, they, they ought to use those gifts that God have given them in appropriate ways, obviously, to serve the community. I mean, so in a nutshell, if they can, they should. Yes. Again, with that inappropriate ways, mm -hmm. right? They're appropriate in inappropriate ways. What would be an example of an inappropriate way? Uh, an inappropriate way would be putting a vestment on a woman and having her preach the homily and liturgy on Sunday. Okay. How about preaching right. the homily From without the a vestment? Well, that, then you're in a different, <laughs> right? Okay. If they're standing on the floor and they're doing something that, that designated lay people can do, then that's appropriate. Yeah. What about, uh, reading the epistle? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> um, and as long as we're begging questions, <laughs> what about going into the altar? Okay, so this is actually emblematic of something. Okay. This is emblematic of a problem surrounding this issue. One of the problems in discussing this issue, and there are several issues like this, is that, and I blame this in part on American politics, but th there is a tendency... So you have a progressive party who wants to, in some way, change traditional practice. In reaction to that, they would say it's making progress, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Whereas other people would disagree, right? Mm -hmm. But they want to change some traditional practice. And so in response, rather than just explaining and defending the traditional practice, a lot of people take a reactionary position where they not only... Uh, argue that the progressive side is wrong, but they want to exhort for exert force, pull in the opposite direction to counter it. The empress, for as long as there was one, communed behind the iconostasis. The empress, whoever she was, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. And some of them were kind of problematic, but they communed behind the iconostasis. This is actually what got Nestorius in trouble. This is what started the whole issue with Nestorius, is he objected to that. He objected to it, so he got in trouble. Interesting. And the empress, the empress defended herself by saying, pointing to the feast of the entry of the Theotokos into the temple, saying the Theotokos is a woman. She went into the Holy of Holies. Hmm. Right? So there's nothing wrong with this practice. 
And that's when Nestorius went down the, well, you shouldn't call her Theotokos and everything else uh, okay. ensued. Opened right? up but, a can of worms there. Yes. <laughs> but that was the instigating incident. To this day, at convents and other places, right, women's monasteries all over the Orthodox world, there are particular female monastics who are designated to care for, to clean, to manage the chapels in yeah. those monasteries. <clears throat> <clears throat> that requires going behind the iconostasis. And some yeah. of them even assist visiting priests during services behind the iconostasis. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, particularly designated women. But what's happened is that those examples I just gave have been removed from everyone's experience, right? We haven't had an empress in a while. We've never had one here in the U.S., right? And mm -hmm. people don't spend a lot of time in convents, most yep. Orthodox folks. And so people think, and sometimes they're even taught, women aren't allowed behind the iconostasis which is not the actual rule. The rule is no one is allowed behind the iconostasis unless they're there for a purpose for which they've been blessed by the bishop. So I am blessed as a priest by the bishop, right, who ordained me and, under, and now the bishop under whom I serve, to go behind the iconostasis to clean and maintain the altar, and most importantly, to serve the services of the church. But I should not be back there listening to podcasts, even if they're ancient faith podcasts. Come on. Right? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> or whatever else, right? <laughs> yeah. And if we were really following the rule, we'd cut out. I know I've been in parishes where there's a lot of traffic, people coming up even during services, uh, in and out, right? That's not correct. And so... In those convents, right, there are female monastics who have a blessing to do particular things, right, behind the iconostasis at particular times. And so it's fine. But it is not that anyone by virtue of being male is entitled to just walk behind the iconostasis anytime they want. Quite the opposite. And it's not that anyone by virtue of being a woman can never set a foot back there, right? It's just that in our current parish practice, <clears throat> in our current polity, our current political reality without having an emperor and an empress, the, the reasons and opportunities for that to happen in your average parish are, are very rare. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction. The, the restriction is for everybody. It's, yes. you know, I can't go and just hang out in the altar during, during the service or any time right. uh, unless I'm asked to specifically to, you know, set up a microphone or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or you come and you're going to assist in the service and you get a blessing to do that. Yeah. yeah. You come and ask for one right before you do it. That's Well, that's very helpful. So let's move on to uh, the female diaconate specifically. Uh, one of the controversies about the restoration is whether historically the deaconesses were consecrated or ordained to that office. Is that an important distinction? And if so, why? Yeah. So I actually think no. <laughs> okay. I get why people are making a big point of it now. Right? I get why people are making a big point of it now. And there are other places where a big point is made of this. For example, when subdeacons are ordained, in my limited experience, but I've seen several ordained now, even though I just use the word ordained, often bishops don't. Hmm. They'll use a word like consecrated. They'll use something because they want to make clear to both the person who's becoming a subdeacon and to those watching and those who are in the parishes where that subdeacon is going to serve that he is not a member of one of the major orders, right? That a subdeacon is not the same as a deacon. And so words are being used to do that. So I think... When, when people make the consecrated versus ordained argument, it has less to do with the actual definition of those words and more to do with trying to make the point that a deaconess or a woman deacon, which is actually a, a really literal translation of the Greek term that's used it, very early on in mm -hmm. scripture and in the first and second and early third centuries, it actually is deacon woman. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's, a, little, um, a little awkward. <laughs> yeah, that's awkward in English, so we say deaconess or or female deacon. Yeah, but that that was one of the quote unquote minor orders, like a reader or a subdeacon, as opposed to 
I mean, I think that's what they're trying to do with the, with the language. But as with many distinctions that people try to make by using different terms, the etymology of the terms and their general usage don't always hold up to the distinction being made. Yeah, that makes sense. And and that's where I was going because yeah. I was assuming consecrated meant minor orders and ordained meant major orders. Right. And I, and I think it's better to just say it was one of the minor orders and than so to that, fiddle with consecrated or ordained. Because people will talk about consecrating a bishop, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, true. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so the usage doesn't always quite pan out. So we could just say deaconess was one of the minor orders. All right. So deaconess was a minor order. Deacons were a major order for when, when you're talking about males. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Right. Is that pretty consistent down through history, or are there examples that you know of, at least, where that wasn't the case? I know of no examples where that wasn't the case. And I would even argue that biblically... In the New Testament itself, that is the case. Okay. Um, dive into that just a little okay. bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, we have the, the first deacons are, are uh, ordained in the Book of, uh, in the book of Acts yeah. by the apostles uh, to assist them. And are, are all men, right, very, very deliberately. Um, we see... Phoebe as a deaconess. There are other female figures in the book of Acts who it's argued were deaconesses. But the place where this actually gets laid out is in uh, 1 Timothy. And uh, nobody listening to this wants to hear me ramble about whether St. Paul wrote 1 Timothy, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to refer to St. Paul saying (laughs) things there. There's another podcast on ancient faith where you can go to hear that. But St. Paul, in in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13, he lays out the requirements for deacons, and he also talks about women deacons, literally. And where he talks about women deacons, it's very often mistranslated in English. Sometimes I suspect deliberately. So what the text says is that also deacons, right? And he's talked about presbyters before this. Deacons should be pious, not duplicitous, not drunkards, not lovers of silver, holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being blameless. Right. So he's sort of describing, this is the type of man who you make a deacon. Now, the next verse is often translated in English, and their wives. Yeah, verse 11. <laughs> right. That's not what it says. There are two different words in Greek that are used for women, just like there are two different words for man, right? So people may be familiar. There's a word in Greek, anir, that means a man, right? It means a man or a husband. And then there's a word in Greek, anthropos, that means man like mankind. Okay. Right. Uh, But there are also two words for woman. There's a word yini, which means a woman or a wife. And then there is yineka, which is this broader sense of woman that conveys like womanhood. So when St. Paul in Ephesians talks about woman being saved by childbirth, he uses that word. I probably should have chosen a less controversial example. but, (laughs) um, But... And it's this word, this broader word for woman that's used here. So what would you like better as an English word there? So it should be literally also women, deacons. Also, and you yeah. would include deacons in that. Yineka is the word, that when they say deacon woman, right? Yeah. Deacon women is uh, diakoni yinekis in Greek. Okay. Those two words that literally means deacon women, that's in the plural, right, is what's used. And so St. Paul using that other word is probably the beginning of this usage that you find. When I say that's the Greek for it, in our later Greek sources from the second and early third centuries, those are the Greek words that are used to refer to deaconesses. Interesting. Okay. And so that's the form that St. Paul uses here. 
I think it's a pretty solid case to be made that those later Christian sources are appealing to St. Paul here. And so they're also women, or also women deacons, be pious, not gossips, temperate, faithful in all things. Right? And then it goes back to let deacons be literally one woman men, <laughs> right? usually translated husbands of one wife, uh, governing their children and their house as well. It goes on. This is sort of the case that's set up, that there are also these women who are going to serve a diaconal role. Not the identical role, but a diaconal role. And you find in those, like in those second century sources, right, Pliny the Younger, one of his one of the most famous writings about the early church talks about his persecution of Christians. He's a Roman official. And he just says matter of factly how he tortured two deaconesses for information about where the Christians were meeting. So probably the earliest complete outline of what deacon women did comes from a, a document called the Didascalia Apostolorum, which means the teaching of the apostles in sort of Latinized Greek. <laughs> right? Uh, and it's basically like a church order manual from the er very early third century. It's probably written about 215, AD 215. And chapter 16 of that document is uh, all about deaconesses. And it basically cites the language that St. Paul uses in 1 Timothy in terms of the type of person. But in sort of summary, it's saying that the bishop needs to uh, choose and appoint deacons. And then at the beginning of chapter 16, it says, A man for the performance of most things that are required, but a woman for the ministry of women. So the male deacon is the deacon as we know it. Right? But there is this other role. There is this particular ministry to the women of the church for which the deacon women, the deaconesses are appointed. And this is not just, I mean, this does have to do with baptism. As people have pointed out, sometimes people were, were baptized in the nude, right? <laughs> women going to the water. But it wasn't just that. It mm -hmm. was also uh, women who were involved in teaching younger women, who were involved in the visitation of the sick for women, uh, because... It was considered unseemly for male clergy to go and visit a woman privately in her home. Not that that's carried over at all to today, right, but right. Um, <laughs> there were problems then with that. Yeah. So yep. women were appointed to do that. There was an understanding that, and, and, and a number of these elements have survived, right? That there are female monastics, for example, who have a blessing to hear confessions from women. They don't give absolution, but they hear the confession. And they're involved in catechizing women who are coming into the coming into the church, um, and all of these things are enumerated there already at the beginning of the third century. So it was this functional and practical thing of there's this ministry to women, and you need to select particular women of a particular kind of character, right? Who are older women, long in the faith. And designate them to be the ones to carry out this ministry to other women. And using this, this minor order to establish, this is the woman who I'm entrusting this to. right? So that there isn't sort of a chaos in this respect of women sort of doing whatever they want and whoever wants to start teaching, teaching. right? But in good order, this is a woman of sound character, advanced in the faith, a good Christian woman who can help with the younger women. Now, you mentioned this minor order. Are you basing that on something in the text of this document or on other sightings? Do we know for well, sure that it was a minor order? Yeah, well, well, within this document, it clearly distinguishes it from the male diaconate in a variety of ways. <laughs> right? um, because in the preceding chapter, it's talking about the male deacons and enumerating all of their sacramental functions and everything. And then when we get to the deaconess in, in chapter 16, and it defines her role, the contrast is pretty stark in terms of not having that sacramental role. And when you compare it to other minor orders like doorkeeper and exorcist and these kind of things, many of which have also fallen into disuse, like the two examples I just gave, 
you could see the similarities. So let's go to that New Testament passage that uh, is in Romans chapter 16, verse 1, and the Apostle Paul is uh, commending Phoebe. And in the Revised Standard Version, uh, she is called a deaconess when referring to her. If you go to some other translations, uh, it's servant, it's helper, it's minister, it's leader. What is the best way to translate? Is the word diakonos there? What's the best way to translate it? Yeah, the deaconess is the best way to translate. Okay, so you it's would the favor... feminine form of the word deacon. Got it. All right. And I say that because that is how all of the ancient commentators on Romans treat it. And is the the Greek word there in the male gender or the female gender? So it looks it looks like it's it's grammatically masculine. Okay, all right, that is correct. Okay, and is there uh, anything to be read into that? No, <laughs> it's the short <laughs> version. So this is another tendency because English is one of the few languages that doesn't have grammatical gender. Right. We tend to overread it. Right. So mm -hmm. the French don't think there's anything particularly feminine about a table. The uh, Germans don't think there's anything particularly masculine about a young woman. Grammatical gender d does things, yeah, right? Okay. So even when so even when you have deacon women, right, spelled out as I said, the word deacon is in the masculine form, right. with the word women attached to it as an adjective. All right, so, so let's get into maybe some of the uh, thornier questions, which I know you're up for. Uh, so you're a priest in the Antiochian Archdiocese. Do you see any indication within the archdiocese from either the bishops or other priests that there is an openness to consider the restoration of female deacons in the church? I can't say I see any indications. I mean, ultimately, right, I have to, I, I always want to preface things like this because I want to do this as an example, hopefully for other people. That me not being a bishop, my opinion on this doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so. Exactly. Um, <laughs> that's, I don't think there is. I don't think there is. And I obviously, I mean, I've met Metropolitan Saba like twice, so mm -hmm. I can't claim to know his mind or heart sure. at all about anything. But I think, unfortunately, this issue is discussed on completely the wrong terms. I think the whole issue of it is... Either, well, we should do it because some misunderstood feminism or progressiveness, or we shouldn't do it because we don't want to give in to some kind of feminism or progressiveness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's a slippery slope to every evil in the world. I don't think that's, and I'm not saying on the part of our bishops, because again, I don't know, on the part of our bishops that, that that's how they're approaching it. Okay. But in discussions, at least the discussions I'm privy to, that tends to be how it's discussed. Okay. And I think the issue is, should be discussed in terms of, is there a need for this in the church in a particular place at a particular time? Is this fulfilling a need? Right? Because the church doesn't ordain, consecrate, designate people willy-nilly, right? We don't just make people priests as an honorific, like giving honorary degrees, right? You're attached to an altar, right? There's a, there's a place where you're serving. There's a function you're fulfilling for the church. Uh, and that's why you're made a priest or a deacon or a subdeacon or a reader. They don't consecrate bishops who have no see whatsoever and no responsibilities as an honorary thing. And so... Is there a need? Is the consecration, ordination, whatever word we want to use, of deaconesses the best way to fulfill that need? Right, And then what, what are the ramifications of that? I think that those are the terms under which it should be discussed. And those kind of discussions, though, are very nuanced and don't make either side happy. Of course not. On the popular level. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and, and so... If they happen, they're going to happen somewhere between bishops behind closed doors that I'm not privy to. For me to get red in the face and argue one way or the other on this is useless. It's not going to help anybody. It's going to come down to, do the bishops feel this is a need? 
And will they change it or change it to something based on a need? Now, kind of the other question to be begged is, well, what if only one jurisdiction does it? I mean, just be frank here. Not all major jurisdictions in the United States are calling for this. And so let's say that one starts to do it. They consecrate or ordain or whatever uh, a deaconess. They put vestments on her. They have her serve in the altar, give communion uh, at, you know, at the altar, etc. And the other churches that are major, and let's just say all of them, and they don't. They say, no, we are not doing this. We do not agree that you're doing it. And now you are in schism of some sort. I think we have to think about that and ask whether or not, you know, what is being called for is worth that, you know, until there is unity, until the assembly of bishops can agree together, we're going to do this in this country. No, you're not going to do it by yourself, and I'm not going to do it by myself. If we do it, we're going to do it together. Now, that's simplistic, but I, to me, that's what makes the most sense. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, you you did change the issue a little because what you just said that jurisdiction would be doing would be unprecedented, right? Because yeah. that's not what deaconesses did historically. And so that would be a different kind of issue. And I think that would, frankly, very quickly result in a schism. So if I, and I'm talking, <laughs> I'm talking to uh, leaders on both sides of this issue, and my understanding from the proponents of this is that they are talking about vestments and they're talking about sacramental yeah. duties. They're talking about uh, uh, serving at the altar with the priests, uh, in addition to the other more practical things that, uh, you know, some would say, yeah, we need that. Something that historically has never been done in the Orthodox Church. Yeah, that would be massively. I mean, even the Roman Catholic Church hasn't gone that far in terms of having female Eucharistic ministers and that kind of thing, right? Like, that's even a step beyond where they've gone. And so, yeah, that would be a very different thing. So the deaconess historically, right? This is another thing. When you talk about the actual details, these are things that make no one happy on either side. <laughs> um, in addition to all those roles I talked about in terms of the Didascali Apostle Armour, you want to talk about their liturgical role. There was only one actual thing. They, they did stand behind the iconostasis, not at the altar. And that was sort of an across the board thing, because when I talked about the empress receiving the Eucharist, I mentioned it was behind the iconostasis. I didn't say at the altar. Okay. The emperor received communion at the altar because the consecrated emperor was seen as having a sort of office, a sort of ordained office. It was sort of an extra ecclesiastical ordained office. He received the Eucharist at the altar. The empress received it behind the iconostasis, but not at the altar. That seems to have been the case for the deaconess as well. But uh, point of clarification yeah. here, because I don't spend a lot of time behind the altar <laughs> myself. Do the male deacons actually serve at the altar, or do, yes. aren't they also at the side? No, they serve. They serve at the altar. Okay, they serve at the altar. They receive the Eucharist at the altar. Okay, not to the side. There was within the hierarchical liturgy. Um, and I know there are probably some people who haven't seen a ton of hierarchical liturgies in their life. When the other clergy bring the chalice and the patent, bring the gifts to the bishop who is standing at the holy doors and give them to him and he does his commemorations. When he was done with his commemorations over the chalice, he would hand the chalice to the deaconess and she would set it on the altar. Okay. That is the one liturgical function that a deaconess had in terms of the divine liturgy. It was only at the hierarchical liturgy, because if there's not a bishop, then you don't have that moment. The priest brings the gifts directly to the altar. And where and when was this, Father? Because that's another question that comes up yeah. is, well, when did we have this office? And, and the, when did yeah. they do So this? that sort of fully developed what I'm just describing. We're talking about like fourth, fifth century. Okay. And then not long after that, deaconesses kind of fell into disuse. All right. For various reasons. And again, we should say disuse. We're speaking as if there aren't any Orthodox deaconesses in the world today. There are mm -hmm. overseas. Some abbesses of monasteries have actually been made deaconesses and that kind of thing. So it isn't totally gone. Yeah. It's just gone from most of our general lives. Yeah. So that's a different. See, that, that deaconess role 
even where you talk about that one liturgical role, that's different than what the male deacon is. Because that means the male deacon is part of the great entrance, whereas the deaconess remained behind the iconostasis for the great entrance. Right? So it's different. Right? So the one side is kind of dissatisfied with that history because they want there to be no women behind the iconostasis and, and no liturgical role for a deaconess and et cetera, et cetera. The other side is upset about it because it's very clearly completely different than what the male deacon is. But that's the case. That's the case. But I think it's a fundamentally different question when we talk about the restoration of the deaconess as she historically existed. Right. Even if doing exactly that, even if serving that function at the hierarchical liturgy, even if being in some sort of vestment, not a deacon's vestment, but in some sort of vestment, standing behind the iconostasis during the liturgy, receiving the Eucharist there, but not at the altar, restoring that, and then having her perform those functions that a deaconess historically performed because we see that there's a need for it, and just having women participate in the ordination of a male deacon and putting them there as deacons. Okay. Uh, these are very different things. And it, and it reflects, it reflects an ideology that I think is ultimately anti-feminist. How so? To be completely honest, because feminism classically, at least first and second wave feminism, uh, was about rediscovering the beauty and the power and the dignity of womanhood, right? It was about what is special and beautiful wonder about womanhood, about motherhood, about daughterhood, about sisterhood, right? Rediscovering all these things. Um, it was not about women need to be like men. Women need to become more masculine. Women need to fill masculine roles. To me, the idea that for womanhood to be empowered or to be precious or even to be equal, they have to give up traditional female roles and adopt traditionally masculine roles is disparaging to womanhood. It's saying that, no, femininity isn't beautiful. It's saying femininity is weak or femininity is lesser. And so women need to adopt masculinity in order, which was frankly Gnostic teaching. One of the, one of the most well-known statements from the Gospel of Thomas, the most prominent Gnostic gospel, at the end of it, and this is of course supposedly, this isn't legitimate, but supposedly at the end of it, St. Peter says to Christ, you know, tell Mary Magdalene to depart from us because, you know, women are not worthy to live. And Christ doesn't correct him. He says, yes, but I will teach her how to become a man. And then she will be worthy of the kingdom of heaven. Right? And I think that's horrifically anti-Christian. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and so I think if you want to elevate women and you want to be a feminist, the answer is not to have them become men or like men. The answer is to rediscover the beauty of the Theotokos, the beauty of the women saints, the beauty of the roles that women have and have served historically within the church and reinvigorating those ministries, that to me is feminist. Right? That to me is a positive statement about womanhood, not the opposite. All right. Well, then let's try to uh, get you to envision what is the need for deaconesses as you have described it uh, you know, as uh, different than, I think, what is being asked for, but still a deaconess uh, with a function today that would fulfill a needed role. Uh, is there a need in your mind as a priest? Well, so, yeah. So if, you know, some synod of bishops was going to make a decision on this issue, restoring the female diaconate as it historically existed, as I've been describing it, and... They called a bunch of people with PhDs, and I was one of them, to come and say, hey, give us our case about why we should do this, right? So what, what the argument I'd give in terms of why we should, if that's what I was called upon to do, would be, first of all, I think in our, and, and here in the context of the United States, in our post-Me Too era, um, and from my own pastoral experience and from the pastoral experience of priests I know, there is a need to have designated women who are able to visit with 
and be with the other women of the church in situations where it's not appropriate for a man to be there, or at least where male clergy being there is going to subject him potentially to Skin. ministry ending accusations and potential issues. We as priests have all received dozens of talks and letters and guidelines from bishops. We all have windows in our offices now. We all, if a woman wants to come and give confession, I have to have somebody else in the church building. Yeah. Um, on and on and on because of this. Yeah. And one thing that would help with that is if we had, again, designated women who we know are solid right, and, and advanced in the faith and sound in the faith, who could assist in those regards, which was one of the primary responsibilities originally for having deaconesses. I think there's a great need for a lot of our women's groups in churches are groups of people who the parish council can ask to make food for potlucks mm -hmm. and these kind of things. Whereas if our churches have men's groups, I think a lot of them are focused on like reading books together and yeah. the priest giving talks to them about the faith. And I think our women's groups need more of the other. Yeah. And I think part of being able to do that from a woman's perspective is, again, having designated women who are good teachers who can teach the other women. St. Paul says older women need to teach younger women in the faith. So I think there's, there's a need there that could be fulfilled. I think, frankly, that limited liturgical role I described, even there's a positive element to that. As much as it would set some people's teeth on edge about slippery slopes and all this, I think even that would play a helpful purpose in getting some of this reactionary position out of our mind. That, no, it's not that women are unclean and can't ever go behind the iconostasis. Mm. Um, it's that they have this other role. And reinforcing to women and young women who might be pulled toward unhealthy forms of what gets called feminism, a better understanding of, you know, a lot of times we pay lip service to the fact that, well, there are other roles for women in the church, but we don't have those clearly defined. So an actual woman our parish looks at us and says, like what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And trust me, the answer, making casseroles for the potlucks is not going to, right? Not going to cut it. <laughs> not going to carry water, yeah. right? And so having those saying, no, look, there is, right? So there are different roles that are fulfilled by them. They're both valuable, but they're different. It, and having that be actually there institutionally and visibly for people to see. Yeah. So those to me are, would be the positives. That's not to say that that's the whole case. There are all kinds of other things that bishops would want to and need to consider. But if I was charged with give me the positive case right, of what needs that could fulfill, that would be roughly my answer. Uh, let me ask you this. Would you be okay if that came along with an institutional blessing or a service or a prayer, you know, forget the word ordination or consecration, but <laughs> right. something official that the church says uh, you are commissioned to do these functions? Yes, and it, it would. Thing. Yeah, I mean, it would by nature include that. Okay. The person would have to be set apart, but it would be more like the tonsuring of a reader or a subdeacon okay. than like the ordination of a deacon or a priest. Okay. Some say that uh, the office of deaconess fell out of use uh, during the middle centuries of the church due to the rise of male monasteries where there existed a monastic bias against women. Uh, what do you think about that? Is that valid or are there other reasons why it's fell out of use? Yeah, that argument seems super strange to me because, of course, there are also women's monasteries. And you wouldn't expect to find deaconesses at a men's monastery yeah. <laughs> for obvious reasons any more than you'd expect to find male deacons at a women's monastery other than maybe visiting. So, yeah, I, I think a lot of that gets overplayed. And there's a lot of this women aren't allowed on Mount Athos and that, and that kind of gets overinterpreted as some kind of overarching kind of thing. I think it was more that, so first of all, a lot of, as I referenced in the, in the Didascalia Apostolorum, a lot of the deaconess's service was in terms of preparing female catech catechizing women and then actually participating in their baptism, uh, adult women. Well, the church started receiving a lot less adult converts in most places. 
in the middle century. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, everyone was getting baptized as an infant. Uh, so that need kind of fell out. They're also, you, you just have limited number of clergy. When you're talking about a village, right? Your average village church doesn't have, you know, a priest and two male deacons and three subdeacons and, you know, five readers and, right? Having a deaconess somewhere around a major cathedral went on for a lot longer. Um, when you had larger communities with more needs, more clergy in general, uh, it hung on a lot longer. So I really think it was it was an issue of changing needs. And and as I said, there are places you can go where there are people who have been, whatever word we want to use, consecrated or ordained as deaconesses today in particular places. And there are places where they haven't formally done that. But I mean, I know of chapels in different places where there's a female monastic living on the grounds who takes care of the chapel, right? If this was a thousand years ago, she would be a deaconess, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> right? Just we haven't done the formality, yeah. right? Of, you know, she's working behind the iconostas to maintain everything and, and all of that, where yeah. in past times... She would have made a deaconess, but in present time, she's just a female monastic blessed to do that. And I've heard, which really kind of made sense to me, that you know we're concentrating on the female diaconate uh, and trying to define what that role is, what we should also be doing. And I heard this actually from the pro-deaconess position. We should be looking at the entire diaconate. Is it functioning the way it was intended? I mean, if you compare the Book of Acts and what was happening with uh, visiting the sick, I mean, basically, we've relegated all deacons to serving at the altar and uh, doing the litanies, and then they take off their vestments and go home and go to work. And there's really nothing happening during the week <laughs> that would uh, indicate that they are deacons. Right. And that, that also, yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think that's actually part of the problem, because if we define a male deacon just by his liturgical role, then those who want to restore the female diaconate are going to define what they want in terms of the liturgical role. Well, that yeah, and regardless, you may agree or not agree with that position, but at least they are defining it a little closer to the way the New Testament set it up. Right, right. And so both... If we reinvigorated the male diaconate as, well, yes, he has this liturgical role, but primarily he's doing these other things, hmm. then I think if that was firmly in people's minds, then when the female diaconate as it historically existed was presented, there would be a greater sense of parity than there is. Despite the difference in the major difference in liturgical role, the parity in the other roles right, would, yeah, would yeah. sort of weigh more heavily. So as we continue our journey through the exploration of the female diaconate, it's my privilege to welcome someone we've not been able to talk with in the past, and I'm not sure why, because he is going to be, I think, a very valuable resource to our conversation today. He is Dr. John Panayotu. He is an Orthodox Christian theologian, scholar, and professor. John, welcome to Ancient Faith Today and to our special documentary. It's so great to be with you today, John. So let's talk first about the role of deaconess in the New Testament. I know St. Phoebe is mentioned in Romans 16.1. You want to talk about that, but are there others to your knowledge? Yeah, there were many. Uh, it, not all the names do we have recorded, but uh, it, starting from, as you pointed to, John, um, uh, this uh, Phoebe that the Apostle Paul he gives her two verses, but he obviously esteems her very much in Romans, in that beautiful epistle of Romans chapter 16, in the first two verses. And we know that's probably dating, that's probably around very early, uh, the year A.D. 58, where he writes, he says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is the servant of the church of St. Crée. Now, when you look at the original Greek, the words usan diakonon, okay, being the female uh, deaconess or the female deacon or female servant. Let's get to the root of what the yes, means. It literally means a servant. 
literally, even if we were going to go deeper, and I know in our American context, especially, we don't like to use this phrase, but it literally means beyond servanthood. It means a slave, a someone who, in the sense, is sold out to God. So a servant who has so much uh, devotion to the Lord. In this word, the akodon, even when it's taken in the accusative, it means a servant nearly, from the akodos, it means nearly all of its 30 uses in the New Testament. But it refers especially to church offices of deacon. And so it's, it's really an act of ministry. It's a, a servitude of ministry, a servanthood of ministry. From the ancient Greek word, the original Greek word, to how it's used in Pauline textuality of within the context of the, the, the scripture, that is how it is understood. So he's referring to this Phoebe, this sister. He's, he's writing about her and he's speaking of her in the most positive words of what it would mean to be a full servant of the Lord. So you would not translate it as the Revised Standard Version does as deaconess? We could, we could, but I wouldn't, I mean, any more than we would translate the the akodos as a servant of Christ. We wouldn't even say deacon, we could say deacon, I mean, if we're, that becomes the, the tantamount. But that's a place where the meaning and the word aren't always, you know, yeah. they're synonyms, but they're not always the same. Well, let me ask you this. Are they this, is it the same word used in the book of Acts when, uh, because of need, uh, mm -hmm. the disciples appointed deacons for ministry? Is it the same word there? Yeah, it's just the masculine of it. So this is but, not the masculine? Uh, well, it is, it okay. is, All but right. in those contexts, uh, in those were the seven deacons that you're referring to yes. In, yes. In, in is the masculine. Both of the cases, when we see the akonos, the akonos, it, that's the idea of service, servant. That is the key, because it comes from the, the, the feminine word of the akonia. That's a service ministry, it's a ministry. And to make that into a noun, it would be, yeah, the akonos, and then where you see in other places, the akonisa, deaconess, that's an extrapolation of it. But within this text, the word both for both is the servant, the akonos. So uh, let's talk about Phoebe's role then as mm -hmm. a servant or deaconess or whatever mm -hmm. term you want to use. Uh, was it an ordained role? Did she function as we understand deacons to function today? Well, from the Pauline epistle going forward, for we see, first see this person, Phoebe, being mentioned, the, the role and capacity for the first five centuries, from the first century even to the sixth century, we would say is, it's very much a role that is, is integral in the life of church, just like widows. Remember, the Apostle Paul even speaks about widows in, in the scriptures as an office, those who have have been widowed and they've consecrated their lives to Christ with the understanding that they would not remarry. They were there to be servants of the Lord within the life of the church, ministering to other women and being, being people of prayer. What we understand from a historical perspective that these women who would be called the aconi or the aconises, deaconesses, all were the purpose, their role was to minister to other women in a variety of ways, primarily through to assist in baptisms. Now there has to be said something that happened in the early church that we don't do today as such, is baptize adults or somebody outside of the age of childhood, whatever you, know, you could say is a teenager or an adult, 18 and above. We don't baptize anybody outside of infancy, even if they're a small child, age five or so, in the nude anymore. I mean, that was done in the life of the church very early centuries, where you'd have adult, and most, as we know, there were infant baptisms and just as many adult baptisms as there were infant baptisms, but the adults were also baptized in the nude, okay? And out of propriety, obviously, the church, as with many things, it, just like with confession, you know, we don't have public confessions as such anymore because very early on in the, the church, it, out of propriety and because of the idea of the strictness of confidentiality, confessions became private. And that's the understood that even the priest of, uh, uh, on pain of defrocking, 
and excommunication it cannot reveal what's said in the com in, in a confession well the church changed its practice it didn't eliminate confession of course not but it changed its practice well likewise with the baptisms in the nude the church changed its practice and very practical reasons that even with a presbyter or a bishop baptizing people individuals being males of the clergy and the hierarchy it was out of propriety that a woman would go a godly woman would go into the waters and as the prayers are being read the woman is baptizing the cat female catechumen who's to the newly illumined and there was she was doing the anointing was and, she behind um, a screen or something no, I mean, it depended, you know, with the practice, but the the idea that that there was some, sometimes you even read about maybe sheets were put behind, you know, to separate um, uh, the from even eyes being seen, uh, you know, you find accounts, various accounts, but in its purest form, it, this was an act between a woman ministering to a woman that could not be perceived as anything either visually or in inappropriately uh, close, we'll say through touching, that the priest or the bishop would have anything to do with. So this was a ministry unto a, a baptism. And that's what they did, uh, among other things. But primarily, it was the first, the beginning of someone's Christian life in the church through baptism that this ministry existed. So in prior to that, these women were instructing the catechumens. So it's not only that they were assisting in the women's baptisms, and thus they would robe them in the white robe that the catechumens and newly then chrismated, newly illuminated, baptized, confirmed people, women, would wear for eight days. You know, they'd wear on the eighth day, they would, they would, they would not bathe after that for those eight days where the chrism would be there because it, it was a seal of the Holy Spirit. So this was the primary, a huge, very important role these women played in the liturgical life. Now, let's extrapolate beyond outside of the baptismal role. They also would go and minister into people's homes, women's homes particularly, because it was not appropriate in the ancient world where a male who was not a member of the household had any business visiting uh, a female, even if that were a pastoral visit. So they would deal with the physical, the emotional, spiritual needs of these women uh, who, whatever their circumstances were, they were carrying out ministry and, and even anointing of the sick and physical anointing, I should say, carrying even communion to them, you know, because in the early church, uh, like we read from St. Basil's time, every pious lay person could commune from Sunday to Sunday, the lay people would even be given the Eucharist to take home and, and keep it in a home tabernacle. Now that is another practice that ceased because people weren't pious, you know, you know, and our fallen nature takes over. But they were not, they were not. It was clearly understood in the life of the church, all of this great ministry, this teaching, this um, anointing, this, this baptizing did not make them clergy. Okay, and we even, we read this in the first council of Nicaea, that famous council that, that shows that Jesus is God, you know, and defeats Arianism. In Canon 19, we read that, it, and I quote, we mean by deaconesses such as have assumed the habit. Now, of course, referring to, they weren't all nuns, but they had head coverings, because in the early church, the women would wear head coverings. Well, these women, it seems, would wear head coverings outside of liturgy even. So hence you see a monastic veil, how that could be interpreted down the road when that became more regularized. But who, since they have no imposition, now here's where the big words, here it is, Canon 19, First Council of Nicaea 325. But who, since they have no imposition of hands, are to be numbered only among the laity, unquote. That kind of says it all. This is the same century, the same people that brought us the canon of the New Testament, Athanasius the Great, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. You name it, that fourth century, that golden era, if you will. This is what they're saying. They're acknowledging a role of deaconess, 
but amongst like a minor order, perhaps maybe like a subdeacon, a reader, an acolyte in the broadest sense, but not in the first rank of the priesthood, which is the diaconate. And just curious, John, what word was used for uh, deaconess or whatever they were calling uh, the women in, in this uh, document? At that time, it, it was uh, the akonisa, the okay. akonisa by that time. Because it's interesting, just like with, the, with episcopos, uh, we see that word almost synonymously used in the first century with presbyteros. But after the time of the last apostles dying and we get to the Apostolic Fathers, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, um, Clement of Rome, and the Didache, you start seeing the distinction, you know, the, the Episcopus be, being the, the shepherd of a, a cluster of clergy, not just in a local congregation, and in dioceses as such, or an eparchy. Well, the word diakonos then migrates to diakonis, and we see that from very early on, because in the writings of John Chrysostom, Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, when Chrysostom has his very close friend Olympia the deaconess, Olympia the Aconisa, it is definitely by that time the Aconisa in that, that fourth century. But not meant to be the equivalent tantamount to female, a, fee, a male deacon. That's the key. That is the key here. Any idea, John, how many uh, deaconesses there were by the Council of Nicaea and into the years of uh, St. John Chrysostom? You know, there had to have been a lot. Or, I mean, I wouldn't say there were as many as there were male deacons, but I will say this. If you look in the next century, it, it, there's a Spanish nun, if we pronounce it Erasmian, Egeria, but if we pronounce it Greek or even Spanish or even in Latin, Egeria, Egeria the, uh, the nun, who had gone on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and she went and spent a year in the Holy Land. And she, what we know about the worship and the church, the ecclesial life, the church life of the Church of Jerusalem, which was really kind of endemic of all the churches in the Eastern Empire, was from Egeria, Egeria. And she mentions one deaconess. Uh, now, she goes into great detail what the patriarch, the, the bishop of Jerusalem would do when he entered in the, into the chapel, which would later become the, um, the edicule of where the tomb was carved down by St. Helena, down to that slab uh, nook area. Mm -hmm. And she would go into great detail about the liturgics and, and all the I mean, you can read this online for free, uh, all these things for the most part to, in English. But yet she only mentions in all of her, 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 her travels, interestingly enough, a woman who's in, who's, who really chronicles something for us, a, a, a Spanish nun, only mentions one deaconess. And she had a friend who was a deaconess. She said, oh, by the way, I, I saw the deaconess. So, so. Now, I would think and she doesn't mention her in a liturgical context at all. I would think if by that time, especially alone the Mother Church of Jerusalem, there would be such a, if they were going to have a, a liturgical deaconesses, okay, that would be the place. They did, but they didn't, it seems, at least from the writings of Nigeria. She tells us about everything else and then some. So you're not aware of any role of a deaconess that would have been liturgical in the sense of uh, distributing the Eucharist in the altar or ministering like we understand deacons to minister no. today? No, I, that is fa safe to say because um, first off, very early on where even before the evolution of the iconostasion, the icon screen, that is a sacred space and so you know if a, even if a bishop has no reason to go in there. He should not be going in there, let alone a president or a deacon. So that idea, the people entering the altar had a specific liturgical purpose. The only exception to that over the centuries, and we'll, we can talk about that, especially in the context of this past century with the, the great Saint Nectarios of Egina, and, and how he's been misinterpreted and what he has done. You know, to go to a convent, you go to a female monastery, a convent, the Hierondisa, the abbess, I mean, she stands in the altar. She carries a bishop's staff. Sometimes she even has a medallion like a bishop, a panagia. And there's nuns serving in the altar. 
uh, but not as not doing petitions, not carrying the chalice. Do, do you see? I, 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 that is the closest it has become to, based on everything, let alone the First Council of Nicaea specifically says the role of the deaconess, it's a lay vocation of women to women and for women, you know, in, in particular, you know. Are you aware, John, of any uh, example where that was not the case in subsequent centuries, uh, where indeed a deaconess served more liturgically and more in the same role and function as deacons do today as males? Well, there's only one example that I know of, and it doesn't come from Eastern Orthodoxy as such, but it's, I guess it's worth mentioning. It definitely is in the Armenian Apostolic Orthodox Church in 2018, there was a, and it only was done once and in one diocese to my knowledge. In the Diocese of Tehran, Iran, there was a 25-year-old female anesthesiologist who was ordained as a deaconess, but with full liturgical capacities, according to the Armenian church's practice. That's the only time I've ever heard of something like that. And here, the other stunning thing is, after centuries, she's the only non-monastic that I know of, mm. uh, that that was the case. Everybody else that's been known as deaconess, basically for the last several hundred years, is the honorific title of a deacon's wife. Hmm. And, you know, we, as we know. But these are the only circumstances uh, that, uh, based on the history that I can uh, glean as uh, being, uh, you know, from Pauline times, the Pauline epistles, to, to uh, now that happening. So given your description of the lesser order or the minor order of mm -hmm. the female deacon at the time of the Council of Nicaea and the instructions that were given there, there still were women serving in this role. Why do you suppose it was not universally used and eventually died out? Well, I think uh, why it died out was out of practical reasons uh, was that I mean, their roles seem to diminish because after you, you look at the Council of Laodicea, which is a minor council, not an ecumenical one, but as, it's as early as like from 343 in that council, it discouraged women having exerting roles in the church um, on a broader level outside of what was deemed appropriate ministry, you know, and what we just said earlier. And the fact that in the 26th can forbids the appointment of deaconesses altogether. Now, that was a local council. It wasn't an ecumenical council. So there were deaconesses after that because we know John Chrysostom refers to his, just as the Apostle Paul referred to Phoebe, he, he referred to a widow who had become a deaconess uh, by the name of um, Olimbia. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, he was very close with her and, and commended her ministry in the context of what we just said. Same thing with Basil the Great, and um, you find that with um, another uh, individual such as Gregory of Nyssa. But uh, you, you just seeing it, you saw it die out altogether, I think because of, by that time, Christianity was gaining focus where more and more, even though you still had a, a fair amount of adult baptisms, the need was diminishing as time went on with the increase of people coming into the church through infant baptism. For okay. better or for worse, that's really what was happening. I also could say, besides, we find other accounts, like we can go deeper into this sometime, but is, but not for, I know for our time constraints here, like Clement of Alexandria and Origen, but there are secular sources as well, and I want to point to one, yes, please. especially Pliny the Younger refers to two maidservants whom he tortures, it's, it's perverse, but he tortures, uh, you know, as, as Christians, he's torturing them because he's pagan, and he's torturing whom he tortures to find out more about the Christians, and he makes a reference to the fact, he goes, oh, by the way, these women are also claim to be deaconesses hmm. in, their, in their religion, you see. Mm -hmm. and, and also, in the third century, even before the, the Council of Nicaea, in the Didascalia Apostolorum, it, it, we read, appoint a woman for the ministry of women, for there are homes to which you cannot send a deacon to women on account of the heathen 
but you may also send a deaconess. Also, in many other matters, the office of a deaconess is required. And that was in Didascalia Apostolorum, the, uh, the 16th chapter. So we have copious amounts of, the, of deaconesses. We see the migration from the word diaconos, uh, Phoebe, getting all the way in the subsequent centuries to deaconess, diaconisa, all the way through John Chrysostom. But the role is definitely limited to those we have just said. It was never seen as an ordained ministry of the major orders, in other words, the first rank of the priesthood, and it was understood as a lay ministry by women to women. Would it be comparable to a reader, for example, in terms of... Yeah, I, that I think you can make an honest uh, assessment of that. I think that could be argued uh, favorably to that. And, I mean, I think, too, you have, in understanding that, then we go 13, 1400 years into the future, if we may, and we end up coming to the saint, the, the circumstance of, which is often quoted about Saint Nectarios. And, and I think it's often misinterpreted and misquoted, just like like whether we're talking the Pauline epistle or the situation with, uh, uh, you know, in the case of Phoebe the deaconess or uh, Olimbia the diaconisa, where St. Nectarios on Pentecost in 1911, when he was um, the founder and the chaplain, the spiritual father of this uh, female monastic community, this convent of the Holy Trinity, which later would become known as St. Nectarios Monastery, uh, there on the island, the Greek island of Aegina, and he felt inspired that uh, on Pentecost, of all days, Pentecost, 1911, he prayed, he laid hands, but he didn't do a hirotonia, he did a hirothesia, and made these women subdeaconesses. Okay. Okay? And that's an important thing. And in his chronic, in his memoirs, he writes, Regarding the subdeaconesses, now, I think it's important to say St. Nectarios, during his lifetime, in his earthly lifetime, in, in this plane of consciousness, as time went on, he was like the epitome of, he should be the patron saint of cancel culture because he was canceled by everybody in the church, you know, for the most part. So when, when he was doing something, you know, people were already aghast and scandalized and said, well, that's just that Nectarios, that, that heretic, that the immoral guy, and whatever. But in him understanding that, in his patience, he would explain his, why he, he would do certain things. And, in, and this was one of them. He wrote, regarding the subdeaconesses, I inform you that they are primarily the sacristans of the sanctuary. They clean the sanctuary. They're they're the caretakers of the sacred space, right? Their dress was adopted according to the manner that the readers, see, what you just we were just mm -hmm, talking about, mm -hmm. that the readers who are in the churches of the cities wear their holy vestments. Cups were allowed for the following reasons, because they have these rasa, because there are no deacons in female convents and no priests in this particular one and as I am neither able to attend to the cleanliness of the church, because he was old and frail by that time, or prematurely aged by that time, nor to constantly remain in the church serving as a sacristan, and as the sanctuary has an absolute need for appointed persons to clean the holy vessels, change the covers and claws of the holy altar, move the holy artophorion, the tabernacle, even have him move in the tabernacle, not in a liturgical way, out of a practical way, okay? and perform every other duty of a sacristan in the sanctuary, I thought to appoint two subdeaconesses so that they can alternately perform duties in the sanctuary. In an absolute necessity, they bring the Holy Eucharist to two very sick sisters in a small chalice designed for this purpose. Aside from this necessary exception, they are sacristans in all of their other duties. I say Nectarios understood what we're talking about then, and I think that sums it up now.
This will be a good time to commend the wonderful film Man of God to our uh, listeners. If uh, you haven't seen it, we would encourage you uh, to do so if you want to learn more about the, the life of St. Nectarios. So, John, um, you had mentioned two Greek words for ordination. You were going to explain the difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, what St. Nectarios did was a hirothesia, which means to, uh, uh, literally a sanctification or setting apart. Uh, for, uh, in other words, a minor order to make a subdeacon. So it's a prayer to set apart someone, okay, for service, for a particular service. Now that's different than hirotonia. Now if we had the, a whiteboard or, or some chalkboard, I'd write that on the screen for everybody to see, but we don't. But hirotonia, which literally means a laying on of hands. And that is what is done for the first rank of the priesthood, the diaconate, the second rank of the priesthood, the presbyterate, and of course, uh, the, the fullness of the priesthood, because the presbyterate only has shards of it, the fullness of the priesthood, the episcopus. And so the hirothesia, to set apart someone, is different than a hirotonia, which is the laying on of hands for ordination okay. into the ranks of the major orders, the orders. Very helpful. Now, you had uh, mentioned, I think, a key word as you described why St. Nectarios brought into being the uh, sub-deaconesses, uh, mm -hmm. because there was a need. And I would like to talk with you now about today's need. Uh, it seems like the church has always made changes based on need. And I know there is a call for the restoration of female, the female diaconate, whether or not you uh, believe that uh, this is an office that had more liturgical function or you don't believe that. Uh, there is still a call for the restoration. And I just wonder what your thoughts would be on the need today. Do you see a need for a restoration of the early practice of having deaconesses? I have to say, Based on everything I've just said in summary, the primary function of deaconesses in the early church was to assist at the baptisms of adult women in the nude for the sake of propriety. When adult baptisms diminished in frequency, the office of deaconess tended to disappear. So just to be clear, it seems to me that those who want to revive the office of deaconess today are, are set on redefining the role of deaconess and thus assigning to them new and different functions, which are not a restoration of the ancient office, but are modernist innovations. So what you see is a call for a new office altogether? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it, look, whether we could debate all about that one way or another, but I would call for the fact that since it's, it wants to be restored, or calling for restoration, do it the manner it was done. Hmm. And we'd have to go, of course, go through the Synod of Bishops and, and, and whatnot, but don't call it a restoration when it's, you want these other things that go along with it because it's not a restoration, it's an innovation. Now, if you, if you want to call this a new thing, well, be honest about it, say it's a new thing. Now, doesn't mean I have to accept it, you have to accept it, but at least we know they're presenting it to the people because a lot of our people don't know what they don't know about many things, let alone this thing, but it's being presented to them, I don't think, in the most honest terms. It may be through well-intentioned being wrong, you know, or I would, I would hope not, and if it is, it's just very small percentage that people know better and yet are, are, are saying something that's, that's not true because that is what I'm seeing, and, and, and the agendas that, then, that, that come in are not theological agendas. They're not even matters of church history or liturgical theology or ecclesiology. They become matters of the contemporary culture. Again, the culture influencing the church instead of the church influencing the culture. We're seeing that happen every day and for quite a while, where it becomes a matter of feminism or... Um, you know, a, a attack on the patriarchy, you know, of, of society. I mean, you know, I think that's the real danger. So as we conclude together, uh, John, I wonder if you have anything else that has come to your mind that you would like to share and enlighten us on? Well, I think, you know, 
the aspect of the church being eternal and no matter what we do even if it's not the best thing and we and we as sinners on our fallen nature who are in the church aren't always the best witnesses of Christ the church will continue because that's the bride of Christ now we're gonna have to each give account as being good stewards economy okay of what that means what we, we were entrusted with you know, everything from a patriarch to an archbishop to a metropolitan to a bishop, regular bishop, or to a presbyter, or to a deacon, or to the average lay folk, we're going to have to give an account one day of what we've been entrusted with. And I would hope that just as in this case, uh, when we are given uh, information and we are given opportunities to speak the truth in love, that people would live by that. I do want to close with the prayer that I think kind of sums it up. This is the prayer that St. Nectarios used for those subdeaconesses. Sure. sure. And, and it's from the Apostolic Constitutions number 8, and it dates from the late 4th century. O eternal God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Creator of man and woman, who replenished with the Spirit Miriam and Deborah and Anna and Kulda, who did not disdain that your only begotten son should be born of a woman, who also in the tabernacle of the testimony in the temple did ordain women to be keepers of your holy gates. Look down now upon this, your handmaiden, who is to be set apart to the office of a deaconess and grant her your Holy Spirit that she may worthily discharge the work which is committed to her to your glory and the praise of your Christ, with whom glory and adoration be to you in the Holy Spirit forever. Amen. I think that kind of sums it up. You know, we're, we're called to be called and to, and to be, and, and at certain times in life, in God's providence, we're called to even greater service. But it's nothing that we create. It's nothing that we can push or redefine. Just like we are created in the image and likeness of God, we minister in the personage in the image and likeness of Christ. And I think we have to be very careful about what we say and teach and, and put up there because we can be deluded and, and we need to rely on the Holy Spirit and His guidance, not our own. That was Orthodox Christian theologian, scholar, and professor, Dr. John Panayotu. And John, we want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Oh, it's been my pleasure, John. God bless you. Our next guest on our documentary is Dr. Valerie Karras. She's patristic theology scholar and retired professor of Byzantine and early church history. And Dr. Karras, thanks so much for taking the time with us today. You're very welcome, John. Well, I know you've worked hard to research this whole topic of the Orthodox Deaconess, and I just wondered if you'd tell us about that work over the years of your academic career and what that involved. I guess my interest was first sparked when I was doing my master's at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology, the, uh, the seminary for the, the uh, GOA. And um, I started learning about uh, female deacons uh, in some of my classes there. And from one of the uh, fairly recent graduates from there, Kula Kiriaki is her, her full first name, Karido Yanis Fitzgerald, who was doing her doctoral work at Boston University at that time. And it was a revelation to me. And I thought, wow, how is it that we never knew about this? I kept a kind of back burner interest in it for the next several years as I was doing my doctoral work at Catholic University. And then um, after I had qualified to begin my dissertation at uh, Catholic, I received a doctoral fellowship from the State Scholarships Foundation of Greece and moved to Thessaloniki, enrolled in the doctoral program there. And so I ended up getting two earned doctorates. Uh, I actually finished the one in Thessaloniki first, and that was 
uh, looking more on the theological side of things, I did it on uh, Greek patristic views of the ontology of gender. Um, and according to Greek patristic uh, exegeses of uh, Genesis uh, okay. and related texts. And then after I came back to the US, I actually changed my dissertation topic for Catholic U and um, decided to do sort of a follow-up moving from theology to practice um, on the liturgical participation of women in, uh, in the Byzantine church. And that included a number of different areas, uh, looking at liturgical space, looking at issues of ritual impurity uh, regarding menstruation and childbirth, and looking at a number of uh, consecrated and um, perhaps ordained, uh, as it turned out, yes, ordained roles that women had in that period. So um, the last major chapter of the book was in fact on the, of the dissertation was on the female diaconate. And um, I later published much of that chapter uh, in revised and updated form in an article, the one that in fact I sent to you um, in the academic journal, Church History. I was very happy that they allowed me in that article um, to be way over their normal maximum. So they have a, a, a maximum length that they did at that time of 30 pages, and they let this be 50% over that um, because they felt it was an important piece of work. Well, much of our conversation today are, is actually going to be centered on that article, so I do appreciate you sending it. But in summary, how what were your conclusions about the female diaconate in terms of rank and function before its eventual discontinuation in the history of the Orthodox Church? It was clear to me from early on that there was this widespread office of female deacon. And I do use the word deacon because the normal word that's used in the Greek text is diakonos with the feminine article. So you do also see the word diakonisa, but that can be, you know, a bit um, confusing since that's also a word for the wife of a, of a male deacon. Um, but the Akonos is pretty explicit, and you see that, or in Latin, the term ministra, the, the equivalent term used from the early church on. And the other thing that I saw that was rather remarkable is that it was pretty clear from the documentary evidence, both um, in terms of church orders, including ordination rites, and in terms of um, imperial le legislation, that female deacons were ordained and they were considered part of the clergy and not just part of the clergy, but part of the major orders uh, of clergy as we use that term uh, in modern times or more modern times, um, that threefold major orders of deacon, presbyter or priest and bishop. So the article that you sent me was entitled Female Deacons in the Byzantine Church. So if you're ready, I'd like to kind of jump in there and uh, have most of my remaining questions uh, center on the history of the deaconess in the Orthodox Church. And first, as it relates, you'd mentioned uh, major orders and, you know, then there's minor orders and there's, you know, a debate in terms of well, what were the orders, uh, the rank of the female deacon in the Byzantine era? What convinced you that the deaconesses were ordained to major orders? Uh, several things. In terms of the uh, imperial legislation, for instance, and the canons, uh, they are, as I mentioned before, generally um, the term that's used is diakonos, um, and it's interesting to do that because typically, as I said, you know, you might also see that term diakonisa, the feminized form, but diakonos is very clearly a clerical order. 
And so to use that term, diakonos, with the feminine article, e diakonos, uh, I'm using modern Greek pronunciation here, uh, is saying something. It's making a statement in itself about these women as being part of that clerical order. Also, when you look at most importantly, perhaps in Justinian's legislation, uh, novel six, uh, a novel or novella, it, it's uh, uh, in addition to his code, the Justinianic legal code. In that one, he actually talks about the Ierosini, the priesthood in a broad sense of bishop, presbyter, and deacon. And he says, and deacon, male and female. So he's very clearly putting the female diaconate in that broad sense of Iadosini. And then when we look at the actual ordination rite, it is equally convincing. And this is even true for the earliest rite that we have, which is from the apostolic constitutions, which comes from the area somewhere around Antioch in the around the fourth century. And it describes the ordinations. It doesn't give a full ordination right, but it gives the basic idea for um, the major orders and for uh, at least one of the minor orders. And I say that even though they don't use that terminology of difference between major and minor orders, because they do discuss differently how those ordinations occur. And with all those major orders, that early document talks in terms of the person who is being ordained being among those of their own rank and of higher ranks. And if you think in terms of early Christian churches, uh, particularly in the East, they had what we call the synthronon. It literally means the chairs or thrones together, and it looks like a little mini amphitheater um, behind the altar area in the, in the apse, and that's where all the clergy were. So we can see that already from the apostolic constitutions, but once we get to the um, later Evcholoia, the uh, Evcholoion is a... Um, literally a, a, a prayer book or rule book. It's a book collecting different services uh, together, liturg liturgical services. And uh, those have the rites of ordination in them typically. The earliest one we have is uh, what's called the Barberini Greca 336 Codex. Um, codex, by the way, basically just means book. It's a word used for ancient texts that are in book form as opposed to scrolls. And the Barberini 336 Codex has this basically the same ordination rite that we see in later Efkoloya as well for the female deacon. And that rite follows the male deacon's rite. In fact, most of the Efkoloya say something along the lines as do it like the male deacons, and then it will list, you know, what the differences are. Um, so it doesn't even bother to give like a full separate ordination right. And the, the differences are minor. They have to do with things that I think largely come from either propriety. <laughs> so the, the female deacon does not kneel before <laughs> the bishop. The bishop does not kiss the female deacon like he does the male deacon, or um, in terms of the nature of her ministry, she does not have in the Byzantine era at any rate, a public liturgical ministry. So um, she's not going to take part in processions. So she's got these separate things that are a little bit different, but she's vested with the orarion, which is the diaconal stole. And um, everything about uh, the prayers themselves, again, the prayers are tailored to a female deacon, for instance, mentioning Phoebe or mentioning how women are called and 
as well as men, that sort of thing. But they follow all the same format as for the male deacon. And, and I think what is most convincing about this, if you needed anything more convincing than Justinian talking about the Ierosini uh, that includes the female diaconate, is that in the Efkoloia, in the service books, even when the order of ordination rites is ascending, so in other words, if they start with the lower orders and then go to deacon and then presbyter and then uh, bishop, so from subdeacon, say, to, to, pres to a deacon, um, the female deacon is not listed between the subdeacon and the male deacon as one might expect if it were considered a lower order but it was actually listed still after the male deacons, which already tells you in itself that they understood the female diaconate as being part of the diaconal order. It's just sort of a subset of the broader um, diaconal order. So it would be your position that this was universal or was it just unique to a specific region? I guess it depends on what you mean by universal. It was certainly broad. We've got evidence of the female diaconate from southern Italy through the whole eastern half of the empire. It's a little questionable in Egypt. There are certainly women who are called deacons. Um, Origen, for instance, understood uh, Phoebe as being a deacon. Phoebe is uh, who St. Paul mentions in uh, Romans 16.1, uh, gives that title of deacon too. But Origen also lived and uh, moved from Alexandria to uh, Palestinian Caesarea. So <laughs> I'm not sure if his knowledge of it comes from, you know, one of those places, okay. um, one as opposed to the other. Um, we even have in the medieval West, the evidence of a Radigund of Poitiers, who was ordained a deacon. There's even um, a, a medieval church that has a set of stained glass windows with her life and her ordination to the diaconate. Um, but it doesn't seem to really have been an order in most of the West, however. It seems to be the Greek-speaking East um, primarily that has it, but it's widespread throughout the Eastern half of the empire through Asia Minor down through um, the Middle East, etc. Okay. So you said in your article that scholars have been far from unanimous in their analysis of the Byzantine ordination right for the deaconess. And I'm just wondering, well, two questions. First, what makes that analysis so difficult? And secondly, is this just a reasonable disagreement between qualified scholars? Or do you feel that one side maybe had done research better than the other? I'm trying to figure out uh, why is there disagreement on that? Yeah, and I, I think there's much less disagreement today than there was when I wrote this 20 years ago. But the disagreement that exists is not based so much on not doing as much research, although it is interesting that a, a couple of uh, um, scholars that are dealing with uh, a canon from the first ecumenical council don't seem to know about a very important article about that canon that was written, you know, a decade or two before their articles. But um, the bigger issue seems to be their predetermined belief <laughs> that women could not have been ordained to major orders. So in other words, that then colors how they interpret and understand the documentary record. Um, so we see this with basically two types of scholars, Catholic and Orthodox. And it's not with most, especially among the Orthodox, there are very few Orthodox um, who are scholars at any rate, who disagree about the um, understanding that the female diaconate was part of major orders. But you see this very widespread, uh, well, I shouldn't say very widespread, but you see this more 
I, I would say, with among Catholic theologians. Um, so uh, the person who's written a, a very important large book on, uh, on deaconesses, uh, Aimé Georges Matignon, a French Catholic theologian, he's brought together a lot of really important um, primary documents from all over Christianity. And yet when he comes to dealing with the deaconess and the, the ordination material in, in the uh, Byzantine Epholoia, he really is unable to wrap his mind around it and actually basically says in one place um, that, uh, you know, women could not possibly ever have been ordained to major orders. So this can't really be what this appears to be. Well, that's not a very good way to do research um, and to come to conclusions. You don't predetermine what your conclusion is going to be and then try to fit the evidence to your predetermined conclusion. I mean, many people do that, but that sloppy scholarship, that sloppy logic and reasoning, it's not, in fact, um, logic or reasoning. But um, I think that part of the problem has been because the female deacon's ministry was private, so it did not simply mimic the male deacon's ministry. She did not give the Eucharist to people during the liturgy, although both male and female deacons took the Eucharist to people in their homes. She did assist uh, she actually basically did the baptism by herself, the physical act of baptism uh, of uh, adult female converts. The male deacon assisted the bishop in the physical act of baptism uh, for adult male converts. And then the bishop would actually read the prayers over either male or female convert after the physical act was completed. Uh, but those things of having those public processional roles and, and distributing the Eucharist um, to the laity during the liturgy, those things she did not do. And so I think that some have used that to conclude that therefore she wasn't really a deacon. But that's not what the ordination rite says. That's not what the legislation says. In fact, that's what nothing says except for these people who are trying to determine it that way. Okay, so you feel they're reading their bias into it. Exactly. Okay, is it possible that that works the other way too? Uh, you know, is it possible that a person who's trying to make the case for this is reading their bias into it? Or do you feel like, no, this, there's a genuine issue here that they're ignoring? I don't think they're reading a bias into it if they read the literature, the, the documents, as saying that these women were ordained and were ordained to major orders. I would say I, that I would expect somebody was reading bias into it if they understood that to mean that the women at that time had the same ministry as the men did. They didn't. Hmm. I don't think that's surprising um, because I think that that public-private dichotomy it just runs through the whole society. And women were segregated from men. I don't think people who are unaware of ancient and Byzantine history understand just how segregated men and women were in those societies. Um, some people may be familiar with the idea of uh, Purta in uh, traditional Indian society, Asian Indian society, you know, women behind screens or see that, for instance, in, um, in many Islamic societies, it was the same thing. And so you had, I mean, St. John Chrysostom, for instance, talks about having a barrier constructed in Hagia Sophia. This is not the Hagia Sophia that we know in Constantinople that Justinian built. This was an earlier church on the same grounds. But um, he actually had a, there was a barrier separating men from women. He didn't want unmarried girls to uh, attend vigils or processions. I mean, he, you know, it, I really think people don't understand just how ingrained in the society these distinctions were. 
and that the church simply, you know, adapted itself to that. If you look, for instance, at uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians, when Paul speaks about women being veiled in church, well, women were always veiled in public. The only women who would appear outside of their home unveiled were women in mourning, and they didn't go out very often, period, and um, prostitutes. So what Paul was talking about was not putting on a head covering going into church. He was talking about what he saw as inappropriate dressing, that these women would take off their head covering in church. So, you know, that kind of context, I think, is really important when we look at both the historical female diaconate and at the possibility of a restoration um, today. Because, for instance, female deacons in the Byzantine period did not do petitions. But St. Nectadios, when he ordained a couple of women as deacons in the women's monastery he founded, on Aegina, had them do petitions. That was, I think, one of the major reasons why he restored that order so, was uh, so that they could have a fuller life. Are you saying? Life. Are you saying that Saint Nectarios uh, ordained female deacons to do the litanies like a male deacon does today? Exactly. And, what's and your, that's what also, is your source for that? I mean, that's very interesting. It's in his own um, letters, and in fact. <laughs> You see him sort of trying to backpedal in a sense, um, because what happened, even though here he is, you know, it's just on this in this women's monastery, but apparently word got out. And so some people raised a big fuss with the Archbishop of Athens, and the Archbishop asked him, what was he doing? And he said, oh, well, no, they're really more like subdeacons, and, uh, but subdeacons have never done litanies. They don't read petitions, right? I think what he was saying to try to keep from having the uh, Archbishop of Athens come down on him conflicts with what he actually did, which was to follow the ordination rite that we have from the Ephraloia and um, presumably to vest the female deacon um, the way that we also see in that ordination, right? And this has been another uh, issue, I think, that people have used to say, oh, no, it wasn't truly major orders. It was like a subdeacon because that oradion, that diaconal stole, um, according to the Ephraloia, the bishop, okay, she, he puts it under her maforion. The maforion is that big head covering that comes all the way down onto the shoulders. Like yes. if you look at icons of the Theotokos or really just about any female saint um, from the earlier Byzantine period, you see that on them. So you, it would be hard to see and, and that it, it, the uh, bishop would bring the two ends around to the front. And that's typically how a subdeacon wears the orarion. However, it is also how the male deacon wears the oradion in the central part of the liturgy where he is going to take communion. And the reason for that is that in the Byzantine and probably early period, they did not hold the liturgical vessels with their bare hands. They always covered their hands. So the priest could cover his hands with the felonion the um, deacon, including the female deacon, could hold the chalice with the ends of the orarion. Um, but the deacon who does do the litanies and has the other processions, the deacon, when he's doing the litanies, holds up one end of that diaconal stole. He has a much longer length that way than he would have when it's both ends are brought around to the front and you've got, you know, a lot more of the stole being taken up crossing the body that way. So you don't have a long length. And we have some evidence that, that there were little mnemonic devices uh, uh, embroidered onto some of these 
stoles, you know, to help them remember what petitions were being done because they didn't walk out with a handbook, you know, with the liturgy book in their, mm-hmm. in their hands to do the petitions. Um, so she didn't need that. She didn't need to do that. She wasn't going to be doing the litany uh, in the Byzantine period. So she had the two ends around in the front so that she could hold the chalice. But it's clear again from the ordination right that the female deacon, not only is she being ordained in the altar area at the same time in the liturgy as the male deacon, but she's also receiving the Eucharist with the other major orders of clergy. Subdeacons do not operate in the altar area. They do not receive the Eucharist at the altar. They receive the Eucharist with the rest of the laity. The female deacon, by contrast, received the Eucharist directly from the bishop at the altar, and the bishop gave her back the chalice so she could replace it on the altar. And again, that's where you see that difference between um, public and private ministry. She's not going to take it out to give the Eucharist to the rest of the laity. So she replaces it onto the, onto the altar, but he does give her back. So they're mimicking the full right of the male deacon insofar as possible, except for whatever the differences in liturgical function, in public liturgical function will be. But, but I think the most important thing when we look at that ordination right is what already we had known from Panagiotis Trembelas and even earlier, uh, the, a Greek Orthodox theologian, uh, his article in, from the 1940s on hierotonia and hierothesia, these the two, uh, sort of what we right, call major, major minor, and minor right. orders uh, of ordination. And he points out these two major issues. Major orders are always ordained during the liturgy and at the altar. Minor orders are always ordained outside of the liturgy and outside of the altar. Those are huge differences because the altar area is not to be um, used by laity and not even by the minor orders of clergy. So you see that you've got the female deacon being ordained during the liturgy and at the altar with two prayers. The minor orders have one prayer. They, the minor orders typically do not have the uh, Theoscaris uh, prayer, the, the calling of the divine grace, the Epiclesis, the calling of the Holy Spirit. There, there are all these, uh, these differences, but those two basic ones of where and when the ordination occurs, there's just no way that anyone can look at that material in an unbiased way and claim that the female deacon was not ordained to major orders. The only issue is the question of the public-private ministry differences in well, liturgical functions. So let's let's focus in on that then. Uh, the public-private uh, ministry, the visible ministry, uh, you had mentioned the bringing of the Eucharist out to the faithful, and you had mentioned the the litanies. Um, As you envision the restoration of the female diaconate today, would you maintain those differences, or would you make them identical to the male deacons today? Um, Personally, I think they should be more or less identical to the male deacons. Our society does not segregate men and women socially or in in most other ways. I don't think we have, (laughs) at least um, explicitly, the same notions that you often see in uh, antique and and Byzantine literature about women being weak. And, you know, there's a lot of that stuff going on uh, back then. I think we know better now. I think that some of the functions that the female deacon had are very important to return to today. That ministry to women in their homes, to women who are sick, the function of serving as actually a chaperone 
You see in the apostolic constitutions, for instance, that female deacons were to be present whenever a female parishioner needed to meet with uh, a male cleric. We know how frequently clergy can engage in sexual misconduct with parishioners. I mean, occasionally with male parishioners too, but the bigger problem is usually with female parishioners. And um, conversely, there are female parishioners who will come on to male clergy. Um, you know, this issue of spiritual authority and power, it can be abused and it can uh, conversely um, be seen as attractive um, by some women. And so I think that having a female clergy is an important stop on that kind of abuse from either side. But how would Not that work, oh, Valerie, just thinking practically? Uh, so you are suggesting that if we ordain again uh, mm -hmm. to the two major orders, female deacons, that is somehow going to fix the problem of a male uh, priest meeting with a, f a female. But the female deaconess would not be a priest, so to hear confession or to give absolution. So help me understand how that works practically uh, as we understand the priesthood and the diaconate today. We're not talking here about the actual confession itself. Um, although the confession can be done in such a way that there is visual oversight without overhearing what's being said. There are also confessors who are not ordained clergy who have a blessing from their bishop, just as there are preachers who have that, that uh, preaching blessing from their bishop akin to the prophets. Um, the consecrated prophets that we see uh, discussed in the, in the New Testament. Um, so that is one way of dealing with that. Another way of dealing with it is perhaps they don't need to meet with the male cleric, perhaps meeting with a female deacon. Deacons should be trained in pastoral counseling. It, remember that that word means someone who is a servant, service, and that was a pastoral service, was an important part of the diaconal role in the early church. Uh, it grew more to be purely liturgical and administrative later on, you know, by the Byzantine, later in the Byzantine period, you've got deacons serving in most of the um, offices um, for bishops, uh, you know, helping them in that way. But I think that that service function is a really important one, that pastoral function. And here you could even have uh, female deacons meeting with male parishioners, although I would still want to see some sort of um, oversight in that role. But, but we know from uh, sociological and psychological uh, studies and surveys that actually men uh, even are more comfortable usually speaking to a woman about um, emotional issues um, than they are speaking to another man. Um, so there's a wide variety of pastoral roles that that female deacon could do, as well as, of course, doing the same liturgical functions as the male deacon in terms of litanies, uh, helping with communion, and then that uh, joint liturgical and pastoral role of, for instance, taking communion to the sick, uh, being a hospital chaplain, that sort of thing. Well, let, let's speak. Uh, I mean, this is kind of a difficult issue uh, because um, I have interviewed many people now for this documentary, and mm -hmm. uh, I would say none of them are radical. They are reasonable, scholarly people who have deep-seated feelings on this on both sides. And so what I've heard from the opponent uh, in that category are, well, if you're talking about the female diaconate as it existed in the Byzantine era, and if you're talking about major orders, uh, 
what I have heard is fine. Uh, yes, they agree. Not all of them, but some of them who, <laughs> op- who oppose the female diaconate restoration will say, don't try to make them minor orders. They, are, they were major orders. Where the rub is, the enhancement of the roles in that you're talking now about the litanies, you're talking about bringing the Eucharist out, you're talking about uh, basically an identical role to the male deacon today, which they say is not restoration, it's innovation. So uh, how would you answer that? I think they're right that it's not simply restoration. Uh, Clearly it's not. Um, But I do think that it is Uh, revival and reimagining, and I would use as an example what has occurred within the Armenian Apostolic Church. Now, this is one of the uh, so-called Oriental or non-Chalcedonian churches. In the Armenian Apostolic Church, the female diaconate began later than in most of the rest of of, uh, Eastern Christianity. So their uh, ordained order began around the 12th century, uh, as far as we can tell. And it was pretty much limited to women's monasteries. And they did a little bit liturgically, like uh, reading the gospel, but that was about it. Now, in the 19th century, and by the way, it, it died out you know, it seemed to go into abeyance a number of centuries later. And then it was revived in the 19th century. And in that revival, they made the female deacons equivalent to the male deacons. So they are vested the same way. They serve all the same functions liturgically. And more recently, um, we've seen them uh, also expanding it in terms of making the requirements for ordination more the same so that I believe there are at least a couple of female deacons in the Armenian Apostolic Church who are married. So that was one of the other differences. When you look at the Byzantine period, female deacons had to be older. Uh, They had to be at least 40, originally 60. (laughs) Um, And they could not be married. They had to be either virgins or widows. And so we've seen now uh, in the Armenian Apostolic Church a revival that has produced a female diaconate that is serving the same functions and operating under basically the same qualifications as their male counterparts. Is that and, pretty widespread? Or uh, I mean, have you, um, do you see that? Have you seen pictures of, of female yes, deacons? Yes, I've seen video, in fact, of female deacons serving during the liturgy. In the, um, in the same role as the male deacons? Yes, okay. yes, exactly. Uh, you can find them on Facebook, on YouTube. Uh, and that female diaconate um, has been functioning both in the traditional homelands, uh, in uh, the Caucasus, uh, you know, in Armenia proper, and in the, the Middle East, and then also in the West here in, in the United States. So just thinking about uh, the United States here, and Mm -hmm. the Assembly of Orthodox Bishops, the group of canonical Orthodox churches uh, that are largely in communion with each other, and the various viewpoints that exist about uh, restoring the the female diaconate. I'm a layman. You know, I am not seminary trained. I'm not a theologian. I'm just a layman who is very curious and observing And one thing that concerns me as a layman is uh, the unity of the church. And I have heard from the St. Phoebe Center, for example, that we should not be hung up about uh, division or schism over this. You know, truth should win out. And what causes me to wonder is, well, you are saying that based on conviction because truth and conviction go hand in hand. And those who are opposed to this, whether it is the other jurisdictions or, or bishops or even priests, also have a conviction that they are basing on truth. At the end of the day, do you really expect that in our country, 
we're going to be able to see this result and there will be a time when there will be unified uh, treatment of the female diaconate in a way that will you know, meet a need and somehow avoid schism. Yeah, schism is something that has often been raised um, by people. Um, and Orthodox, you know, we're so traditional, except we kind of pick and choose what we're more traditional <laughs> about and how we understand that tradition. We're ready to become schismatic. Well, look at the whole old calendar versus new calendar controversy. Should the Church of Greece, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and other churches in the Orthodox world never have moved to the more accurate Gregorian calendar and instead have stayed on an inaccurate calendar promulgated under a pagan Roman emperor, which for some reason part of the church sees as being holy. I've decided, and I have thought about this a lot too, I've decided that we cannot allow ourselves not to do something for fear of what some may choose to do. Even if it results in schism? Almost anything can result in schism, as I just pointed out with the calendar. Who would have thought that a calendar would result in schism? But it didn't. But one of the things that I think that people ignore, because those who oppose, you know, are so vocal, is the silent schism that is underway, even as we speak, of people, but not in unity, people simply one by one as families, as individuals, leaving the church. And we see that in a number of ways. Um, we've been seeing this for several decades now. Uh, we've got the demographic evidence across the, the dioceses. Uh, across the jurisdictions of more funerals than baptisms. We also have the interesting statistic that I just learned at the St. Phoebe Symposium last month. I don't remember now over how many years this is, maybe a decade's worth of data that they uh, you know, compiled across our jurisdictions. 75% of converts to orthodoxy in this country over the last however many years it's been, let's say a decade, have been male. So there is something going on here. And you could say, well, there are some factors that would come into play here. Women tend to be more uh, connected to the church than men. So perhaps, you know, women who are orthodox are more likely to uh, have a non-Orthodox husband become Orthodox, then men who are Orthodox are likely to have their, their wives, non-Orthodox wives become Orthodox. That could be part of it, perhaps. But 75%, three quarters, that says something on both sides. It says something about why women are not as attracted as men to Orthodoxy and what is it about orthodoxy that so many more men find attractive? Do you think that's because uh, the issue is actually equality? Uh, is there that sense uh, among women? I, you know, equality, I guess I don't understand. When I think of the word equality, I think in terms of like political terms. Um, well, I think in terms of theological anthropology, that men and women are equally created according to the image of God. Um, I think in terms of men and women having equal capacities. I think in terms of my own dissertation work from Thessaloniki, which many also find controversial, and it was certainly 180 degrees from what I expected to find, that the early fathers did not see sexual differentiation 
as an essential component of human nature and that they don't even think it's going to continue to exist in the mes in the resurrection. So, you know, the, the idea that men and women have different roles and that women are excluded from most liturgical roles, that makes no sense to me in terms of theological anthropology and soteriology. Theological anthropology means the understanding of human nature in theological terms, and soteriology means the understanding of salvation. I mean, equality, you know, Chrysostom uses that, he does use that term in his uh, homilies on uh, Genesis when he's looking at the creation accounts. He talks uh, multiple times about the woman being isotimi with the man. And this is one of those areas where, again, it's really important that people understand language correctly. So isotimia, this is a, a Greek word which literally means equal in honor. And I've seen uh, that phrase used literally in translations, in English translations of what Chrysostom wrote. Um, but the actual word that we would use in English is equality. Because in Greek, isotis, the word that we think of as equality in simple terms, would only be used for something like equal quantities of something. But people are different, one from another, male and female, and in whatever other ways. So they didn't use that term to talk about people. They used the term isotimia. So Chrysostom does actually use that. I just don't think it's, it's that simple. It, it, it makes it sound um, secular, I guess. And the real issue is, but do we see women as being spiritually the same as men, equal to men, I should say? Nobody's the same. One person is not the same to another. Do we see all of us as being equivalent one to another? Or do we put half of the human race in one category? Yeah, and the people that I've talked to who would raise these questions, I know of none of them who would somehow distinguish uh, two categories. I mean, in Christ, there is no male or female. And uh, their affirmation of, of women and men are truly uh, equal. But they do talk about roles. And one of the reasons why uh, the concern that I've heard is that, well, what the agenda here really is the path to priesthood. And I'd love your thoughts on that. Is that uh, using the same arguments why the female deacon should be exactly the same as the male deacon? And even as you talk about uh, confession and about um, um, you know women being able to talk to women uh, about their personal and most intimate uh, concerns, which is certainly valid, then wouldn't the ultimate answer to that be the female priest? Um, I think that's a... That's a different issue. And um, first, there's that question you, you raised about difference in function. And the, the question I have, we know that the church recognized the social differences in function, which actually, I think most people at that time assumed were immutable. I don't think they ever conceived that women would have the kind of public and social roles and political and other uh, business roles that they have today. I don't think that that was conceivable in, in that period. So I do think that we're in a, a very different environment today. And the question becomes, do we need to continue to have liturgical uh, roles that mimic a society from 1500 years ago? With respect to the priesthood, I have definite views on that, but I think it's a completely separate issue. And I think that's really important to recognize for two reasons. One is that the diaconate and the priesthood are different in terms of their history with respect to women. 
so we have this lengthy history. We have a longer history of having had female deacons than we have of not having had them. All right. So that's an, a very important issue. By contrast, we have no history of there having been female priests, at least not anything beyond maybe one or two. I, I don't know. There, you know, the, the articles and, and books that I've read by scholars trying to make that argument are very unconvincing to me. Mm. Um, and that's where you can say there's a, a bias in that opposite direction, you know, from what we were talking about earlier in our conversation. I try to look at things as logically and impartially as, as possible, not projecting my own wishes or beliefs upon the, the material, upon the evidence. Um, so there's that question of the difference in actual history and tradition in how women were related to those two clerical orders. The second is that the diaconate and the priesthood are entirely different clerical orders. And it really kind of worries me that there are people who think that one is almost the same as the other. The diaconate is not simply a stepping stone to the priesthood, or it should not be. That's in fact what it largely serves as. Uh, nor should it simply be just Sunday liturgy helping to give communion and do some litanies. It would be nice to see a fully restored order serving, in many cases, directly under the bishop, for instance, in uh, pastoral and social service functions or administrative roles. It is a liminal order. In other words, it's on the limits, it's on the borders between major and minor orders, even though it is considered part of major orders, if you look at the funeral service, the deacon is buried according to the same right as any lay person. Male or female. Just right? like male or female, you know, just as with the lower, with the minor orders, you know, a subdeacon or reader is, you know, is buried the same way as a lay person. So is a deacon. The presbyter, is buried with a special funeral service. And that, I think, reflects the relationship between the presbyter and the bishop. The presbyter's liturgical functions, excuse me, come from the bishop, right? The bishop is, is the ultimate celebrant of the Eucharist. Each presbyter, each priest has an andimizion, the uh, altar cloth that has a little bit of a, a, a relic, a saint's relic in it, and it has the signature of the bishop who ordained him because it is, in effect, his license to serve liturgically on behalf of the bishop to celebrate the Eucharist to perform the other sacraments of the church. The deacon can perform none of those sacraments. The deacon is not a celebrant of any sacrament of the church. Only the presbyter is. So these are really, really important distinctions. That, that question of the tradition and history of the church on the one hand, and the huge distinction between the function sacramentally, liturgically, etc., of the deacon, whether male or female on the one hand, and the presbyter and bishop by like extension. At the risk of begging the question, you had mentioned that over the 2,000 plus year history of the church, we have never had a female priesthood. Would you go further to say, because the church in its wisdom chose that was not our tradition, this is not what we do, therefore would you be comfortable saying, nor should they ever do it? Apostolic tradition says that the priesthood 
is a male role. Deaconess and deaconesses, there is history for. So there isn't uh, an issue of suddenly we are innovating something that never existed before and, and shouldn't do it. And I think hearing your comments on that might actually help some people feel a little more at ease about uh, if there is indeed an, an agenda here toward the female priesthood. Um, well, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to set you at ease because I don't think there's any theological reason why women cannot be ordained to the priesthood. I don't expect to ever see it in my lifetime. I don't know if the Orthodox Church ever will do it. Um, as I said, we're talking on theological terms here. Uh, and that comes out of my understanding of theological anthropology from my reading of the fathers. There are some who have argued that not to have women in all of these roles somehow makes them less than full, that because it, you don't have all of humanity serving in all of these roles. That is not true. Because part of that understanding that each human being is a full, complete human being in him or herself, and not simply half of a whole, means that a male-only priesthood is still a full priesthood. It's not lacking in anything. That doesn't mean that I think that it should always be a male-only priesthood. I don't think that there is any convincing theological reason why women can't be ordained to the priesthood. When you look liturgically, the priest is serving primarily as the representative of the church. He, he images the church. Only when he turns around to bless the congregation do you really see him imaging Christ. This is, you know, I, I think this is one of those areas where people in their attempt to um, find a theological uh, rationale for excluding women from the priesthood get into trouble. Um, so they'll say something like, well, you know, Christ was male, therefore the priesthood needs to be male. And um, Theodore of Studios, for instance, uh, uh, he uh, was a monk who was defending the icons during the second phase of iconoclasm in the ninth century. He talks about Christ's maleness as being important only in that it fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies because he points out quite rightly that, that spirits are neither male or, nor female. There's no gender ascribed to those so that the pre-incarnate word was not male. There was no necessity for him to be one as opposed to the other. I would say there's um, there's a kind of genetic symmetry to his incarnation as a man, because if you look at how we exist as male and female, um, sex is determined by the male sperm, we know, because it exists X and or Y chromosome, whereas women are only X chromosome. So if we think in terms of our incarnational soteriology, our understanding of how all of us are saved by Christ taking on our human nature so that he is, we're one with him, he's one with us. By his being male, he has included female humanity because male humanity is X and Y. But none of the theological arguments that people try to raise for why the priesthood must continue to be male, must always be male, make any sense. I think Callistos Ware, God bless his soul, you know, he had his views had certainly changed quite a bit from, um, for instance, from his first edition from uh, Hopko's book, Women in the Priesthood, um, from the article he had in there the first time to how he substantially revised it the second time, by which point he had given up that Catholic uh, idea of in persona Christi and all of that, and was basically saying, really, we're, we're limited to saying we haven't done it. This has been the tradition of the church. 
I do think it's something that we have to reflect upon from within our own tradition and particularly taking into account our theological anthropology and our soteriology. I think this was one of the problems when this you first started seeing this uh, become a major issue several decades ago. The papacy put out a document, and I, I can't remember the name of it now, but they were the ones who proposed this in persona Christi argument that the priest acts in the person of Christ. And it raised all kinds of problems for me liturgically, as I pointed out, where the priest is predominantly acting in the person of the church, representing the church, not Christ, and soteriologically because of our understanding that we are saved by participating in Christ's human nature, that that nature is restored. And if you say that it's somehow theologically important, if you are in a set, what's called an essentialist, in other words, you have this view that male and female are somehow essentially different, then female humanity is not saved, right? Because Christ became male. And so you see the, the issues that are being raised. But I think one of the issues, too, that, that people neglect in this whole question is we talk about a vocation as a calling, and, and we typically think of that calling as being from God. But the calling is not just from God. And in fact, a lot of that calling from God comes in the form of the gifts that God gives us, whether those gifts are suited to uh, particular roles. Um, but also the calling has to come from the community. After all, in, in Orthodoxy at an ordination, we have to call out axios, or for a female deacon, it would be axia, right? That they, that person is worthy. We have to also call for that person to function in that role, for that person to be ordained to that ministry. And the church has not called women to it for the past 2,000 years. It may be that at some point in the future it will. But the church has called women to the female diaconate for most of its history. And so the question is, why does it not do so now? Why can it not do so again? Which raises a question, and we're kind of wrapping up here. Uh, I'd be interested in the factors that caused the eventual discontinuation of the female diaconate. Uh, was it 7th and 8th centuries? Is that what it kind of died out? Oh, no, not that early. Okay. No, because we have, for instance... Um, Saint Irene of Chrysovalanton, who is somebody that we uh, we have a, a relatively early vita, uh, the life uh, story of, uh, and she was ordained by Patriarch Methodius, Saint Methodius, who was the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople at the end of the second phase of iconoclasm uh, in the ninth century, the middle of the ninth century, uh, the time that we... Uh, venerate every uh, first Sunday of Lent as the Sunday of Orthodoxy, yes. right? The restoration of the icons. He's the one who ordained her to the diaconate. And like I said, that's the middle of the ninth century. We've got references in the 10th century. Um, we've got Anna Comnena referring to the pastoral work, uh, charitable work that deaconesses uh, did that his fa her father, the uh, the Emperor Alexius Comnenus, supported. And uh, that's in the late 11th century. That's uh, t He was, uh, I think, 1081 is when Alexius became emperor. So we know that it goes, you know, much later than that. Balsam in his writing uh, uh, around, when is it, the end of the 12th century, and sees them as, as an order that no longer exists as an ordained order. We've got Anthony of Novgorod, the, the uh, Russian uh, uh, traveler uh, bishop who goes through Constantinople around 1200 and 
I think he's talking about deaconesses. That's what the assumption is he's got. He talks about these women he calls the Miro Forti, but they're chanting it at matins and and they're in the same place where the deaconesses, the female deacons were in uh, the great church in, uh, of Hagia Sophia uh, in Constantinople. Um, so I would place it at least to like, you know, uh, the end of the 12th century okay. maybe or so. It's it's unclear, but it, and we don't know why. Now, um, Matthew Vlastadis uh, has, I mean, He's got the most contorted backward reasoning. So he, he acknowledges, he knows the documentary evidence. He knows that there were ordained female deacons. And he says, but the, we don't have them anymore. We can't have them because um, of ritual impurity, you know, because of menstruation. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> but did he think that women earlier did not menstruate? <laughs> I mean, he knows, you know, that, that doesn't even make any sense. Um, although it could make sense in the um, sense that notion of ritual impurity starts becoming widespread in the eastern half of the empire from, I think, from the end of the 7th into the 8th century. And I say that because of the council in Trullo, uh, 691, 692. This council passed a lot of canons, which it gave the importance of ecumenical council status to. There were no canons, disciplinary canons from the fifth and sixth councils. So that council in Trullo, Trullo meaning a, a dome, Trullos, uh, it was held in a domed uh, room in, in, uh, in Constantinople. Um, and uh, it's also called the Quinisex Council for that reason about the fifth and sixth councils. Uh, ecumenical councils. So it took in about 200 private canons. By private canons, I mean letters that talk about disciplinary issues. So like a lot of them, I don't remember, I think there were several dozen of basils. Um, there were several from a bishop in Egypt, uh, in Alexandria, Dionysius of Alexandria, who was writing around the year 250. And he talks about how women, that they wouldn't even dare to go into church, let alone to receive the Eucharist when they're menstruating. Interestingly, at about the same time, you've got the apostolic constitutions, or it, sorry, its predecessor, excuse me, the Vidascalia Apostolorum, which is written about the same time as Dionysius. And it chastises women or men who are following these Levitical notions of ritual impurity and says specifically to women, if you think that you're unclean during your uh, menstrual cycle, then, you know, you've really lost the Holy Spirit <laughs> and that, you know, you don't need to be going to ritual baths. There's nothing impure about you. And then it gives like a whole list of bodily functions, including sexual ones and says, none of this stuff makes you unclean. These are just normal mm -hmm. bodily functions. And Chrysostom makes, uh, in, in several uh, of his uh, sermons, makes similar comments about sex, about uh, childbirth, etc. So this idea of ritual impurity was not widespread in Christianity until at least, as far as I can see, around the 7th or 8th centuries. So you, would right. you relate then to this continuation to that impurity issue? Uh, is that a primary reason or do you think there are other factors as well? There could be others. I have a feeling that that plays an important role in that, that, that I don't think it's coincidental that the spread of that notion of ritual impurity more or less coincides with the decline in the female diaconate. Um, certainly their functions differed over time so that in the early church, what we see is that deaconesses are serving in parishes um, and they you know, have very specific liturgical and pastoral functions in the parishes. We see some of that continue into the Byzantine period. Um, for instance, the literature talks about 
um, female deacons are in charge of the women's area at Hagia Sophia. So we're, we're seeing some of that same kind of liturgical function continuing and um, pastoral functions as well. And as we see from Anna's uh, remarks about her father uh, um, supporting the deaconesses, uh, charitable work they're doing, charitable work. But we also know, even as early as the late fourth century, if you look at what uh, we know about, for instance, uh, what's happening in Cappadocia, female deacons are moving into the monasteries. And we see that the two most commonly ordained people in the monasteries are the abbesses and the uh, directors of the choir, the equivalent of um, what we would call the protopsaltis. So that wouldn't have, you know, needed to die out except for, I would say, um, that idea of ritual impurity. Okay. Well, Dr. Karras, you've given us a lot to think about today. It's You've been very open and direct in your responses, and I greatly appreciate that. Is there anything else that you wanted to say before we let you go? Um, I think the only thing I'd like to say is that we need to be sensitive to those who are silently leaving. You had mentioned earlier about the question of schism. And I really think we don't pay enough attention to the quiet disapproval or the quiet even shattering of self-identity of some women and girls in our communities. And we have so much that can be offered to the church. I have no personal interest in being ordained to the diaconate or to any other clerical role, but that doesn't mean that I don't recognize other women who have much to offer us. And why would we turn them away? Why would we not use them in our in our church life? I guess I would respond to that personally by acknowledging the advanced degrees that you have. You have taken the time to get trained to become a scholar. And I am personally familiar with quite a few women who have done the same thing. They uh, Maybe they didn't feel that at one time in their history that was open, but you can certainly see it now. I mean, it's very impressive to me to see the number, how we are blessed really with the number of scholarly uh, women who are teaching us and that uh, we are benefiting from their knowledge. And so one might say, that's already happening may it increase, uh, but that they're not quite making that leap then to, well, what could a deaconess do that's not already being done by scholarly people like yourself? Oh, I don't consider, I mean, thank you for what you said about my my uh, scholarship, and but um, what I do is very different from what a female deacon did or would do in the church. And even my, uh, my background in, as a chanter is uh, different from most of what a female deacon does. I think that we should not see ourselves as limiting women to only certain roles within the church, although I'm glad to see that we have always recognized a variety of roles and a variety of functions for the laity as well as uh, the clergy within the church. But we could do more. We could recognize women doing more. But, but what I hear is more specifics on the need. What would be different? What need would be met that cannot be met apart from a full ordination of a female deacon today? Um, and, and maybe you could help us uh, even itemize some of those things. Um, I think one of the very important ones is counseling, is pastoral ministry, especially pastoral ministry that combines the pastoral counseling function with liturgical functions, such as giving the Eucharist. So we have women serving as chaplains in a number of hospitals and hospices these days, but they cannot 
take the Eucharist to Orthodox who would like to take communion because they're not ordained. We're not the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has Eucharistic ministers, for instance, lay people that um, serve, you know, help distribute the, the Eucharist at, at liturgy, at Mass. We don't do that. And I think it's right that we don't do that. That is a liturgical function that is meant for the clergy and is meant for, in fact, the major orders of clergy. Our subdeacons don't distribute the Eucharist, for instance. So that's a huge function. In countries that are primarily Orthodox, they often have special uh, chaplains at each hospital. And the, the parish priest doesn't usually make hospital visits. That's not true here in the United States. I don't know. I mean, our my parish priest has come, both of them have come out to our parish, to, to our home a number of times to give communion to my mom and to my sister and me as well, since we're usually home with mom. And she is, um, by the way, hard. 102? 101. 101 years old. <laughs> yes. Bless her heart. So, you know, we can get her to church occasionally. <laughs> we got her yeah. there for yeah. Christmas Eve uh, uh, morning for the liturgy, but it's very hard uh, for her. She's She's gotten weak and, mm -hmm. you know, her, I, I mean, it's just hard. So having them able to do that would be great. Sure, it, it would be nice if a lay minister, if a, I mean, a lay uh, assistant, whether male or female, came to visit us, but a lay assistant would not be able to give us the Eucharist as a female deacon or a male deacon could do. And for many women, and for some men, as I mentioned earlier, actually for the majority of men, <laughs> speaking to another woman is more comfortable for them than speaking to a man. So are we truly servicing the women in our uh, congregations as much as we could by having that available or not having that available right now. Um, but some would say it is available uh, <laughs> apart from the Eucharist. I guess what I'm trying but to... But apart from the Eucharist is a big thing. Yeah, but let's say that... Uh, and that... is a non-ordained person likely to get the blessing from the bishop to... Um, hear confessions, to do spiritual counseling. Uh, you know, nuns often serve that role today, but, but that, they're in monasteries. We don't have that a lot of... different than the male deacon? I mean, the male deacon doesn't hear confessions, or I know they bring it the Eucharist. Right, but they can do spiritual counseling, as, as can could women. the female deacon. Yeah, yeah. so... I mean, I just have to say, uh, and, and here's again, I'm learning, I'm trying to figure this out myself, uh, and I hear the argument about bringing the Eucharist, and that, that certainly is not insignificant. Uh, trust me that I don't think it is insignificant. But I'm looking for more. I'm looking for things that could be pointed to that says, this is why we need uh, a deaconess ordained to major order just like deacons, and you're saying that they should have the same function as deacons. And so what would be gained functionally that can't already happen? I'm... Well, you said that you don't think it's insignificant about the no, Eucharist. No, I don't. But somehow that's not sufficient? Well, but what I'm hearing is there are many reasons why we need this today. And... But I'm only hearing one, and I'd just I'd love to hear the others as well. That would I, that would be different than what can already happen. So, do we not need male deacons then, because those functions can be done otherwise? I'm not following. Well, I, I'm sort of turning the issue around to you because, to me, it's it's the sum total of the ministry of the deacon, whether male or female. The, the pastoral ministry, um, actually administrative functions, uh, whether at the uh, diocesan level or at the parish level, the uh, Eucharistic and other liturgical functions, to me it, it, it is the sum total. And 
I don't see any need to restrict the female deacon in this era since we don't restrict men and women in other ways, as was done earlier. I was thinking more in, I guess, in theoretical terms, but if you want to talk about it in a very pragmatic way, we have a really serious shortage of priests in all of our jurisdictions. And if you look at the numbers in terms of how many are going into seminary versus how many are retiring or uh, unfortunately dying, that is only going to get worse in the next couple of decades. Yeah, I've heard that. Except for the largest parishes, most of which are in the Greek archdiocese, some in the Antiochian um, and a few in, in others, um, except for the very largest parishes, my guess is that in most cases, a parish would be able to function as well with a priest and one or two full-time deacons as with two or three priests. In other words, in the very largest parishes, simply to do the sacraments, the number of baptisms, weddings, funerals, etc., you really do need two priests. But for most parishes, one priest is needed for those sacraments. But most of the work that the priest does is pastoral in nature, right? It's the hospital visits. Yes. It's meeting with parishioners about various issues that they have personally or in their families or whatever, those sorts of things. Overseeing the Sunday school and the various youth programs, etc. religious ed. Um, all of those things can be done by deacons, especially those hospital visits, the visits to people's homes, those kinds of things. And we have diaconal programs that are distance learning and that require only short, like summer one or two weeks, you know, um, of residency at uh, our, you know, either Holy Cross or at Antiochian Village or something like that uh, for those types of programs, as opposed to the three or four years of resident that's required it's at our seminary, major yeah. seminaries to get a Master of Divinity degree. And I don't want to see the MDiv degree diluted I think it's important that they be there, that they they get that that daily liturgical practice, that they live in that community, that they get that classroom experience with that coursework, as well as the practicums uh, that they have. But I think that deacons with the appropriate training, and they do need training, could be enormously helpful. And I wish our bishops and our other clergy would understand this and would look at the reality of where our churches are going over the next decade or two and how we are going to serve them adequately so that there can be a priest in each parish and still serve all of the pastoral needs of the parish in addition to its liturgical needs. Which goes to the heart and, of what the New Testament called for. That uh, exactly, we're a little busy here. We need some that's, help. That's absolutely it. Remember, <laughs> it, yes, exactly. When when the the whole conflict came up about who's getting the food and mm -hmm. and and all, and the apostles said, "We don't have time to deal with this. Here, we'll get you guys. <laughs> well, you if, take care of this parish level stuff." <laughs> If nothing else, maybe what can come out of this is an agreement on the need to relook at the entire diaconate and uh, re envision uh, the original purpose and uh, find more deacons who who can do that. So, yes, I would love to see a revived full time diaconate hmm. where it's not just they're serving on Sundays and have to go to you know a lay profession the rest of the week. So thank you, Dr. Karras, for your time, and uh, we hope to speak to you again on uh, this or other topics down the road. You were very welcome. I enjoyed it.
Well, thank you, Dr. Jeannie. So many of our listeners value your opinions on matters of Scripture, theology, and the Orthodox Church. So we're coming to you once again to ask you about another topic of interest around the Orthodox Church and in various circles, and that is the female diaconate. So first of all, thank you so much for taking the time with us. Thank you, John. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and to have an opportunity to express our love for the faith, and which I'm sure that all of us have, including people who might take a position different from me. We're not questioning their, their love for their church, but we're just trying to give our perspective. And I'm certainly giving my perspective, which is not entirely unique, but is based um, not only on my academic background, but on my years as a, as a priest's wife. I think I have something to contribute to the discussion. Let's start, if you don't mind, with a broader picture of the priesthood itself and women's ordination. Mm -hmm. Are there any theological reasons for preserving the episcopacy and priesthood strictly for the male gender? You know, people have asked this question. Of course, this question came up during the 1970s when we saw the Episcopal Church open up to women priests, and then they said there wouldn't be women bishops, but of course we knew that that would happen, and that is what happened. I am of the opinion that we cannot point to some reason that women cannot be priests from a theological perspective. I know that Father Hopko and some other theologians said, well, because Christ was a man, uh, the priest has to be a man, and that sort of a thing, but that really is from my understanding, a Catholic argument, it is not something, the priesthood isn't, I think, essentially male, because that view of priesthood is more along the lines of modeling oneself um, after the, the, in other words, the priest stands at the altar, this is the Catholic view, and he kind of recreates the sacrifice of the mass by saying the words of institution. We don't have that understanding. So I don't think that we could point to a theological reason in that sense. However, there is a reason for not doing it, and I would think it would be considered theological. And that is the fact that orthodoxy, uh, by definition, by our the essence of who we are, is that we are the church that has preserved apostolic tradition that is essential to our identity, to our very nature So to innovate in that way, to bring something new into the church, something so radically new, would be to change the essence of orthodoxy. And I don't see how that could ever be acceptable because it would change everything about the church. So let's then see if that applies to the female diaconate. Um, Mm -hmm. Is there any reason why uh, the church would want to preserve what is currently the practice of not having females as deacons? Well, it would be along those same lines. In the Orthodox Church, we have always had the understanding that what was done in the church was always for the benefit of the faithful and that it was not changes that were made because there have been some changes over the years. We, what we do today is not exactly what was done in the first century, but our mentality is our, the same. Our phronima is supposed to be the same. The way we um, think about the church, the way we consider what needs to be done in the church, that hasn't changed. So, Um, When it comes to the female diaconate, then the question becomes, why would we want to change? Why are they suggesting this kind of a change? And it seems to me that the reasons are not correct. First of all, the church makes changes very, very slowly. And it happens organically within the church. When the church sees that a need exists, then the change happens And it happens by the consensus of the church gradually over a long period of time. That's why we haven't had schisms in the Orthodox Church, because these kinds of changes were not done because people thought, well, let's just do something differently. I have a better idea about this. So to make this kind of a change, even though people think that there are compelling reasons and they make sense according to human reasoning that's not what we follow in orthodoxy 
This is what the West has followed, and this is why the West, frankly, is a mess. Both the Protestants and the Catholic Church, we, however, preserve apostolic tradition. And to ask us to make a change for some worldly purpose, like we want to prove that you know we're not against women, or we want to give women more opportunities for a ministry in the church, to make a change for that reason is to reject holy tradition in favor of human opinion, human reasoning, and it would set a terrible precedent, which we have actually seen in the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church made a dramatic change in the 1960s at a, after a council that they called Vatican II. And they introduced dramatic changes to their church. Many people left never to return. And then among the people who still are Roman Catholics today, they're pretty much divided into two camps. There are people who want the church to go back to the way it was. And then there are people who think the church didn't make enough changes. Hmm. So as soon as we introduce this idea of change as a possibility, because we think we know better than the church, what, and it's also suggesting that the church was lacking something. I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. As soon as we introduce that idea of a change, then why not change something else? Because we can always point to something that as individuals in our sinfulness, in our fallenness, in our short-sightedness, we think, oh, the church should change this without any real understanding of why the church has that as a practice or doesn't have that as a practice to begin with. So we're only looking at through our very narrow focus and the church has a whole history. It has a wisdom that we don't always understand. So the argument, though, would be, I'm sure, that well, we're not talking about a change. We're talking about restoring something mm -hmm. that already existed. Right. I've heard that, but I don't buy it for a couple of reasons. First of all, let's, let's say they were restoring exactly what used to exist in the female diaconate. And by the way, we haven't really talked about the terms, but um, let's clarify the terms because I think it's, it's very important that we understand what we mean by this, because I heard a podcast in which uh, an Orthodox person said there were never female deacons in the church, just deaconesses, and they somehow distinguished this from the male diaconate or something like this. Mm -hmm. Well, the word that is used in the church, in the early church, is diakonos, which is the male. So it is a perfectly correct to speak about a female deacon. The word deaconess, diakonisa, really is the word for the wife of the deacon, not a person who is ordained as a deacon. That's why the male version was used. So it was not correct. I mean, I heard somebody say that the church never referred to Phoebe as a deacon, but as a deaconess. No, that's, that's an English translation because they know that Phoebe was a woman. So they changed deacon to deaconess. But in Greek, it's deacon. So we're not talking about, well, let's say, let's say that we were talking about restoring the female diaconate. We have to understand what that meant. Okay. What was their role? And their role was not like what male deacons have liturgically in the church. So we'd be talking about a very limited role, which is specifically directed to the care of women. And it wasn't the same as the male deacon, even though they had the term deacon. Phoebe was a deacon, diakonos. That's a masculine ending. Uh, she didn't function the same way as male deacons did. So I don't believe that what women today are looking for in the restoration of the diaconate is to do exactly the same thing. And as a matter of fact, some of the women who advocate for this say it won't be the same. It will be a modern or updated version. Now we're talking about innovation which is exactly what orthodoxy is not about. So that's why I don't accept that. I, I used to be in favor of it because I can see where there might be some usefulness for a female diaconate because we have orthodox women who are hospital chaplains, but they can't administer communion to orthodox people in the hospital. I could see that. I could see an Orthodox female deacon going to shut-ins and, and administering Holy Communion to them. But that's not what 
uh, they are thinking of. Most women are imagining the deacon in front of the holy uh, gate, the royal gate, saying again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord. And that would not happen because that never happened in the early church. And if they want it, if they say, okay, we'll just allow the limited function of the female diaconate. They'll, she'll just go and assist the priest by giving communion to women who are, you know, shut-ins or when people in hospitals. Let's say they allowed that. What would happen? Because our people are ignorant. I'm sorry to say too many people are ignorant. They would say, well, why does Deacon Susan not serve in the altar during the divine liturgy? Why doesn't Deacon Susan stand there with her stole and say again and again in peace? Why is it only Deacon George, for example, that does that? They would say, oh, well, then we're not treating women fairly. We're, we're treating them unequally, and that isn't right. So because our people have a, a mainly worldly understanding of the church and apply to it their human thinking and worldly thinking, this would create all sorts of problems. And there frankly just isn't enough of a need for it. If the priests weren't able to take care of all the people who are sick by visiting them in the hospital, then I could see perhaps that we would restore it. But it's just not for the right reason, in my opinion. Okay, so there does seem to be a variety of opinions about the nature or level of mm -hmm. this order from uh, the history of the church. We hear about major orders and minor yes. orders. Can you help us sort that out? Okay, so yes, because in the history of the church, as I mentioned, there were women deacons like Phoebe. She specifically mentioned in Romans chapter 16. She's the first person who's mentioned Romans chapter 16. Now, I also think it's important if, uh, as you mentioned, I love the fact that you're saying we want to have a peaceful, uh, rational, calm discussion about these matters. What's happened is that people are taking certain historical factors and they're kind of coloring them to support their perspective. So even though I currently am not in favor of the female diaconate, even though I think under some circumstances the res restoration might be warranted, um, we have to set aside our personal opinions and just look at the historical record. Okay. And St. Paul, in chapter 16, because men have said there are a lot of men who are opposing the female diaconate, and they said, well, there were never female deacons. And Paul calls her deacon, diaconos. Well, they say, well, that was a minister. Um, Protestants say this often too, some Protestants. So they will say, well, she wasn't really a deacon. She was a minister or she was a servant. But let's just look at that passage there because Paul calls her diaconos. And then he lists a lot of women in chapter 16 of Romans who are doing a lot of work in that church. He doesn't call any one of them diaconos. Okay, he says, greet Mary who has worked hard among you. If he meant to say that Phoebe was just somebody who was serving the church, I don't think he would have used that term because he never uses that term for all these other women whom he applauds and commends for all the work they're doing in the church. And he calls one of them apostolos. Junia is an apostle. So the point is, she was clearly a diakonos. She was a female deacon. So let's not try to say that she was something else because I also find it rather offensive when men assume that, oh, she can't be really a deacon, but anytime that word is mentioned, because they'll say, well, Paul calls himself a servant. Yeah, but whenever that word is used for a man, we don't say, well, he wasn't really a deacon. He was just a servant. So let's be consistent and let's be fair when we're analyzing these texts. So she was a deacon, but that had a very limited role, and it was very important because women deacons were needed to assist the church in baptisms. That was the primary function of a female deacon in the early church because, as everybody knows, people were baptized entirely naked, and most of the people who were coming for baptism were adults. And nonetheless, the church baptized them completely naked, and they were anointed with holy oil over their entire body. And that could not be done mm -hmm. by a priest or a bishop. So the woman stood naked on the other side of a screen, and the priest 
proclaimed or pro expressed the baptismal formula, the servant of God, so-and-so, is baptized, and the female deacon immersed her, anointed her, and, and all the rest, and pr presumably gave her her robe, her baptismal robe, and helped her get dressed. That was essential. We couldn't have functioned without that. So this was the primary role that they served, but we also know that they sort of assisted with keeping order in the section of the church where women and little children were. So we know that they did that also. Well, we don't really have that need anymore. That was their primary need. And also it seems that they took communion to women who were bed bound at home because it was considered inappropriate for a man to visit a woman in her home, a priest, for example. Okay. So they had the female deacons do this. Now today, it's not considered inappropriate for a, for a priest to go visit someone in their home and give them communion or to go to a woman in the hospital, give her communion or, or a male deacon. So we simply don't have the need for that ministry anymore. And there were other offices in the church that kind of disappeared because there wasn't really a perceived need. And the church is very wise about meeting the needs of its people. The church would never see a need and say, well, we can't have that because women can't do that. The church always meets the needs of its people, but it doesn't create offices or restore offices just because somebody thinks we need to prove that women are capable of doing ministry or giving them some kind of a role because they're somehow neglected in the life of the church. So you asked me about the ordination and the higher and lower orders. Yes, this is true. So uh, again, some people are saying there were no women deacons because they were not among the higher order of clergy and they, they try to differentiate. In other words, they want to deny the reality of a female diaconate. And I don't think we should deny that even if we don't think it's appropriate for today. In other words, we're trying to approach these issues in a theoretical way, in a philosophical way, in an academic way. But let's talk about the historical reality and whether or not there is a, a practical need for that today in the church. That's my approach. So we know that in the early church, there were two levels of clergy, the lower orders of clergy, in which somebody was given a blessing by the bishop, and that is called hirothesia, hirothesia, the laying on of hands. So those are things like subdeacon and the readers and chanters today, but there were also people who literally were responsible for the doors of the church, doorkeepers and exorcists. And we had an order of widows in the early church, things like this. Those people who have those orders can marry after they receive that blessing. And those blessings are done uh, not within the sanctuary, but we would say today in front of the Econostasi, okay? I was, by the way, I was tonsured as a reader in the church. I received that blessing of Hirothesia by our bishop some years ago. And there are women that I know also who have been tonsured in the Orthodox Church as a reader or chanter. Then you have the higher, what are called higher orders of clergy. And those are ordained orders. And the word for that is Hirotonia. And that's an ordination. There is a difference there. And we know that women were ordained in the sanctuary as a deacon and at the holy altar by the bishop. And they would receive communion directly from the chalice and replace it on the holy altar, which was a sign that they were among what we would call today the higher orders of clergy. So the female deacon was ordained, yes, with different kinds of prayers than the male deacon because the prayers always reflect the work she's going to do, the ministry she's going to perform in the church. So she wasn't identical to the male deacon. She had her own ministry, but nonetheless, it was an ordained ministry. We don't have a good English word that differentiates between hirotonia and hirothesia, both of which are like a laying on of hands by the bishop. We don't have a good English word. In our uh, thinking today, and again, uh, those of us who are not seminary trained are trying to figure this out in terms of, well, what was it? What is it today? What do they want it to be? So when you talk about major orders of deacons, priests, and bishops— 
Mm -hmm. We think in terms of a progression that yes. deacons then will become priests. They uh, might. might. They might, yeah. And a priest, more rarely, but still uh, could become a bishop. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there any examples in history where a female deacon who received major orders eventually mm -hmm. became a priest? No, not within the Orthodox Church. Okay. Heretics, however, did ordain Women as priests, schismatic and heretical groups did that. And so there are books out there that say there were women priests in the early church. Well, yeah, those were heretical groups that did this sort of thing, not within the Orthodox Catholic Church. And by the way, I, I remembered I was going to mention something that I talked about earlier. The church is not lacking anything. So when people say, well, we need to restore that because we need this for women, then you're saying that the church, which is Catholic, what, what we mean by the word Catholic is not universal. That's what the Catholics say. Catholic means that the church is complete. It is lacking nothing that people need for their salvation. In that case, then we have to ask ourselves, if the church is not lacking anything, why would we try to give it something that it doesn't need, which is the restoration of the female diaconate or a new kind of female diaconate, an, an innovative female diaconate. You've used the word need a lot here, and I've picked this up from other interviews as well, mm -hmm. that uh, when a need arose, the bishops of the church looked yes. for ways to meet that need, starting you know, right in the book of Acts, when it appeared yes. obvious to them that we need some deacons here to be sent out to uh, visit prisons, minister to the sick, and take care yes. of people because we don't have time to do everything. Right. And so that was the need. Then you talked about female deacons because there was a need to help with female baptisms and mm -hmm. to help with order in the church and to uh, take care of, of a need. But you're saying that you don't see that need today. And the argument back to that that I've mm -hmm. heard is that, I'll use what I've heard even as a quote, we are bleeding young women out of mm -hmm. the church because mm -hmm. there is n not an ordained female deacon to help minister to the needs of women. Women need mm -hmm. other women. Mm -hmm. And so you were Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. You served for many years mm -hmm. in a very key role in the church. And so you have talked to a lot of women, I'm sure, but... I'm a guy, so I'm trying to really be sympathetic to what yes. is expressed as a need uh, because I don't know whether there is one or not. Yes, that's a really good question. And I appreciate the fact that you're sensitive to the fact that there might be something that women feel that they need that um, men sometimes, I, I do find it rather disappointing when men are very dismissive of what women say. So I appreciate the fact that you recognize that you might not recognize this. I'm speaking theologically. So if they say that we are bleeding women, women are leaving the church, I think they're leaving the church because they don't understand what orthodoxy is all about. They're not leaving the church because uh, we don't have women in leadership roles. And if they feel that there should be um, some kind of leadership role that they're called to, other than the priesthood, or, or we could say the diaconate, they can do virtually everything in the church. What we, we do need women in positions of, of leadership in the church. I think that's helpful. I think it's, it's important because we have been a mostly male dominated church. That is true, but that has been because women really didn't have opportunities in the past. And that is because until recently, when because we have a lot of modern conveniences, women were really confined to the home because somebody had to be home taking care of the house. I mean, we, we forget that it wasn't that long ago when we didn't even have disposable diapers and frozen food and, you know, and vacuum cleaners and things like that. I mean, women were really needed at the home just to keep the place together and feed the family and everything. So women didn't have opportunities to go to study theology 
or to have a, a, you know, to learn to be an iconographer or to become a church musician. That just didn't exist. Now that exists for us and there's nothing to prevent us from using our gifts and exercising those roles in the church. There is virtually nothing a woman cannot do in the Orthodox church except to administer the sacraments. And she can even, you can say, administer holy unction if it's already been blessed by the priest. So we simply don't have, I I can understand why they think that, oh, it's all about men and there's nothing for women. I don't think that's true because that's not what I see and that's not what I'm doing. Women can do virtually everything there is in the church, but they have to go to school. They have to get the training. They have to serve the parish. They have to be in a position to give those gifts to the church with an attitude of service and humility, not in a worldly sense to demand a position of authority because what people presume is true in orthodoxy because they see it in the Catholic church or they see it in the Protestant churches is not true about the priests. And I appreciate you saying uh, the, the fact or mentioning the fact that I have you know, been married to a priest for 44 years and I know the parish life and the life of the priest is not a person of glory and authority. Now, in the Catholic Church, the priest has a lot of authority because their parish councils are advisory. The priest decides, and in a lot of Protestant churches, what the pastor says, that's it. Even about theology, that's not the case in the Orthodox Church. It is not the case at all. The priest is really the servant of the church in Orthodoxy in a way that we don't have it. The priest doesn't give orders The priest doesn't give orders in orthodoxy. The only place he really can control anything or have the final say is within the church walls itself, having to do with the services. So if women really wish to serve the church, there are a great many things that they could do, and I want them to do that. But if we change the church to pacify people, to show girls that there's nothing wrong with orthodoxy. We're going to lose a whole lot more people who have come to the Orthodox Church or who are Orthodox, people like me, because we believe that the church has preserved apostolic tradition. So what we should be doing is modeling for our girls leadership in the church. There's a lot of things we can do and encouraging them to make use of their gifts in the church. And The priesthood is just a very tiny part of that. And most of what the priest does is not seen on Sunday morning. You see, what we see is the priest standing in front of the altar because we see the priest for two hours on a Sunday morning. Most of what the priest does is not done there inside the church. The priest is in the office. There's a lot of uh, administrative work in the church and there are female parish administrators There's a lot of counseling people and meeting with them and visiting them in their houses and going to hospitals. All of that work can be done by a woman. And I will tell you, my mother visited people in the hospitals as part of Philoptikos. You know, the Philoptikos for the Greek Orthodox, that's a women's organization. They raise money and they help women and the poor. But among the things that they do is they visit people in hospitals or send them little greeting cards. My mother did that for 20 years in serving the church and visiting people in hospitals. There's nothing to prevent an Orthodox woman from visiting people in the hospitals, taking the Paraklisi service. I was, my father was, is just now leaving a rehab. He broke his hip. I haven't really talked about that. I was taking the Holy Unction to him, which you can get from your priest. He will give it to you and doing the Paraklisi service and anointing him. I could have done that for anybody. Anybody can do that. So this idea that somehow the women are going to have authority that they're lacking now is to totally misunderstand the role of the priest. They have no idea what the priesthood is. It is a a role of tremendous self-sacrifice. And and let me tell you, since you could see you've got me all a little (laughs) bit worked up. I just think people do not, unless you're a family of a priest, unless you really live this life, you have no idea what is involved. This is a 24-7 job 
There is no break from being a priest. This is not a position of glory or authority. You are the slave of the parish. You know, you have to learn to work with the people. You don't have any authority where you can impose your will on the parish. That doesn't exist. And the priest is on call and the priest carries. He knows about all the problems of everybody in the church. And we will go to church and we see people, we think everything's great. It looks like everything's great in their life. But the priest knows what's going on in everybody's life. If they've shared it with him, of course. And then he walks around carrying that. And then he's responsible. He's answerable to God for all the sins of everybody in the parish. He will have to account for all those souls. Now, who wants to volunteer for that? Chrysostom, by the way, said this in his treatise on the priesthood. The priest is responsible for all the souls. This is not a position of authority and glory and power. It's when Jesus said, he who would be first among you, let him be the servant of all. He meant it. So if our women really want to serve the church, let them start on the parish level. Let them be educated. Let them be Sunday school teachers and chanters and parish council members. Let them serve. There's nothing wrong with that. I want to see more women in those positions. But to be demanding a position of authority and because they believe that this is something that we're de denied or deprived is to not understand the priesthood at all. So I'm sure a proponent of the restoration of the female diaconate would argue back that the priesthood is not what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And we agree with you about the priesthood, that it is not something that we want, and that's even stated on the St. Phoebe website. What we're asking for is needful uh, yes. because uh, women need to be ministered yes. by a woman. And in some cases, the lack of an ordination from a, a recognized church denies mm -hmm. access maybe to a prison mm -hmm. as a chaplain or to a hospital. And so why can't they have the blessing of the church mm -hmm. with a prayer, with a service, and with a what a, a title or whatever that says you are blessed and commissioned by the mm -hmm. church to go minister in these situations. Uh, I I can see that, and and if you say you want a blessing or permission, we don't do anything in the parish without the permission of the priest. I don't preach in churches. Sometimes I preach in churches. I don't do that without the permission of the parish priest and the bishop. So. Yes, we should have that. But like I mentioned, my mother was visiting people mm -hmm. for the parish. And nobody knew, by the way, they, she was called like the sunshine lady. That was <laughs> the title in Philoptochus, okay? Yeah. Nobody knew or really thought about what she was doing. And it, it, even at the time, I didn't fully appreciate what she's doing. There is nothing to prevent a woman from doing that. Now, what I have read people say, well, women need women's gifts. I don't buy that. I don't agree with that because there's nothing special about what a woman can offer. There's no grace that's only for a woman or from a woman or by a woman. Now, as a wife of a priest, I understand that sometimes women want to talk to other women, but you don't need an ordained position to do that. We have a lot of women who are either theologians or they are counselors or psychologists. They can fulfill that role without having it be an ordained role. And if they want a blessing from the bishop, you know, your, your grace, I really feel called to go to prisons and, and minister to women or to, to counsel women. Would you please pray over me? He will do that. Your parish priest will do that. That's different from ordination. So I don't think it is needed because we already are fulfilling those roles. Women used to come up to me and talk to me all the time because they were a little bit shy about talking to Father Costa. Let me just explain why the diaconate, female diaconate will not help that. Because if they're saying, why is it that how, first of all, the deacon does not, in the early church, the deacon did not counsel people. He took communion maybe, 
Okay, he, he helped with the poor. Chrysostom did that for five years. He was a deacon for five years. And this is why he was so sensitive to the needs of the poor. He was taking food to the poor. That was his job because remember, they chose the deacons so that they wouldn't be waiting tables. They wouldn't be distributing food for the poor. That was the job of Chrysostom for five years. He spent a lot of time with the poor. There, you do not need an ordination to do that. A blessing is different from an ordination. You can ask for the blessing. Go ahead. And I think that's beautiful. I think it's wonderful. But what they're asking us to do is not really to restore something that used to serve in the church and now is needed again. But this idea that somehow the church is lacking something, it's not effectively ministering to women. And I don't accept that. I don't think that the majority of women in the Orthodox Church believe that their needs are spiritual needs are not being met. So let's say you ordain a woman to be a deacon. And then does this give her the ability to give spiritual advice? That's not what you, you don't go to the deacon for spiritual advice. You don't go to the deacon for counseling. You need to go to a priest for that. And by the way, we have abbesses in monasteries who counsel people and give spiritual advice. And even hear confessions although they can't give absolution. We have that. We have women who are fulfilling that role right now. So I really believe, and even though I'm not suggesting that they're disingenuous, and I know I was one of those women who used to think that it might be beneficial to have the female diaconate again, because I can see how they could be useful, especially in hospital ministry and this kind of a thing. But I have come to see that the spirit behind what we're hearing is not the restoration of what used to be in the church, but something new. And as soon as you introduce something novel into orthodoxy, you risk changing the church. Because once we accept something new, just because somebody thinks we really, really need this now, and it's not something that grows organically within the church because the church recognizes that there's a need that is being fulfilled, then we are, because we're responding to some, you know, movement out there in the world, then we're changing orthodox, orthodoxy fundamentally. So I, I don't accept that. All right, let's pivot to the support or lack of support for this mm -hmm. movement in various jurisdictions in the United yeah. States oh. for the restoration of the female diaconate. And you don't see much from uh, like yes. the OCA or the Antiochian or some of the other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's just because the other jurisdictions haven't had time to study the issue? Or do you think it's more a matter of conviction on their part? Uh, first of all, when the issue of women's ordination was happening in the 70s, I'm lucky that I'm old enough to remember these things. When that was being discussed in the 70s, and we did talk about female diaconate maybe and female priesthood. Theologically, we were having these discussions in Orthodoxy because it was happening in the Episcopal Church. So we did have these discussions. And we saw zero, zero Orthodox women. I never meant Orthodox women, certainly not a theologian who was advocating for this. What I think is different is now we have some women who have some theological training in the Greek Orthodox Church, I, I'm assuming, if this is where this is happening. I, I really don't know what's going on every, anywhere else. And they're sort of advocating for this. And this is one of the reasons, because you're, you're right, that we don't see this. I don't, this is why I'm telling you I don't see the need because I don't see women in the Orthodox Church saying, gee, the church isn't fulfilling my needs. I have to go to a male priest instead of a female deacon to pray with me or something like this. So I'm not sensing anywhere in Orthodoxy that there is a movement among women that we need this. And this argument that the church is bleeding, hey, the church is bleeding boys too, not just girls. And that's because we're not teaching them what it is to be an Orthodox Christian. They're seeing the culture. They're being influenced by the culture, the culture in which people are simply pursuing their self-will. This is the problem, is we're not educating our children, period. It's not because we're lacking uh, women clergy. So I appreciate about what you raised is the question of the other jurisdictions. And that is, they don't want this. And so if we were to go forward and actually ordain a female deacon, this would cause a great schism in the church, and it's not worth it. 
I mean, we still have people on different calendars. We're going to introduce, this is deeply theologically disturbing because it reflects an attitude of individuality, of individualism. I think this is the right thing to do. Therefore, I'm going to do it. And that's not how we operate in the Orthodox Church. We had controversy of not using the common spoon, of using multiple spoons during, during COVID, COVID. Yeah, And we're going to, I mean, that's, that's nothing compared to what this would do. And people were very upset about that because, again, of what it said about the sacrament. So if we begin ordaining women deacons just because a few people think it's a good idea, where's the call? Where's the, uh, where's the, the need in the church? Where are the women who are clamoring? And if, even if they did, they're misunderstanding what orthodoxy is about. It's about preserving the ancient apostolic tradition not responding to the whims of change in the world because we can always come up with some rational reason why something needs to be changed in the church. And if we follow that thinking rather than preserving what the church has given us, which has been the source of our sanctification, we're not sanctified because we follow our own opinions and try to follow our own you know, objectives and, and our own self-will. We're sanctified through the church because the church is a vehicle for salvation because it hasn't changed. It's preserved what we receive from the apostles. And this idea that, oh, we couldn't ordain women back then because the people wouldn't have accepted it, that's nonsense. Jesus did all kinds of things that were contrary to the customs of the times. So we, I, as an Orthodox Christian, believe that what Christ gave the apostles was correct and true. And if he had thought that we needed something different, he would have given us the something different. To say that the church didn't, couldn't do that or didn't know or Jesus was hampered somehow, that's a lot of nonsense. I don't accept that. So the way we are structured administratively here in yeah. this country, uh, in an uncanonical way, we have multiple bishops in one location, one city. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for a single jurisdiction, a bishop, to do this because they feel maybe the conviction that it should be done? It's possible, but I think that that bishop would face a, a lot of backlash I mean, it's theoretically possible because a bishop can ordain. So that's theoretically possible. But we, one of the things that's wonderful about the Orthodox Church is that, we, is that we, and this is why we shouldn't change, because as soon as we introduce a change, other people will call for other changes. Let's say one bishop changes this and he ordains a woman deacon. Another bishop says, well, I think we should be doing this. We should go forget about the spoon. Let's go back to giving everybody communion in their hands and drinking out of the common chalice. Let's go back to that. And another bishop says, well, let's do this. You see, the only thing that preserves orthodoxy is our absolute devotion to preserving apostolic tradition unchanged. This is what gives us our unity in spite of the fact that we have this uncanonical situation with overlapping jurisdictions, nonetheless, we are one church, one faith, one baptism, one holy Orthodox tradition. If people begin to adopt this worldly and very Western way of thinking, well, this makes sense to me, therefore I'm going to do it. And we do see some of that already emerging in some hierarchs. As soon as they do that, we will fall to pieces because Already, the Western church is completely fractured. Protestants have total disunity. The Catholic church is completely disunited, theologically speaking, because everybody has a different opinion, and there's all kinds of different orders and all kinds of different opinions among theologians, but at least the Catholics have the Pope. They are together, jurisdictionally, under a Pope. But we don't have that. So what's going to happen to the Orthodox? We will splinter and there's nothing to hold us together because currently the thing that holds us together is that we share the common faith and that the bishops respect each other and no bishop in his right mind would do this. He would probably face severe censure. I don't know if that would invalidate the ordination, but that would be a disaster hmm. for the church. And I think the bishops know this. 
So even an innovation like the multiple spoons was a terrible thing and created a lot of, of backlash. But we can recover from that. But it, it shows the, the spirit of introducing innovations in the church in a way that shows a lack of respect for what the church has always done, always known, how the church has always behaved. A rogue bishop is not something that the church has never accepted rogue bishops. In, in the past, sometimes they've been removed. And I wouldn't be surprised if a bishop who did this was removed by his fellow bishops. And that could happen. Again, I'm not opposed to it, except that I, I, I don't want to see the church start making changes because somebody thinks it ought to be done. And so what role are they going to take? Are they going to stand in front of the royal gate and say again and again in peace, let's pray the Lord? That would be a big innovation and not something that we can accept. So let me see if I can summarize your positions just so that we're very, very clear. You are cautioning us to rigorously preserve the tradition of the church and let's Mm -hmm. not get innovative and start making changes. At the same time, you acknowledge that uh, down through the years, there have been uh, deaconesses who have served specific functions, whether it was in baptisms in the early church or mm-hmm. bringing uh, communion to the, to the sick or infirm, and you saw the reason for that. And so if some of that happened today, apart from the motivation, which you fear, Uh, you would not see that as a departure from the great tradition because it was done in the past. Is that a fair assessment of your... Yes, except for the motivation part of it, because that is, if the motivation is not correct, in other words, if we're trying to do something simply to give women some more things to do in the church, when we already have everything open to us in the church, other than the priesthood, if, if we're doing it for that motivation, that is a departure from the tradition of the church because it, it doesn't reflect the fronima, the mind of the church. The essence of who we are is that we have this particular mentality. So I don't see the reason for it. And I think that, that the, the threat of the, its damaging effects in the church by introducing a mentality of change is far more dangerous than any benefit that we could receive from having a woman deacon in the church. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jeannie. This has been helpful, and you've given us a lot of your time, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, folding this into our documentary, and also the full interviews will be available on the website uh, in the same place so people can dive in deeper with you on this topic with this interview. So, Thank you, John. Thank you. God bless you and everybody out there in the church. Well, next in our series, we have the honor of speaking with Dr. James C. Skedros. He is the Michael G. and Anastasia Cantonis Professor of Byzantine Studies and Professor of Early Christianity at Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. So, Dr. Skedros, thank you so much for your time today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, John. Well, you served in very significant academic leadership roles in the Orthodox Church over many years, in particular, of course, at Holy Cross Hellenic College. And I'm just wondering, as you've worked with seminarians down through the years, has the topic of the restoration of the female diaconate uh, come up? Is it spoken of? Uh, How high on the radar is it for our seminarians? Sure. So, uh, it's hard to say exactly what the students talk about um, when I'm not listening, <laughs> sure. um, because I know that the, uh, you know one of the great things about seminary education in person, for sure, is the conversations that take place um, outside of the classroom. But in general, you know, in general, I would say it's not a major issue of a major issue of concern. 
So there were several students that attended the St. Phoebe conference, the 10th anniversary conference um, last month that was held on our campus and they participated at various moments. They didn't, they weren't part of the conference, but I saw students there. Um, but I would say in general, it's not one of these heated topics from what I'm hearing. I certainly address the issue in my introductory course um, on church history, especially in the first semester where we're talking about the early church up through about the year 700. So I certainly have an opportunity to talk about sort of the historical evidence for the diaconate, both male and female, but more specifically male, but also the issue of female diaconate comes up as well. Um, but outside of that, in general, I would say it's not, um, it doesn't seem to be a big issue okay. um, from what I can see. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And I'm trying mm -hmm. to just find out at, at our various seminaries all across sure. the United States, so whether that's a topic. And obviously our future uh, priests and deacons in the church, uh, you know, may eventually be faced with that topic. And so it'd be interesting Absolutely. to see if they're thinking about it now. So uh, is it your sense that since the 1988 Rhodes Consultation in Greece, that I know you're familiar with, mm -hmm. that there has been any significant movement toward the restoration of deaconesses in the Orthodox Church in this country? So uh, I'm glad you referenced the 88 uh, Rhodes Consultation. It is a pretty watershed moment, at least in this conversation about the role of the female diaconate. And I think it's important for folks, if they have the opportunity um, to at least get a sense of what was said at that conference. In particular, to your question about sort of movement post-88 Rhodes Consultation in, in America, it seems to me that there has been, uh, there certainly has been some legs, uh, but I'm not so sure that those legs have materialized um, outside of sort of pockets. So I'm thinking, um, first of all, I don't think this is a direct result of the Rhodes Conference, but a couple of publications that have come out of North American, American scholars, um, Kidiaki Fitzgerald's book that she published in 1998 on the women deacons in the Orthodox Church, uh, Father John Chrysavis, um, who published a book in 2009 on the diaconate, um, really focusing, on, well, focusing exclusively on the male diaconate, but the title of the book, Remembering and Reclaiming the Aquania, um, really was an attempt to rethink or at least reintroduce the Orthodox world, especially the English speaking in North America, to the diaconate. But in addition to those sort of academic pieces that have kind of popularized or made accessible the conversation of the diaconate post uh, Rhodes consultation, I think clearly the establishment of the St. Phoebe Center. Uh, certainly in 2013, and then also in 2014, when St. Catherine's Vision, uh, an organization of women theologians um, that has had been in existence prior to 2014, but they came out with their statement on the rejuvenation or a call for the rejuvenation um, for the ministry of the ordained um, deaconess. Um, I think that is also showing some traction some energy, some movement forward. But these are all movements or re responses um, or actions on the lay level. Um, so in that sense, I would say, yes, I think there has been. On the official ecclesial level, I don't see really much of anything. Mm. Um, and I'm not in those circles per se. I'm a layman. Uh, so I, I, I'm certainly not in those circles, but, you know, I teach it at the Greek Orthodox Seminary. I'm part of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. Um, so but on the ecclesial level, I haven't seen a whole lot. With one exception, I think uh, this is important to note, and maybe we'll have a chance to come back to it. Sure. Uh, in 2007, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese established a training program here at Holy Cross for the male diaconate. Which you have been this... a leadership rollover, right? Correct. So, I mean, I, I was involved from the very beginning, and I have just stepped down now because um, someone else is going to take it over. So for the last, you know, 15 years or so, I've been very much involved in this program. And what the program has demonstrated to me, at least on the Episcopal level, is that the parochial synod of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese saw a need for deacons 
and they asked for a program. And that program has, to me anyway, demonstrated or touched a kind of a, a real desire within a demographic of men age 30 to 55, 60, who really want to serve, but want to serve beyond some traditional ways of serving in parishes. And I've just been amazed at the involvement and of the interest in the numbers of students that have come to this program and the fact that the archdiocese greek Orthodox archdiocese has ordained 50 plus students from the program yeah, and that's so kind there of really a is renewal for the yeah the it GOA. is for the goa it's definitely we did not have a tradition in in america ever really of having deacons early on there's some evidence of some deacons you know in the early 1900s but other than that we don't have this tradition and so this is something very new for us, perhaps unlike the Antiochian Archdiocese and our Russian uh, churches, you know, brethren uh, churches as well. Uh, but uh, for the GOA, it was something new. And there was pushback. There was pushback from priests, even from some um, hierarchs. Um, but uh, it has moved along. And I think one thing it's shown me is um, that there is a real desire among laity to find ways in which to connect to the ministry of the church. Um, in a more intense, uh, in a more focused uh, way. Well, and that's yeah. certainly encouraging. Uh, and this has come up in some of my other discussions as well. I mean, yes, we are focusing on the deaconesses, but mm -hmm. the broader conversation about uh, the future and role of deacons, uh, male or female, but right now male, where is that going? What is the purpose? Where should it be going? And uh, uh, how can we make maybe more than just a liturgical expression of the deacon uh, more you know, maybe similar to the way it was in earlier church history. So, yeah. So I would just really quickly uh, respond in that um, it's clear that the Metropolitans, uh, the Park Hill Synod, was seeking this diaconate program because of long communion lines. That was the issue, okay. really long communion lines in large parishes. And and so what we've discovered though is okay, that need is being met now by the you know, ordination of men into the diaconate at various churches. But what we're finding, and we we do um, surveys of our graduates and clergy and parishes that have deacons in them, is that the deacons are doing a lot more than just liturgical, you know, roles. They are participating, especially, I think, really significantly in aiding the priest in shut-in visits, hospital visitation, shut-in visits, bringing Eucharist to people that can't make it to church. And so we're seeing, a, a, like you said, not just a liturgical role of the deacons, which seems to have been the real impetus to start this program back in 07, um, to a broader understanding. What's interesting, though, of the role of the diaconate, what's interesting, we still don't have anything official from the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese saying, okay, this is what a deacon does. Hmm. Okay. All right. The, we, and I'm telling you, it's almost like this. So this whole conversation about deacons, deaconess is one thing I think that's coming out that's really positive is for the church to really think hard about, okay, what are, what is the dimension of the ministry yes. of the diaconate, male, female, regardless, what is, what are those dimensions? Yeah, yeah. And we don't even have to be arguing about deaconesses to uh, address the broader right. uh, need for uh, Correct. deacons. So, so then in that program, Dr. Skedros, mm -hmm. uh, are there any females enrolled? And if they wanted to be enrolled, could they? So we, uh, we purposely did not, we've stayed away from gender language when we had advertised the program. And the initial reason was not because we are some clandestine move here to ordain women to the diaconate, not at all. We were thinking initially that it could be that the program would be a uh, maybe just a continuing education um, opportunity for male or female. As a program kind of unfolded, it became clear that this really is a program for training and preparing men for possible ordination to the diaconate. And what we, we haven't changed our advertising language, but, and here's what we tell, um, we've had, s I wouldn't say several, but a handful of women inquiries who have inquired over the years. And our response to them is, um, the first thing you need to do is talk to your local bishop. And it's up to the local bishop whether or not everybody that applies to the program is admitted needs a blessing from their local bishop. 
um, from their canonical bishop. And, and that seems to be where the conversation stops. So we've never said, um, we've never advertised the program as male and female, uh, but we've just kind of been kind of gender neutral about it. But everybody in the program has been male. We have not had a student in the program that's been a woman. Okay. All right. So yeah. then back to our topic of deaconesses, I'm just interested to know where have you seen the broadest support for the restoration of the female diaconate, not just here, but worldwide? So it's interesting. I think uh, the Church of Greece in Greece in the 50s and 60s seems, this is quite a while ago, seems to have been very interested theologically in this, Uh, and especially because of uh, the work of some theologians at the University of Athens on the issue of the ordination of female deacons. Uh, Even more recently, uh, there was a international conference, I think in 2016, somewhere in there, 2015, 2016, in Thessaloniki, the University of Thessalonica School of Theology sponsored uh, on the role of women in the church and the female diaconate. Having said that, even the Church of Greece has, has agreed um, that uh, they would ordain, that a woman could be ordained to the diaconate, but it had to be in a monastic community, and she had to be a monastic. Um, I do not know. I have not done my research to find out whether that has happened in Greece. Um, so, but I don't see anything from what I read in uh, from Greece, from the Church of Greece, that there's any kind of movement within parishes for um, a, a female diaconate. Uh, certainly, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of writing about the church in Africa, the Patriarchate of Alexandria, and the sort of uh, what's the, I forget the exact technical term they're using, not appointment, but consecration, consecration I think. Yeah. Of, yeah, consecration of women. Um, and given the title deaconess, it's not an ordination. So there's been a lot of, you know, talk about that. It's hard to get information, uh, at least from my perspective, accurate information on that. And I don't really know. Sure. Um, but then I would have to say, really, uh, if I look at the, the Patriarchate of Constantinople, uh, the leadership from Patriarch Demetrius, who is the predecessor of Patriarch Bartholomew and Patriarch Bartholomew as well, they have certainly given uh, support in the sense of giving positive statements about this issue needs to be discussed. The Rhodes Conference in in eighty eight was you know was partly sponsored by maybe even fully but sponsored by the Ecumenical Patriarchate and Demetrius Patriarch Demetrius. Uh, Patriarch Bartholomew, who wasn't Patriarch at the time, was the official representative of the Patriarch at that conference. Um, And then over the years, uh, Patriarch Bartholomew has spoken, I would say, he seems to be open to the conversation. Now, nothing has happened, you know, at that, uh, that we can point to. But it seems to me as far as giving the space for the conversation, um, Patriarch of Constantinople has, I would say, been uh, at the forefront. And even the most recent conference of St. Phoebe's here, held here at our campus at Holy Cross in November, both Patriarch Bartholomew and Archbishop Elpidophoros um, of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese both gave you know, their warm well wishes for the con- conference. Yeah, and I know language is, is important when you're trying to figure out, well, what do they mean by, by that? So, right. So uh, when you say uh, they have uh, encouraged the conversation, they, I, I did hear or mm-hmm. uh, you know, read from the, uh, the conference uh, just a month ago uh, the positive statements that were made. Mm-hmm. Uh, should that be translated as a tacit endorsement of the plan, or is it just— Go ahead, talk about it. You know. Yeah. So, look, uh, I can't. I can't really of answer course. that because I just. I just don't know, and I would be. I would be speculating. Of course. Um, from my perspective, I find it to be the pastorally correct response, mm-hmm. um, because I don't think personally. I don't think the issue is black and white, and and in that sense, I think a conversation is important. I know there is a some frustration. I I saw it at the St. Phoebe's conference of people that said, we've talked long enough. Um, my sense is, I don't think we've talked long enough. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, but I can't really speak um, what that, I can't translate what their support of the conversation, that is the hierarch support of the conversation means. Fair enough. So yeah. what do you feel are the biggest selling points for the restoration of the female diaconate? 
Yeah. So um, first of all, I'm not I'm not trying to sell the female diaconate. Uh, I see myself as a member of the church, a lay member of the church, trying to be a faithful member of the commission um, and a faithful trying to be a faithful Christian. Um, I am a historian uh, and I'm a teacher. So but I don't I'm, I don't see myself as trying to sell. But in answer to your question, I would say some of the sort of positive elements of the conversation for the restoration of the female diaconate, um, I would say that, again, back to my earlier comments about the revitalization or the implementation of the diaconate, male diaconate in the GOA, I have just seen the energy and the commitment and the desire to serve a very humble men who are professionals, who are family members, who really don't want anything other than to help and to serve. And I can't tell you what that's done for me and my faith of the laity of the Orthodox Church, at least in the GOA. Uh, uh, it just shows to me that there are people out there that really, really want to serve and want to serve intentionally. Uh, and I've seen that in the diaconate program. So I think I think what the female diaconate could do um, is tap into that um, for the other 50 percent of of the membership of the church. What that looks like, I don't know. Um, and maybe we can chat about that a little bit later. Um, I also would say that I heard this at the St. Phoebe's conference and I've been giving it a lot of thought. I do think that there's something to be said about the female to female pastoral ministry that a female diaconate would bring. I, uh, I just, I wonder, especially now in the context in which we live, um, whether there's something valuable about that. Not to say that men can't minister to women and women can't minister to men, uh, but I think there's something there. I mean, you know, at my parish, local parish, there's a all women's um, group that gets together for spiritual direction and guidance, and they've been doing this for decades in my parish, and nobody's mad at them or anything. I know lots of parishes have morning male-only Bible studies. So I think there's something about female-to-female, male-to-male kind of pastoral ministry, and uh, the female diaconate could possibly participate or contribute to that. Um, and the other thing, that I would say one more thing is, I often tell my students that the faith doesn't change. The message of Jesus Christ, who Jesus Christ is, the message of salvation, the good news, the Evangelion doesn't change. The context in which the Evangelion finds itself in changes. It's changed dramatically from the time of the apostles over the 2000, last 2,000 years. And that's where I think the argument, the, the conversation about female deacons is important because we do live in a different, a very, very different world than of the, the apostolic or the pre-Constantinian period where the diaconate was really strong, the male diaconate was strong, female diaconate, not really clear what they were doing, or even the medieval Byzantine period where there's clear evidence that they were ordained at the altar, women were ordained to the diaconate at the altar. Now, what they did, probably not liturgical stuff, but they were ordained, one of the three ordained ministries. Uh, at, we are in a different world than those two worlds. And I think the conversation needs to take place in, in the context in which we find ourselves. That's an interesting point, Dr. Skedros, because I think you may be touching on the heart of the differences uh, between opponents and proponents. Mm -hmm. Because what you're calling uh, cultural understanding and how the culture has changed and being able to adapt uh, in positive ways, others call uh, innovation. Uh, right, that, right. Uh, well, yes, we did have deaconesses. Uh, you can't deny there were deaconesses mm -hmm. throughout the history of the church, but the function of those deaconesses did not involve litanies and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, processions in the great entrance and little entrance, or did not involve bringing the Eucharist out to the faithful. And as I read the proposed guidelines on the St. Phoebe Center, which I know they put a lot of work into, mm -hmm. and I'll also say parenthetically, they are proposed, they're, you know, they're not demanding, they're just saying this right. is what it could look like. 
it does involve, uh, you know, the vested deaconesses uh, acting in, in pretty much the same way as the male deacon. So the opponents say that's an ovation. That's, there's, there's no precedence for that mm-hmm. in, in yeah. church history. How would you respond to that? Yeah. So, look, um, they're right on one hand. Uh, absolutely. It's clear, at least from how I read the evidence, um, that the ordained female um, diaconate was— uh, the ministry of the ordained female diaconate was different than the male, and especially when it comes to liturgical roles. I think that's pretty clear, at least in the middle Byzantine period. So my response, though, is what I tell my students as well, just to get them to think a little bit. Um, And that is, I fear that sometimes innovation uh, is the wrong word because innovation is a negative term, especially for any Orthodox, right? We don't innovate. That's why we're Orthodox. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the antidote to in- innovation is tradition. Uh, and at least from one argument and tradition is, well, you know, what we've been doing in the past and making sure that it is, you know, okay with what the church teaches. And since the past doesn't show um, a liturgical function for the deaconess, female diaconate, and therefore to do such a thing would be an innovation. I take a different uh, view on tradition, and I don't like the word innovation because it, to me it's a non-starter. Um, uh, the Eucharistic spoon is an innovation. Um, the establishment of, of, of church organization in diocese is an innovation. You know, I mean, I I can point as a historian, I can point to numerous changes in the life of the church. The church, the Orthodox Church didn't come down from heaven in 34 AD um, and say, here's the church. And I know that I'm saying something very stupid, and I know you understand that, and the audience Mm -hmm. understands that. But I'm trying to drive the point home. And I like to take the the, the position that Vladimir Lossky uh, takes in a remarkable essay when he talks about tradition. Um, And in that article, uh, an old essay, he says that tradition is the Holy Spirit. And that if we believe the Holy Spirit is guiding the church, uh, and if we believe that Christ told us in the Gospel of John that I will send you the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, and the Comforter will be with you. I am leaving, but the Comforter will be with you. And we as an Orthodox Church have have demonstrated that, I think, over the centuries, um, that we respect that gift that God has given us. We don't play around with it. We understand how it's used. It's used in councils. It's used in a consensus kind of way. Um, And so if the church was to decide tomorrow that women deacons should be doing liturgical practices, the church decides, not Jim Skedros, not St. Phoebe's, uh, but the church decides. To me, that's not an innovation. To me, that's the spirit of God working. And uh, I don't know if that will ever, ever, ever happen. And maybe it shouldn't happen. And maybe it should. But I don't like, I, to me, the word innovation is a non-starter, um, because I can point to all kinds of innovations in the history of the church, and then where do I draw the line? Where do I say that was a mistake, but this wasn't a mistake? Yeah, and I guess that's the same question you'd have to ask for the future, right? Where where, where do you draw the line? If male, I couldn't agree more. Male, male deacons, why not male priests? Yeah, sure. Look, and I, I could, uh, you're absolutely right, and to me, that's a non-starter um, as well. Uh, and I think that uh, any kind of a conversation like that, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, so it is kind of a slippery slope, but the other one is a slippery slope as well. So what becomes ossified and who determines what becomes ossified? And is ossification really? Um, yeah, I, Orthodox tradition, absolutely. But sometimes it can become ossified in a way in which it doesn't make a whole lot of sense anymore. Um, so. Uh, and not just sense. I'm not talking intellectual sense. I'm talking spiritual sense, pastoral sense. Um, and, you know, look, to me, um, the message of the church is the message of Christ's salvation to the world, and that never changes. And the ecumenical councils have de- decided theologically what is appropriate. Lots of other things change over time. We just see how canons change over time as well. Um, now, this is a—look, I'm not saying that we should change this tomorrow, uh, not at all. But I'm open to the power of the Spirit, leading not Jim Skedros, not St. Phoebe's, um, but leading the church in, in a conciliar context, that is the bishops. Yes, and I think that's a very good point, because obviously the bishops are the end of the line for where th- something happens differently. 
And as I see, uh, well, let me just reference a very interesting yeah. comment you made at the 10th anniversary conference. You were a panelist, mm -hmm. and you were talking in your remarks about how things tend to get done in the church that are the result of issues bubbling up from the grassroots, mm -hmm. as opposed sure. to top down from the bishops. Uh, and you know the Orthodox landscape as well as anyone. Is it your sense that there is a bubbling up happening related to the female diaconate? And if there is, will that, do you think, that would ever see the light of day with uh, our Orthodox bishops? Yeah, so it's a great question. And let me, I'll answer it. I will answer it more directly, but let me give you a historical example um, of what I mean by that. So take the um, issue of the Arian controversy at the beginning of the fourth century, um, which resulted in the Council of, of Nicaea in 325 and in the Creed. So Arius, we don't know a lot about him other than he was a priest in Alexandria, probably assigned um, to a church that was located along the docks of Alexandria. So he's probably in a church that is made up of day workers and blue collar workers. But he had a charism about himself and a charismatic element. And he starts talking about who Jesus Christ is. And this, he gets people excited and he says, look, uh, Christ is, he is created, but he may be before time. And all of a sudden his local bishop hears about it. And so this energy that he had created, problematic energy, mm -hmm. he had created rises up to finally the church in 325 saying, we need to define who Christ is. We need to define who Christ is. And what I see happening here is we have some energy bubbling up. Um, I see this with the male diaconate, energy bubbling up, a desire to serve. And the church, not Jim Scavros again, the church, the Holy Eparchial Synod of the Greek Orthodox Diocese said, we need deacons. And and so that's where the church, and that's why what the Orthodox Church has, it has, as you said, that sort of that last line. But I, would, I wouldn't call it a, that of the bishops. I wouldn't call it a last line. It's a creative line in that this Holy Spirit is present in the gathering of, of an Episcopal assembly. And at least we believe that. And that is not, it's not like we're here to draw a fence or a wall around the church. We're here to make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ is spread to as many people as possible. And, and so in that sense, this conversation bubbles up. And now those that need to make the decisions for the church that we've entrusted in our structure as a church are the bishops, and they are the ones that should and ought to uh, do this and take this on. That doesn't preclude, I think, people like St. Phoebe's and others from saying, ah, you know what, we think this is not a bad idea. They could be completely wrong. They could be completely right. It's not my decision. I'm glad it's not mine either. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Come to think about it. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, at that same conference, His Eminence Metropolitan yeah. Nathaniel of Chicago said this when referencing the proposed game plan for restoring deaconesses. I will also say this. I think there's something about delusion and radical. I think part of this text is delusional, and part of the, the vision is radical. And I like radical. I, but I, I don't think delusional helps. Delusion does not help. I don't think this can happen now. I think that's delusional. I don't think that we're going we're gonna to pilot a program and in three years we're going to know a lot about the, the diaconate program for women or the, the deaconesses. That's delusional. I think, though, it's important to embrace radical. It, that's what the church is. Christ is radical. Now, I don't believe his eminence was speaking pejoratively, but in his mind, perhaps he was speaking realistically, given the timing of the proposal. What is your assessment of the timing? He's probably right. And because I still don't see as much as there's a conversation taking place among laity, among some theologians in North America, um, among some clergy as well. I don't see the conversation taking place at the level of the episcopacy in any, again, what I see. I don't know what goes on behind closed doors. Uh, we're never, you know, we never see these, uh, the details of what bishops speak about in their assemblies, et cetera. So I, I, but I just don't see it right now. I do see a lot of really, really good scholarship, really, really good conversation um, that St. Catherine's vision, that St. Phoebe's and others um, have put out about 
thinking about female ministry through the ordained diaconate. I think all that is good. I don't think his eminence was being angry or mean or anything in his statement. I think he's being realistic. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit then about uh, what I've heard, some say, (laughs) that the St. Phoebe Center has an agenda based more on equality than uh, the need, the actual need for female deacons. And I'm actually going to ask this question of uh, of our friends at the St. Phoebe Center as well, because mm-hmm. I, I, I think we need to kind of, uh, you know, understand what's really being said and what is feared uh, by both mm-hmm. uh, uh, the opponents and maybe the radical opponents. So what have been your observations about that sense of, well, this is just about equal rights, uh, you know, more of a feminist agenda. Have, have you observed that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not that close with the St. Phoebe Center. I know a couple of the, the key um, players there. I've worked with them in other contexts, Orthodox Theological Society of America, IOTA, and, and other contexts. Um, and uh, But I haven't been part of the St. Phoebe Center um, so I don't really have a sense. I can see how that kind of view from the outside looking in, how someone may, could raise that. The issue of you know equity or equality is such a loaded topic right now. I will respond in the following way. I, res- I said this in my comments at the St. Phoebe Center, and, and I think this to me is it, it skirts the issue of power and the issue of equality, because sometimes the issue of equality is about power. And I understand that. I understand that. Uh, in the church, though, um, power is a, is, a, is a touchy subject. So I look at the Barberini Codex. It's a codex of the 8th century um, from southern Italy, written in Greek. And there were a lot of Greek-speaking Christians, Byzantine practicing Christians in Italy at that yeah, time. Yeah, I read that. In southern yes. Italy. Right. And in that codex, there is the ordination rite for male and female deacons. And it's our earliest evidence that the ordination for both is essentially the same. It's done at the altar. The prayers read for both are essentially the same. But in both the prayer, the first prayer um, for the ordination for the male deacon and the female deacon, the priest or the bishop says in the prayer to God, look down upon your servant, um, and then gives the female name, and then to call her or in the mail to call him, but to call her to the work of your diaconate. And my point here is that this isn't the call of the ordinand who is kneeling or standing at the altar and saying, ordain me, ordain me, it's time, come on, come on, it's time. No, this is God's call to call her. That is the prayer is to God. God has called her or him to the work of not your, not your, that is uh, not the ministry of the deacon of to be ordained. Him, right. It's God's ministry. And that's, and the problem is, I think in the history of the church is when those in power think it's their ministry and not God's ministry, we get into problems. And for me, the issue is not about male or female. It's about what is the ministry that the church needs what is the ministry that God is calling people to serve? God is calling. It's God's ministry. I purposely, when I send emails, congratulatory emails to deacons that have gotten ordained or to, to graduates of our school that have gotten ordained to the priesthood, I say, you know, I pray that, that the Lord will guide you in the ministry of the church, not your ministry. It's not your ministry. I, 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 and I think that to me is um, a really important point here. Because so much of the conversations, I think, in the 80s and 90s over female priests focused more on power and authority and didn't focus on theological issues and on pastoral issues. I think the tide has changed now. But so I'm I'm a skirting. I don't really have an answer for you about the question of equality, but I I like to think in those terms. Um, And I would also say that we have to think hard about Paul's references a couple of times in his letters about neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. And how do we interpret that? And there's a, there are various interpretations. One is all those distinctions just disappear. I don't think that's what Paul meant. 
The other one is that those distinctions stay, but they don't have the same power that they do in the culture that they do in Christ. That Christ doesn't necessarily see those distinctions, but it doesn't say you no longer are male if you're in Christ. You're still you're still still a male. And Paul probably certainly said that doesn't mean you're no longer a slave. You know, he probably certainly said, no, you're still a slave. Mm. But in Christ, it's a bit different. So something needs to be more work, I think, or thought um, needs to be given to that as well. Well, and it would not be fair to broad brush uh, any organization uh, asking a question about equality as opposed to need. I mean, you really have to Mm -hmm. uh, dive into individuals who, you know, who knows uh, what various people are thinking or what what they are really trying to accomplish. So, And uh, we have already touched about the uh, female priesthood, which you said is a non-starter. Uh, but do you sense any indication of that being the ultimate desire uh, from those who are proposing this and are in favor of this? Um, I think those that the, the readings that I've done, the conversations that I've had, uh, it seems that most folks that I've spoken with that are you know advocating for female diaconate recognize not even to bring up the topic, what they think in their hearts, what they think behind their minds that they're not sharing. Um, I don't have a sense, but I, I think mm-hmm. that's. But yeah, I, it's hard for me to say. Uh, it's possible, but I, I don't. I don't see it. I don't see it in the writings. Um, uh, I see this as I want to see it, and I do think there's. I think there's uh, evidence to support that. Um, for the most part, it's a legitimate call for service, for service in the church. And you could ask that. Well, that might is that you know. There's other ways to serve. What about? And then you could say, well, it's about equity and equality. And sure, I think that there's a piece of that as well, most likely. Well, then from your observation, Dr. Skedros, is ordination and the title of female deacon necessary in order to accomplish what they have articulated as the need? I mean, I the need, as you read what has been written, you can nod and say, yeah, yeah, that would be, mm-hmm. that would actually be good. But some are saying then, what does ordination have to do with that? What what could they do as a female deacon that they can't already do? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so one thing they cannot do right now is they can't take the Eucharist to a shut-in. And I think that that's, there's something very uh, powerful about, I've not done this, but I've seen it, um, and I hear it from students uh, or graduates and even the deacons about in being in a hospital and being able to administer the Eucharist to someone who is sick or who can't get to uh, to a liturgy. So that would be one very practical thing that women could not do if they aren't ordained. Um, there's something also uh, a recognition of a ministry as well. I And I think that this is part of it. Uh, it's hard to because you're right. On the one hand, we're all called to serve. We're all called to live out the gospel message and to make sure that we put the, the you know, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount into practice. And Matthew 25, the last judgment, it doesn't, regardless of our, our rank or ordination status or status in the church. Uh, the question then becomes, so what is the best thing for the church to get that done? And again, I do think it goes back to what is the need of the church and not the need of an individual to say, no, we need to be ordained because it's the right thing to do. I would also say that, and this is where the cultural thing comes in. I know it's a, t- it's a challenge, but I do also, I do think about um, what I did sense at the St. Phoebe conference that surprised me. I was not expecting this that uh, several of the people that got up and asked questions, there's a real sense of they've been marginalized by the church. And I don't know their stories, um, but there was a sense in their question and and, and the, what they were saying. And I just wonder to what extent an all-male clergy contributes to that, especially in the 21st century. And I know that's a really tough subject because now you know, does culture drive the church? No, um, but the church lives in culture. Christ, you know, we're not um, miaphysites in the sense that, or monophysites, I should say, in the sense that, you know, Jesus is just divine and he's not human. No, we're going to celebrate the incarnation in a few days. And basically God became human in the mess of humanity, in the mess of culture, in the mess of history. 
and we can't get deny that. And so we can't be super, uh, what do I want to say, uh, super monophysite and not think about those things. So I do think culture is an important piece. And when I say culture, I mean the context in which the gospel is being lived out. And the context of the 21st century is just so different. I have three daughters. I This is not about them. Um, and uh, I don't have any sons. Uh, and, you know, God willing, they're faithful Orthodox Christians, as far as I can tell. But I, I know their experience in their professional life is very different than their experience in the church, which doesn't mean the church should change. I'm not saying that. I just wonder um, to what extent we need to be engaging culture in more than perhaps we have been. And I think my own honest opinion is that all this will work itself out over time. I don't know what the result will be, but it'll get worked out over time, God willing. And so, uh, thank you. And at the risk of sounding doomsday-ish, which yep. is really not my intention, but I'm right. just trying to think ahead. And, and things happen slowly in the Orthodox Church. I've learned that if I've learned nothing else. <laughs> right. Uh, um, so let's say there is a momentum built in one corner of the church, a large corner, but the momentum builds, and now maybe the archbishop or maybe a local bishop with the blessing of the archbishop presents a female for ordination to the diaconate. And uh, the other churches uh, in the assembly of bishops are firmly against it. Maybe not all of them, but, but you know, maybe most of them. Is that... Uh, I, so I worry. I worry about schism. I worry about so do I. Um, unity. And I just, you start to wonder, okay, is the pain worth the gain? <laughs> and so I just wonder, yeah. uh, help me think that through. I'm a layman. I'm, I, I'm just observing, you know, yeah. from the sidelines here. But how, how do you process that? Yeah, look, uh, you're absolutely right. So here's my, my thought is that fear is not a bad emotion or a bad reason to be cautious. But crippling fear is a bad thing. And uh, I think in terms of sort of the fight and flight, you know, syndrome, you know, fear of, of being attacked uh, by, a, uh, by a bear is a good thing. Uh, but fear of never going on a hike again because you may come across a bear is probably not a good thing. And so I worry about fear being the reason for not doing something. I think fear breeds caution, which is good, and slowness, which is we all know, like you said, if anything, we all know the church is slow. But I don't think it should be the deciding factor. People have had to make bold decisions throughout the history uh, of the church, um, and it's had ramifications. What I don't want to see ever <laughs> Is, is schisms that can't be healed. That's the real problem. So I worry about, you know, this is uh, not related, but it is in some sense. I worry about the current disagreement over Ukraine between Russia and the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Yeah, that's a good example. Uh, yeah, I, I worry about that that turns into something, uh, something that could be a long-term schism and maybe a schism that can't get healed. Because we see that we see that happen in the history of the church. I pray it's not, and so therefore I think episcopal caution is the right approach. But episcopal fear—if you had feared uh, that you were going to fail, I'm sure you did fear that you were going to fail about ancient faith radio, but you didn't stop, right? You did it, and uh, and yeah, there might have been some fears, but you did it, and uh, and look what you created. So. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I totally understand where you're coming from. I totally get it. Um, but there's got to be there's got to be discernment, and discernment's way above my pay grade. And so yeah. that's why I leave it to somebody else well, to decide and it's, that. It's easy yeah. for you and I to talk about it. But right, we're, not, we're right. not sitting on the throne and having to make those yeah, decisions. Exactly. But you know, exactly. from what I have observed, the differences here are not fear based. They're conviction based. And so uh, then you've got a problem. If you've got yes. one jurisdiction saying, we're going to push this through, and the other saying, this will not stand, right. then that's what scares me. <laughs> yeah, so look, I, you, you're right about that. Uh, and and that's where I would say that it's going to just take some, it may never happen. And, and it may be that, and that's maybe where the church really needs to come together and say, okay, this is a big enough issue. I don't think it's a big enough issue right now worldwide. 
Um, but maybe at some point it becomes and said the church needs to come together and counsel and and make a determination. And, you know, the church has been wrong in counsel in the past, but we recognize that those mistakes were mistakes and eventually they get it right. Um, there are plenty of churches, that, councils that gathered over the history of the church um, that were overturned by later councils. But you're right. You're right, because uh, what, what I think that we don't appreciate is and what you just articulated is that there is conviction on both sides. Yep, I agree. Yeah, but never should we forget the role of the Holy Spirit and the protection right. of the church and how the right. church has always. I mean, the thing that drew me to orthodoxy more than anything else was the consistency down through the centuries of the Holy Spirit protected doctrine of the church. Mm -hmm. This did right. not change. It changed in other areas, and it certainly changed in my background. But right. uh, I saw that consistency, and to me, that is the Holy Spirit. And there's no other agreed. way to explain that. Yeah, agreed. Well, Dr. Jim Skedros has been our guest, and uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Anything else you would like to share? I don't want to let, let you uh, go with that. Uh, no, I just want to say thank you for doing this because um, uh, I think it's a really important conversation. And I think uh, you're being very balanced in your kinds of questions. And I appreciate that. So thank you. Well, we're all learners. and I especially Amen. need to learn. And so I'm anxious to uh, to hear and listen and be respectful. So, And you've done that today, too. So thank you, Jim. My pleasure. Next, we're talking with Father Lucas Christensen, a Ph.D. candidate in theology at Notre Dame, exploring sacred arts, homiletic, image, architecture, and ritual. He's also teaching a class on foundations of theology at Notre Dame. And Father Lucas, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, John. It's a pleasure to speak with you. So as we explore the history of the female diaconate in the church, no one seems to deny that there were deaconesses, but there is disagreement about the orders. So let's start there. Were they ordained to major orders like deacons, priests, and bishops, or were they minor orders like readers and subdeacons? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, and part of the reason why that question is so necessary to bring up is that the function and the nature of a deaconess seems to have varied uh, regionally uh, and according to time. We see in different places deaconesses are performing different functions and they seem to be honored in different ways, given different responsibilities. Not wildly different, but this isn't surprising uh, in the earlier centuries of Christian literature, uh, liturgy. rather, There is remarkable variation. Uh, certainly there are through lines and continuities, but there are also regional practices and we see a sort of an ebb and flow where there is, it begins with diversity, and then centers of authority tend to want to normalize practice. Oftentimes this has the goal and, and the hoped uh, sort of process of winnowing out practices that are either bad or just not as helpful. Uh, and we see that there's an attempt to centralize, and in some respects it may be successful, in others it may not. But those goals it kind of flowed the other way. Uh, eventually, they may uh, centralize, but then regional practices will either persist or they will pick up in different modalities again. And we see that then examples of those centralizations are things like uh, early church orders. Early church orders include things like um, the teaching of the Twelve, the apostolic constitutions, the apostolic tradition. And these are documents in which we see early descriptions of the role of deaconess. And the deaconesses tend to be classed with uh, the other early orders we don't really have according at least to those names. There was a former order of widows. There was a formal order of virgins, which may be something like our uh, current monastics, although I don't want to press that too far because that might be a little anachronistic. But... Um, the deaconesses are not given 
responsibilities or a place in the physical structure of the church, because some of these are actually describing where do you sit during liturgy or where do you stand during liturgy, they're not placing them with the other major clergy. They're not giving them the same responsibilities. And in fact, um, in some canons, uh, there are very specific descriptions of who gets to do what, and uh, canons that include a description that bishops, for example, may or bless and ordain priests. Uh, priests may not bless bishops, they may not ordain, but they may bless one another and they may bless others. Deacons don't bless priests, uh, but they offer petitions. And uh, then it goes on specifically to say that the deaconess does not do the thing of the deacons. What we do see are descriptions of their ministries to women, to keeping order within the church during worship, usually in, in the area reserved for women, the Ginecaon. Uh, we also see reference to their assistance in baptism. Uh, we do know that there are canons that state that when a deaconess cannot be present, another woman can be appointed to assist with the baptism. We also see that they're meant to visit women at home. It's, of course, a case of inc incredible impropriety uh, for male clergy to visit a woman at home alone. Uh, it still is, and it, it, of course it was in the first centuries. And so we do see that they have a significant role. We don't see that that role, in it, uh, the ways that it's exercised, are equivalent to the, the diaconate as exercised by men. We do not see that they have a public liturgical role in liturgy uh, in the same way that the male diaconate has. We do see, though, that they have a role in liturgy. Their role in liturgy, of course, I suspect they will be praying with the rest of the people of God, but they'll also be ensuring that people uh, maintain a proper order and decorum. So that seems to be their primary role. There is also a reference to their guarding the door of the area of the women. That seems to me to be parallel to something that uh, in other places uh, doorkeepers or even subdeacons are described as doing uh, more generally. So we see a variety of roles, and I've conflated them for the sake of brevity. Uh, they're located in different places, but we don't tend to see that they're treated as a major order. Now, the document that is referenced quite frequently that we might spend some time looking at is an early prayer book of, of the church. Yes, and, and I want to get to that. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, the argument is given for these being major orders was, well, the deaconess was ordained at the altar, and mm -hmm. they then were given the chalice, uh, they communed, and then they put the chalice back on the altar table. Uh, so mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. part of that more private liturgical function, they didn't bring it out to the to the public. But is the fact that they were indeed ordained at the altar, if, if they were, is that a good argument for major orders or not? Those are great questions. And really, this, this gets to a document that it, I may just take a moment to talk about. Yes, please. This is, yeah, this is enshrined in something called uh, colloquially, the Barberini Codex. It's it's named for the library it came out of before it went to the Apostolic Library in the Vatican, and um, it's in the Barberini collection. Its shelf mark is GR336. Uh, if that's important to people, you can actually find it online. You can look at very high quality digital scans of it. I, I recommend it. The Barberini Codex is interesting. Uh, because it is, so first of all, what is a codex? Uh, a codex is an early book, um, the earliest form of bookbinding that we know of. And in fact, it may be that codices are, began earlier than we originally thought. We see them being used throughout early Christianity. Uh, it's easy to flip back and forth between pages. It's also easy to flip back and forth uh, within the scriptures. And so Liturgical scrolls are used uh, usually for antiquarian purposes, but usually codices are being used. And so the codex is an echologion or prayer book, and it contains prayers and rubrics. Now, they're very minimal rubrics, and that's important. Um, and, and to this day, if you were to ask to look in your priest service book, usually called a hieraticon, you'll find there are rubrics, but uh, they're stenographic. 
they're more meant to prompt uh, the memory, things like that, or they're meant to be studied outside of the liturgy because who has time? Mm. Uh, if I'm supposed to be going out the north door of the Iconostasion and standing on the Solea, um, I needed to already have been moving by the time I got to the end of that <laughs> sentence in the rubric. So yeah, get it. Get uh, it. It, it, makes, it makes sense. They're stenographic. They're meant to be, oh, okay, that, that's what I do. And oftentimes it will say, do this in the, in the usual way. Um, <laughs> okay, well, wh- whatever that means, right? Because you were... <laughs> No one was an autodidact when it came to liturgy. Nobody was saying, you know, I'm really, I'm interested in serving services. I'm going to go, I'm going to buy a book. First of all, you didn't really do that very often in the ancient world. Uh, But you didn't buy a book and then teach yourself uh, to liturgics or the celebration of the ritual. Uh, You had people that that taught you that. And the book was more or less uh, a reminder, maybe something that you looked at to refresh the memory or to indicate things that you had already been taught but perhaps in different services. Um, all that's important because the, the ritual around the ordination of the deaconess is uh, likewise, I mean, there are some rubrics. They're very, uh, again, I would call them somewhat stenographic. They're not in, incredibly detailed. Not as detailed as we would all like them to be, but again, that's not the genre. So the, the Barberina Codex, the prayer book, it here's the problem we don't know how much of it re- reflected constantinopolitan practice at the time that it was written it was written toward the end of the 8th century currently the consensus is you know probably in the last decades of the 8th century there's a great study by Vilkovska and Baranti on it uh, but it, it's in russian so uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> definitely worth working through even if you have to you have recourse to Google Translate, but um, it contains some great information on it for people who are interested, as well as the text, both a Russian translation and, and the original Greek, if that's something people can work with. But as uh, they kind of collate and, and present their own conclusions in that uh, material, uh, the consensus is really it was, it was copied in Italy, in Calabria probably, which is in southern Italy, this is a Greek-speaking, Greek practice uh, region of Italy at that time. They followed in it the southern Italian Byzantine rite. But it's not insignificant that we don't know uh, to what degree it necessarily reflected Constantinopolitan practice. It could have been identical. It could have been quite different. Uh, but it isn't a prayer book that's coming from Constantinople. We're certain of that. Uh, it's at, toward the end of the 8th century, which means that we are looking at a period before the victory of Orthodoxy is formalized. We do have a commemoration of St. Yermanos in it, and that's believed to date it after he's been rehabilitated, so as it were, by mm-hmm. the church. So all of that's going on. That's the, that's the sort of the context of the prayer book. That's about when it is, we think. And that's where it is. So let's just go ahead and assume that it reflects at least the Constantinopolitan tradition. I think that's that's probably fair enough to say. Okay. The first thing to to know when we're looking at these documents, and again, these are not things that should should tell us well disregard it entirely or accept it uh, wholeheartedly. It is the ambiguity of the transmission of prayer books. They tend to be conservative documents that uh, retain older practices on the one hand. If any of our listeners go to a church where there is a divine liturgy book of some kind, and if you were to turn to the back of the divine liturgy book, there may be prayers for various blessings. Yes. It may even be that there are prayers for blessings for things that they've never heard of being blessed in church before. Even if they're lifelong in the church, uh, there may be all sorts of blessings back there. And even in newer editions, those may be retained. Now, this is still a uh, reflection of one of these principles of liturgical history, the study of liturgical history, that prayer books tend to be conservative in their transmission. They tend not to want to exclude things that were included previously. And why do I say this? Well, I say this because the inclusion of this prayer doesn't necessarily tell us one way or another at what point this prayer was not being offered. This specific ritual ceased to be offered. Uh, there, There's other evidence for that that people will point to outside of the prayer book, 
But in terms of this specific ritual, we don't really know. On the other side of things, oftentimes liturgical legislation will come down from those centralized places. Remember what I said earlier about uh, the contraction of liturgical practice to uh, centers of authority yes. where they're trying to normalize practice. Well, we <laughs> we know that's not always successful. Mm -hmm. uh, we know even in our time, there are times that a uh, liturgical directive could come down from above, and it may be that in certain localities, uh, either asked for by permission or forgiveness, they don't actually incorporate those liturgical directives. I'm not going to comment on whether that's a good idea or not. I'm just going to say it happens. And it's not a stretch to say that this happened in the ancient world. Why do I say that? Well, because not only can we not say, when did this practice end? And we can't give it that end date because of its inclusion in the Evcologion. We also don't know to what degree this ritual was followed in the first place. It may have been followed exactly as it was written in the manuscript. And it may be that it was followed even at the time of the, of the writing. But we don't know. Uh, not from the Barberini Codex itself. We do know it's recorded there. Uh, and that's about all we can say about it. Okay. And so I'm just giving this sort of setting of the scene of uh, let's not uh, mistake the inclusion of a particular ritual in a particular prayer book, uh, uh, F. Cologian like this, necessarily meant that it was ever followed, that it was followed exactly as written, that was followed even when it continued to be written, um, there may have been more, there may have been less. We know even in current parish practice, oftentimes you'll go to a different parish and you'll see that they include more or less. There may be petitions, for example, the petitions of the faithful after the gospel lessons. Some churches will do them, some won't. And some of them will have them in prayer books and they don't do them. All of these are contemporary examples of what I'm talking about. It, just because it's in the book doesn't mean they always did it. But it isn't also to say that they didn't do it. I'm just trying to give the sort of ambiguity of a text. Now, it's included in the prayer book right after the ordination to, of the deacon and right before the ordination of the subdeacon. Now, this is important that I say that word, uh, ordination, because when the question of how the, uh, the ordination of the deaconess, and I'm using the word deaconess, I, I know this is kind of a little bit of a freighted term. Uh, some people do not want to say deaconess. Some people want to say female deacon. Because we're talking about Barberini, the, the label in the book actually has prayer for the ordination of a deaconess, okay. the econesis. So I'm going to go ahead and use that term here, since we're, since that's the term Barberini uses in the label. Um, sometimes the label hierotonia, which is oftentimes it, they, people want to contrast it with hierothesia. Uh, don't worry about the particularity of the Greek, you can hear that there's a difference. And they want to say that the latter term is used for minor orders and the former term is used uh, for major orders. Well, immediately we're struck with a little bit of a problem. And uh, the problem is that when we look at these prayers in Barberini, uh, the next prayer, the prayer for the ordination of a subdeacon, it uses exactly the same word, hierotonia. It's the word that's also used for the, the deaconess, and it's the word that's used for the deacon. There, uh, there's no distinction. Uh, and so we can't make too much out of the fact that they call it a hierotonia, an ordination. We can't say, oh, well, therefore it means that they saw this as a major order. Uh, because they said the same thing about the subdeacon. And we know that so the they used it interchangeably. Is... Yes, yeah, for, for all of these, uh, at least for these three orders. Uh, and so I'm, I'm focusing in on these three. Not only are they next to one another, but I think they're the most helpful uh, comparatives because the question of, okay, is the deaconess a major or minor order? Well, we have to compare and contrast with what we know to have been a major order, the deacon, and what we know to have been a minor order, the subdeacon. And so there are some interesting similarities of the ordination rite of the deaconess with the deacon and uh, some distinctions. So for example, um, yes, the ordination of the deaconess happens during the divine liturgy at the same time that the ordination of the deacon would take place. That is not true for the subdeacon. 
So in that case, what we have is more of a similarity with the, the diaconal ordination, absolutely. Uh, she's also vested with the orarion, which is that long stole that is, in the case of the deacon, placed over the shoulder of the deacon, typically lifted at petitions in our current practice. Uh, she's vested with a stole, and the prayer includes the invocation of the divine grace, uh, which sort of begins that invocation of the divine grace, which fills all that is lacking. Those are three things that you could say resonate more with the diaconal ordination. Some will point out that that word for uh, liturgia, which is that uh, public ministry that uh, it could be a ritual ministry, is mentioned throughout the prayer. It's also mentioned through the prayers for the diaconate and the uh, the subdiaconate. But here's here here are some of the distinctions, and I don't think they're insignificant. Um, first of all, we don't know where that ordination took place. Oftentimes it is claimed that this ordination took place in the altar. There may be other documents that people are pointing to that I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, I can't claim to be an absolute uh, expert. By, I'm not even really much of <laughs> an expert on on the historical deaconess other than some of these other documents we're talking about that I've I've looked over. But I don't see in Barberini a specific mention of where the ordination of the deaconess took place. The confusion may come from the early rubric, which tells us when we, when we look at that, and it's it's very similar to the rubric uh, for the ordination of the deacon. After the holy anaphora, and after the opening of the doors, before the deacon says all of the, all of the saints, or uh, we would we would have it having commemorated all the saints, right? The one to be ordained is uh, presented to the bishop. And, and intoned the divine grace, which is a shorthand for the whole prayer. And um, then she bows her head, and he places his hand upon her head and makes the sign of the cross three times, and then prays, and then it includes the prayer. Okay, well, where is the mention that she enters the altar? We know that the doors are open. It could be the holy doors of the altar area, if they were closed during the anaphora, although we don't know that, I, I'm not aware uh, that it has to be interpreted as the doors of the altar area. It could be the doors of the church closed at the time of the anaphora. But even if it is the doors of the altar area, we're not told, this is sort of an indication of the timing of the prayer, we're not told that she enters into the doors of the altar area. Um, we're also not told the deacon does. Okay, so I'm trying to be very careful in the way that I say this. Uh, it doesn't mean she didn't, but it also doesn't necessarily say she does. What it does say about the deacon that it doesn't say about the deaconess at this point is that he kneels. And we know in at least the received practice, when he kneels, he kneels at the altar, whereas she simply bows the head. And so this is one of those differences that if this is an ordination equivalent to that of the diaconate, you would expect that the ritual practice would also be uh, exercised the same. And we don't see that. Uh, the other thing that I th think is interesting in these three comparisons, um, I mean, we could get into the, the prayers, we could get into what is being prayed for and uh, all of that. But the fact of the matter is, even though that word uh, liturgy, that that serving in the in the Lord's house and those references, even though that's used, that's a fairly broad term. That's more of a term for functioning. And I know that now we have the word liturgy, and we've specialized it to simply being uh, what you do in the ritual action of the liturgy mm -hmm. in very particular ways. But it's a much more broad word. Uh, throughout the history of the Greek language, <laughs> to the point where, I mean, not to get anachronistic, but just to give an idea of its current lexical uh, breadth. Um, when I was in Thessaloniki at the, at the theological school there, the, uh, the elevator, it said it doesn't liturgy, it doesn't work, it doesn't <laughs> function. Uh, so um, that isn't to say that there wasn't any kind of a ritual context for what it was saying. It's just, we can't push it too far. And here's really where I'm going with that. The words that are present in the prayers for the deacon and the subdeacon 
that are very clearly about sacramental ritual action that are absent in the prayer over the deaconess is the mention of their serving the holy mysteries. And we know that that word misteria, uh, this, is, this is unambiguously about the sacramental ministry of the, of the liturgy. And so the absence of that word there seems to suggest to me, uh, simply from a close reading, uh, that they're not praying for her to function uh, in the ritual of the liturgy in a way that is equivalent to what the deacon is doing and perhaps uh, not even what the subdeacon is doing at this point in this region. Well, I was going to ask um, you to clarify yeah. that because you had said yeah. the prayer uh, mentions the, you know, a, a sacramental ministry for the deacon and the subdeacon. I don't think we see subdeacons actually uh, handling the Eucharist or bringing the, the Eucharist out to people. I've, I've never seen that anyway. So in what no. way, even though it's sacramentally it seems to be the same, it's yet different though, right? Yeah, I, I think what is going on perhaps with, uh, with the subdeacon is because they are assisting, you know, it, it's sometimes difficult to know to what degree they were doing what where, uh, but oftentimes subdeacons may be assisting as altar servers. This is probably what it's referring to. Uh, you know, we've, we have now, it's a, it gets really confusing, right? We have gads of altar servers. We have children serving as altar servers, and we take that as normal. It's actually really abnormal hmm. in the history of the church, you know. And this kind of touches on some similar issues when, uh, you know, the question of uh, why boys and not girls in the altar, this sort of thing. Um, historically, you wouldn't have had boys in the altar either. You would have had what were the equivalent then of, of adult men who were actually ordained or tonsured to specific offices. In other words, you would only have clergy major and minor in the altar, uh, with exceptions. You might have the imperial family come in uh, at various times to commune, although Ambrose, St. Ambrose, didn't think a whole lot of that. Mm. Um, <laughs> and all that is to say, in terms of doing those liturgical services, you tended to have people uh, ordained to those tasks, and they did that for life. So it wasn't something where... Uh, children would be cycled in, uh, in of course, in, in our practice, male children would be cycled in and then kind of cycled out as they graduated from high school. Rather, what you would have is a lifelong commitment, uh, at least to a lower, lower order, and um, it would only be they who are blessed to do so. And um, that changes uh, as time goes on and uh, the situation of the Eastern Roman Empire changes, Necessity dictates that uh, they take a different approach, at least for a time. But those subdeacons, I'm, I am surmising, were actually serving a, in the altar, even if they weren't handling the mysteries, uh, they were helping out. And I'm guessing then, uh, I mean, again, I'm, I'm looking at the historical liturgics and I'm looking at a close reading of this prayer, and it seems to me, by implication, uh, the deaconess was not. Now, she is given the chalice to commune from, Absolutely. And that is similar uh, to what the deacon uh, is given to do. Uh, but there is a distinction, and I'm looking at the rubrics for the ordination of the deacon. When he is given the chalice, uh, he then communes the people. And it says he, he in turn, I'm reading a translation that's mm -hmm. on women mm -hmm. deacons, uh, womendeacons.org. Uh, they have a translation of these prayers because it's a little easier than translating on the fly. Um, <laughs> uh, so he's handed the chalice and then he, it says he in turn makes all those who approach him take part in the sacred blood. Uh, there's the distinction that the deaconess, after receiving uh, the sacred blood, then accepts it and puts the chalice back on the holy altar, the table of the altar. Yes. So she's not communing the people in the context of the divine liturgy. Uh, this is a distinction. Now, when we talk about the historical role of the deaconess, or the female deacon, depending on the context and, and who's talking about it, I'm not aware of anyone talking about it who disagrees uh, that historically this is what's going on. I do know that there are claims that she was ordained in the altar area. I don't see it in Barberini. It may have happened. It's just that Barberini is not explicit, and which is why I made the comments earlier about rubrics being somewhat stenographic. Yeah. Uh, because they knew what they were doing. 
But her bowing of the head, her not kneeling, uh, could imply she came before the holy doors. They were opened and the bishop came out and uh, ordained her in the area in front of the holy doors. She may have gone in. As far as the communing, she could have been handed the chalice inside, outside the altar. She could come into the altar as we do and place the, the, the chalice on the table. Uh, she doesn't seem to have taken it back to the side chamber, whether, you know, if this is a church that had like the a connected uh, area for the utensils, which we call a prothesis, or whether it was a scavophilakion, a separate building. She does not do that as the other deacons would have done. She simply places it back on the altar. So all this is to say there are continuities and discontinuities with what the deacon is doing, but there is no indication in the prayers. I, I think there's no hard indication that she's serving liturgically in the context of public ritual worship. Certainly she's given a great deal of honor, but uh, she's not being prayed over to function liturgically in the same way that the deacon is, and perhaps even the subdeacon. I think what I hear you say is, uh, let's be careful, cautious, about building our entire case for major orders versus minor orders on documents like the Barberini uh, Codex, because history is messy. And we right. you know, sometimes think that, well, this must have been the liturgical practice uh, back then that was ratified and used extensively, or maybe it wasn't. And we don't know. And I think that's what I hear you, you saying is maybe, <laughs> maybe, but uh, let's not be too dogmatic about that. Yeah, that's a very good summary. And I mean, this is, of course, the difficulty of historical liturgical scholarship is when you're looking for a clear answer, boy, the, the further you delve, uh, the more frustrated <laughs> one you, you're going to be <laughs> yeah. by that because of the way that we function, the way that documents function, the way that interpretation of documents and the exercise of liturgy, the plurality of ritual practices, even within a single uh, ritual family, all of these things become very messy. And so it isn't to say none of it's true. It's to say that it, it could be, but what we then have to do is we have to look at the canonical literature. We have to look at other accounts. What are they doing? The canonical literature, as I, I said earlier, uh, makes it very clear that, um, I mean, in some places, uh, I mean, don't want to make too much of this because this is just one document, um, but in an early church order, uh, the deaconesses are placed under the widows, uh, in terms of a third authority. Uh, in other places, they're placed over the widows and virgins in terms of authority. Uh, they are t oftentimes equated with monastics. Uh, not to say all female monastics are deaconesses, but in some of the canonical literature, all the deaconesses are f female monastics and helping out in, uh, it seems, monasteries. Um, in other places, they may be that. They may also be the wife of a presbyter who is elected to bishop. Mm -hmm. uh, because he, at, by the time bishops are no longer allowed to remain married, she may enter a monastery, and if she's found worthy, according to the canon, uh, she may be given that, uh, at least the title, and, and if there's a role to go with it, the role. Um, so that's just a, a quick sweep of canonical literature having to do with it, and none of them, none of them implies... Uh, what we would call like a public liturgical role historically. But again, I, I'm not aware of anybody challenging that historical uh, context. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we certainly have debate over the major minor orders, and that's certainly worthy of a discussion, but it's not yeah. really relevant to the issue at hand if what we're trying to figure out is, well, what was the liturgical history of deaconesses right. and what is being compared to what is being proposed today? So right. if it's more private uh, in terms of a liturgical function with bringing the Eucharist into homes when it was mm -hmm. uh, there's an imp a matter of impropriety for a male priest to do that uh, or, you know, with ministering to women in other ways. So mm -hmm. function mm -hmm. that was less public liturgically compared with uh, what has been clearly stated by those who are proposing this, including the St. Phoebe Center, is that what is being proposed is a public function identical 
two male deacons today. And we've had some interesting discussions about that because some uh, who are proponents say, why is that such a big deal? You know, our times have changed. Uh, Our society has changed. Women aren't relegated to more of a subjugated role. Uh, They're not forced to be in one section of the temple anymore. Uh, You know, other things that today's different. Others are saying, listen, if you're taking the private liturgical history of deaconesses and then saying today we need to make that public and they need to be identical as male deacons, now we're talking innovation, not restoration. And so that kind of seems to be at the heart of the debate, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Well, I I think you're, you're right that those two questions, well, I think they should be kept distinct. Oftentimes, in the discussion of the role of women and the role of a deaconess or a female deacon today, however we want to phrase that, uh, when that comes up, oftentimes the historical is brought up and then uh, some of the ideas that you've mentioned uh, about an equivalent ministry for female deacons, uh, the two issues oftentimes are, are conflated or confused, and I think that the two need to be kept distinct. We have to recognize that if we're going to talk about the historical role, we can talk about the historical role. Absolutely. And there may even be three conversations. (laughs) Uh, There's a question of, okay, what was the historical role? The second question might be, ought we to restore the historical role of the deaconess? And then perhaps a third conversation is, can we do something new? Can we institute a new ministry so here's, here's part of the problem. I didn't even get into this because I didn't want to get so confused with the historical. I, the word diakonia, uh, which really means ministry, and uh, diakonos, one who ministers, when I said that there was a breadth of practices, I didn't even tell you the half of it. I mean, when we look at our friends in the Oriental churches, they'll use the word diakonos very, very broadly to mm. refer to all sorts of ministries, including people who simply chant, uh, just cantors. Uh, a service. So, yeah, yeah, they're performing a service. And we, we see a, a great depth. Of course, uh, I've seen references to an Armenian uh, deaconess who is performing uh, functions liturgically. I'm not qualified to speak on that at all. I don't, I don't really know much about it. It would be something for them to talk with uh, the Armenian church about uh, or an Armenian historian. What I'm getting at is even outside of Constantinopolitan practice, we see a breadth of the meaning of that word. And so... The highest it gets to, though, is, of course, the role of the, the male deacon in antiquity. So when the apostolic kind of functions begin to be cultivated, you do have deaconesses. You have uh, Phoebe, of course, and then we have others historically. But what they cultivate is something very different from a role of female deacon that is equivalent to the role of male deacon. And so... That's a conversation that has to take place completely separately from the, well, maybe informed by, but it has to be kept distinct from the historical conversation. Because to equate someone functioning as a male deacon functions now, uh, a woman functioning as a male deacon functions now, to equate that with the historical role from a scientific perspective, that's just anachronistic. It's it's not what we see. Uh, it's not anywhere where we see what was happening in antiquity before we see that role uh, begin to fade out. Very helpful. Thank you. So I want to talk about something different but very similar because you kind of touched on this earlier in our conversation Mm -hmm. today, and that is liturgia. In our conversation we had separately a couple of weeks ago, we didn't record that one, you had some things to say about liturgical ministers in the church, which I found fascinating. And it relates more to the laity than it does the clergy. Could you unpack that for us? Yeah, I would be happy to. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the word liturgia, as I said before, is a, is a public service. It's a, it's a function, right? It wasn't really a, a necessarily cultic word in Greek antiquity, although it could be. Generally, though, it had to do with someone doing a beneficence for the sake of the community. So... Contrary to what has become a sort of a popular folk etymology, uh, it actually more means a work for the people. 
Um, so a liturgia could be performed by any number of uh, individuals. It oftentimes was a wealthy benefactor who was doing something for the community. Sometimes it was it was more or less mandated. Oftentimes it was not. Uh, there was this idea in antiquity that you increased your social standing by doing things for the community, which is sort of sort of the inverse of how we operate today, except for philanthropists. But examples of liturgias would be things like uh, maintaining the road on your property a public road that went in front of or through your property, building a library, financing a public festival. And that's where I say it could be sort of cultic because that festival would likely involve sacrifices and things. Mm. Building an armada uh, of ships to defend your city if you're a maritime city. These are all liturgias. Now, when we talk about the divine liturgy, that Greek word thea, liturgia, that actually shows us who is actually the actor in the liturgy. What's the work of God? Because it's the divine work for the people of God. It is time so, for the Lord to act. Precisely, precisely. It is the Lord's action. But how does God act, right? God acts through his body. And the body of Christ is, of course, the church. And so we have this beautiful imagery, not only, of course, in, in Paul, uh, but throughout the church is history is this sort of the relationship of the different modalities of ministry in the church are explicated in different ways. Certainly St. Paul talks about it and he, he compares it to the different members of a body. And he's very clear that the eye, the foot and the eye can't be opposed to one another, right? They have to work in, in together and none can say I'm more important than you. Therefore, I don't need you. And then later in writers like uh, the Dionysian Corpus, uh, we have these descriptions of these different orders and, and on and on. Okay, so it's, it's, it's throughout the tradition, but what we have is this picture then of God performing his beneficence to his people and to the whole world, because our prayers include the whole world, through his people. So it is God the actor and we are the ones through whom he acts. And these actions have these different modalities, these particular ways of doing that one action. And that's important. It's important because when we consider the space of the church, which is one of the things that I focus on in my research, is uh, ritual space and its adornment, we see that actually the church is designed in such a way, yeah, it's based on a basilica historically, but it's designed in such a way, especially as the centuries progress, to facilitate the unique liturgical ministries that everyone who is baptized is ordained, yes, ordained mm. to perform. And here's what I mean by this. Uh, Metropolitan John Zizoulis of Pergamon, of blessed memory, uh, is, is not the first to say this, but he says it very well in his book, Being as Communion, very well-known book, where he talks about the fact that all of the laity receive ordination at baptism. Where all of us, have, we all of us have hands laid upon us. We all of us are set aside to offer prayers and to offer up ourselves uh, to God and to serve God and to be God's action in this world. We, we, we like to talk about things like uh, the energies of God, right? The anarchia. And oftentimes we, I think, mistake that for in like an energy force field. Hmm. And then we're like Jedi we're like, you know, <laughs> using the force and that's the energy of God. It isn't that it doesn't involve things that we would call miraculous. It certainly does. Uh, but those are only miraculous because they're unusual. The energies of God could also be translated as the works of God. In other words, God is working through those who are baptized uh, when we are working according to his will. So this is why, you know, when people say, well, why, what, what is God doing about this? What is God doing about that? The real question is, what are Christians doing about hmm. this? What are Christians, are, are Christians feeding the hungry? Are Christians seeking justice for the wrong and the oppressed? Are Christians working... Uh, in, in order to protect those who are the most uh, vulnerable. If they are, then God is working that through them. And that's, you know, this is very, that's very broadly construed. 
in terms of the divine liturgy, God is working. So those are different modalities, of course, in the world that we see, and not everybody's doing everything. Uh, but in the context of the liturgy, then, bringing it back to this, God is working in different modalities through the members of his body. He's working his energies, his works, through the one presiding, normatively, if not typically, the bishop, who is leading the people of God in prayer, the presbyters who are, who are assisting him, uh, the deacons who are also assisting him and also interfacing with and leading the people, the cantors or the, or the, the, the choir, really I, the word choir is, is, is fine. There is no difference between singing and chanting uh, historically in the church. And there's no distinction between a collection of cantors and a choir. A collection of cantors is a choir. Anyway, whether it's Byzantine chant or choral chant, doesn't matter. So your choir uh, is chanting and perhaps leading the people at times in chanting. But what's the proper liturgical ministry of the laity, the laos to theo, the people of God? What is their proper liturgical ministry? Do they have one? I mean, then maybe that's the first question. Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is absolutely yes. What is it? It's to offer a prayer. Mm -hmm. To offer a prayer for the church for one another, for the whole world, over and over and over again. I mean, people get, sometimes in the, in the modern period, people have gotten down on uh, the repetitive nature of our litanies, but I think that they, they fail to notice that if you reduce the litanies, you reduce the role of the laity, because the laity's proper liturgical ministry is to offer a priestly prayer for the whole world and for the church. And what's interesting is this, we see even in the context of the liturgy itself who prays over the gifts. I mean, the, the, the easy answer, if I were to ask in, in Sunday school or if I were to ask a collection of people at coffee hour, what do you think they would say? Who prays over the holy gifts? Yeah, the priest or the deacon. or Yeah, yeah. Was, oh, okay. Well, yes, but not only. Mm -hmm. One of the first petitions, the first like content Petition of, of substance after the gifts have been deposited on the altar. That, of course, there's let's complete our prayer to the Lord, which is, the joke is often, well, that's the most repeated liturgical lie because we're not, <laughs> nowhere near to completing the service. Uh, <laughs> but True enough. Really, it's it could be it could be translated, let us fulfill our prayer. Okay, mm. so how are we fulfilling it? Well, the next petition tells us in this context, it's not true for like vespers, but the way we're doing it is. For the gifts which have been offered, let us pray to the Lord. In other words, the people have now been told by the liturgy, by the text of liturgy, by the deacon, you are now to pray over the holy gifts. And then, that's not all, uh, the first petition petitions that take place after the consecration, having commemorated all the saints, again, again, let's peace, let us pray to the Lord, because they've just come done a whole bunch of commemorations of those who have passed on and for the precious gifts which have been offered and sanctified let us pray to the lord now the people are being commanded to pray over the sanctified gifts well this is very much in yeah. symphony with what's happening at the altar and so what this tells us is that the people are actually given an incredible dignity and part of the problem that we have and I'm going to get into material culture here, which is my thing, but it really points to some of our issue that we have with latent or supposed clericalism. Uh, part of the problem we have is that we think or have been trained to think of the nave of the church as though it were the seating in a theater. The auditorium. People who, yeah. yeah, the auditorium. That's, that's, that's a much more concise way of saying that. And it doesn't help that some of our churches are being built this way. <laughs> True. Uh, some of our churches are being built in a fan kind of a structure. Some of them I've seen even with raked seating. Certainly with seating uh, is ubiquitous in certain contexts. And the sitting posture necessarily inculcates a more of a passivity. And even the structure of making sure all sight lines are directly on the altar and only on the altar indicates an idea that the crucial means of participating in liturgy is to see and to hear what the celebrant is doing. Yeah, we're the audience. Yeah. Yes. The fact of the matter is, historically, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. Now, if that was the goal, 
there could have been all sorts of ways of, of, of facilitating that. We have amphitheaters in antiquity, for example. Uh, they were very conducive to conveying sound quite accurately. You could still go to some uh, ancient amphitheaters and hear how incredibly good they were uh, at acoustics, even without a roof, uh, which th the roof could even facilitate that more. They could have done that. Amphitheaters are also really great at focusing all sight lines on one space. They didn't do that. What they tended to do, there are exceptions, but what they tended to do is they built basilicas, and frankly, they're not really great in terms of sight lines. You have columns, uh, you have all of these things going on, and, you know, Hagia Sophia becomes a little bit more open, but as soon as you get a little far back, all of a sudden you can't really see that well anymore. In certain places, they even have uh, chancel bar they have not chancel barriers, so they do have those, but they have barriers between columns so that if you're in the side aisles you couldn't see. The fact of the matter is for the Byzantines, the ability to see directly everything that's going on the altar doesn't seem to be uh, that important, hmm. not as important. Well, why would that be? Is it just because that, well, we're all going to kind of do our own thing? No, I don't think so. I think there was more of a sense that the lay person in the nave is a liturgical actor. The person who is there to offer a prayer is liturgically participating by praying, in a, you know, to to not <laughs> to not bring in a completely out of out of the realm kind of a kind of a example, uh, since we've been kind of living in late antiquity. I'll go all the way to Tolstoy, and in Tolstoy's War and Peace, the ingenue has been really hard done by. She's been deceived by a cad and led into making some very poor decisions. And even though the novel's been out for a good long while, I'm not going to give it away. But she goes, in the, the beginning of the next act, she goes to the Divine Liturgy. And it describes how the Archdeacon is offering the, the petitions of the Great Litany, as, as you would expect. But what Tolstoy does for us, which I think is really quite lovely, is he places us in the interior prayer of this character. And what she's doing is offering a specific, concrete prayer, worded, not just mimicking what the deacon's saying, but actually a concrete prayer that is doing, fulfilling what the deacon is calling her to do and everyone else. She's praying for people by name, even her enemies, even though even the one who's wronged her. Uh, she, when they're called to pray for the, the governmental authorities, as we do, she prays for the Holy Fam, uh, the, the royal family, rather. She's making these concrete prayers. And when I first read that, it reminded me of a book by Father Stanley Herakus, uh, a very slim little volume about participating in liturgy. But he talks about doing the same thing. When we're called to make a petition, we should be offering a specific, real, concrete petition inwardly. But I can tell you, whether you're in a parish with congregational singing or not, it's so easy to check out. Yeah. I mean, if, it, like I say, I could be congregational. I've been in a parish with congregational singing, and I've been cheerfully singing, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, and I'm thinking about coffee hour. Yeah. Um, now, that's my problem, but... That is to say that the, the singing is not the magical fix. What it is, is it requires discipline. And it, it really is quite difficult to do, but it's, it's absolutely what we're called to do. Uh, when we come to liturgy and when the deacon is saying, you know, for the unity of the holy churches of God, are we offering a prayer for that? When he's praying for uh, the president of the United States, whether you love him or hate him, when he's praying for all of our, our governmental authorities, are we offering specific concrete prayers that God would guide our leaders into righteousness and righteous and just action in order to do that which is right for our people and for the rest of the world? Are we praying for that? Or are we just kind of listening and then just phonating, Lord have mercy? I really want to unpack that because uh, this is you're getting on what really fascinated me the most about our conversation, and that sure. is our responses. Because we do play an active role with our voice in every liturgy. We're either saying, Lord, have mercy, or with thy spirit, or, you know, to thee, O Lord. So we are listening and responding. And what I hear you saying is, don't just respond, Lord, have mercy. Offer a prayer with that, right? 
Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Absolutely. So how do we how do we do that? I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a really good question. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I'd keep it simple at first. Okay. So I think one of the things that, actually, practically speaking, that helps us is uh, we have this tradition we've inherited of fairly elaborate. It depends on where you are, uh, but uh, fairly elaborate um, petitions and responses. Now, you might be in a place where the one who's offering the petitions is maybe not as uh, chorally involved, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it's a much more simple uh, petition and the choir may not be quite as florid in their their repertoire. But I think either by intention or by happy accident, um, what we end up seeing as sort of the best case scenario is usually a fairly beautiful and elongated petition followed by a fairly beautiful and elongated response of either Lord have mercy or grant this, O Lord, or to you, O Lord. And what that does is it gives us time. So when the when the deacon is, is beginning, or the priest, if you don't have one, deacon, uh, when the deacon is beginning to say something like, you know, for the peace from the above and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. But he's going to take longer to do it than I just did because he's chanting it. Mm-hmm. And then the choir is going to take that time to offer the Lord of mercy. What if interiorly I said, Lord God, send down your peace upon us. Bring peace to your world, not as the world gives, but as you give. Something like that, you know, uh, just very simple. It could be simpler than that. Lord God, grant us your peace, you know. Yeah. But the more we begin to do that, the more we begin to attend to our actual, our, our proper liturgical role. And here's the funny thing about it, right? Um, you know, we, we make a lot, uh, and sometimes it's pre- expressed polemically, I don't think that's very helpful, but we make a lot of, out of the fact that a priest cannot offer a liturgy alone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, part of the reason I think that's true is who's going to pray the petitions? Mm. Who's going to actually offer those prayers, typically? If I say that the liturgical role of the the one presiding is to lead the people in the offering of the liturgy, of the sacrifice, and it is a sacrifice, if I say the deacons and certainly the presbyters are there to assist him, so are the altar servers, if I say that the choir is there to lead in the chanting and all of that, if the people of God aren't offering these petitions interiorly, concretely, really, and truly, guess what? Nobody is. Because the priest is praying a different prayer, or the, the celebrant, I'll say that the presider is praying a different prayer during that time, usually. The deacon's concentrating on leading the petitions. The choir's concentrating on chanting correctly. True, as you get more and more experienced, you can sort of be able to do both. It's not the easiest thing in the world. But really, if the people of God, if you are in the nave, if you are at the, li- the liturgy or another service with, with petitions... If you are not offering those prayers and those around you are not offering those prayers, guess what? Nobody's praying for it. Mm. And that should be sobering. Wait, I actually have a role. And it's an essential role. Now, here's the deal. We sometimes think of the nave as an auditorium for other reasons. Not only its form, not only our sort of passivity in listening to the choir and maybe phonating along with them, um, but also because, you know, I want to be very careful. I don't want to be misunderstood here. We think that the only restricted space in a church is the altar area, but that's not technically true. The nave is also a restricted space. And the reason I say I want to be careful is a negative consequence of what I would call an economy of hospitality, which is to say we allow, generally speaking, uh, nowadays, um, outside of certain monasteries, we allow not baptized people into the nave. There may be some parishes that don't do that, or they only allow them in the galleries. I'm not going to get into that; those particularities. Generally, we give church tours. We do all these sorts of things. And what that seems to imply, because of that sort of what I'm calling an economy of hospitality, it seems to imply that the nave is no special place. Uh, it's certainly not a place of, of restriction. But let's just take a moment, at least to put ourselves in the headspace of history, The fact that you were not allowed originally to even enter the nave of the church if you were not a baptized Christian. In other words, 
this is actually a restricted special place, and really it's fulfilling the holy place of the temple, just as the chancel area, the altar area, for, fulfills the holy of holies. Who stands in the, in the holy place in the temple? The priesthood. Who goes into the holy of holies? The high priest. Does the high priest access to the Holy of Holies mean that the, ho- the priest's access to the holy place is somehow not holy? Absolutely not. It's a particularity of function. And the priests in the holy place are offering up prayers to God. And the people of God, who in their baptism are vested in white robes, just as the priesthood were vested in white linen robes, they come into the holy place and they offer prayer. They are offering up an actual, active, conscious, priestly ministry according to their proper mode of liturgical ministry. Even really now, we should understand, hey, when someone is coming in, we're doing so by means of of sort of this hospitality, but really the people who are properly here are those who have been consecrated into that priesthood of God. Now, I say things like this, and... We might be tempted to think, well, you know, the Protestants have this idea of the royal priesthood. Hey, guess what? There's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Because th- what's wrong with it is not. The answer to the, the, to the problem of clericalism is to elevate the laity. The problem with some of the historic answers to clericalism were that they didn't elevate the laity so much as diminish the clergy. And what I am suggesting is Historically, the the laity have an incredibly powerful role. Sure, are there are there times, incidents, and practices that we can point to that seem to diminish them? Of course, uh, I'm not I'm not denying that, but I'm I'm saying that really the ideal that we have is all are are all are God working through His body in order to bring forth this work. For the sake of his people and the whole world. Yeah, yeah. So then to bring it full circle back to our original topic of the liturgical function of deaconesses then versus now, how would you tie those two together? I mean, what message should we take out of uh, that very wonderful explanation of lay ministers as liturgical ministries and ordained? Uh, how would you uh, tie that together with our topic then? Uh, yeah. I think part of what I'm hearing, and I, you know, I would never presume to speak for others, but a lot of what I'm hearing in the call for some sort of a, an idea of a restoration, oftentimes it comes out of the needs uh, that are happening in our communities. And I think, you know, it's not my place to say those needs are legitimate. They just are legitimate. And part of that need comes from the fact that we do need to elevate the laity. We do need to understand that the people of God are given charisms. They're given the gifts of the Holy Spirit in order to minister to one another and to minister to the community around us. And the diminution of that and the sort of placing on only the clergy, the the major clergy will say, of the role of ministering to one another has caused several problems One is that people are being underserved because, you know, let's face it, one man can't do all of these things for everyone. Uh, Secondly, it's caused a lot of burnout. Uh, It's caused a lot of burnout among clergy. Um, Even if they persist in the ministry, it is very difficult to do, especially in large communities. There are other reasons for burnout too. Um, Bishop Thomas of the Antiochians has a really great article on that. But I think this is, is certainly one of the things that could be very difficult what we could have is a context in which people are, in fact, recognized as having particular gifts, and yes, set apart to, to exercise those gifts to benefit the people of God. So let's just say for the sake of argument that there was a general agreement, hey, we've looked at the history of the office of deaconess, and we see that historically celibate women who have lived a good chunk of their life. 40 is really generally the youngest that uh, I see in the canonical literature. There were exceptions. Uh, St. Olympias was or, ordained, I believe, at 29. But exceptions are always made. But uh, let's just say like uh, that uh, celibate women who are, who are older, who have the wisdom of experience, uh, let's say that there was a desire to go back to that historic role where they would be actively ministering uh, working with the church, 
under the direction of whoever the, the presider is, um, the, the pastor of the parish, the bishop, what if they were ministering to people? What if they were going and they were counseling women? What if they were helping them? This is exactly what I was talking about. This is an exercise in a particular modality of the work of God in faithful women who have been theologically trained and formed in order to be with them, to go into their homes, to counsel them perhaps, to uh, to to guide them. Um, obviously, like in any clerical order, we should only be ordaining people who have demonstrated wisdom, who have theological training. But just because it's a minor order, I, th I think we see that it's a minor order, just because it's a minor order doesn't mean it's not legitimate ministry. Just as if we were to have, again, a formal order of catechists. You know, I catechized people for years before I went to seminary. Um, we don't, as far as I'm aware, I'm not, I'm not sure that anybody has restored the order of catechists, but what if we did? Yeah. What if we had a program of forming catechists and they had to meet with the bishop, and the bishop was was ensuring that they, or the bishop's representative, bishops are very busy, um, to ensure that in fact, uh, yes, this this these catechists are solid. What if there were prayers read over them? What if it was understood this is a particular way of God working in His community? In other words, what I'm saying is you don't have to have a specific prayer read over you to be able to do these things, but also. Uh, I don't. I don't see that it should ever threaten us to look at the historical practice of the church and say, "Hey, uh, the 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 people of God have in these various modalities served and have been appointed to serve." Um, this is a this is a way of making that concrete and blessing it. But in 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 addition to that, I think all of the people of God, anyone who's hearing this, who is a Christian person. You know, even if you never go and you know onto the solea or the the front of your church and have whoever's in authority read a prayer over you, you already did hmm. when you were baptized. You were brought into the waters and you were brought out. You were reborn in Christ. You were born from above. You were set apart. You were ordained to liturgical yes ministry and to the ministry to the people of God and to everyone around you. You're already ordained. Uh, so even if you don't have a special label, even if you don't have that going on, serve other people. Be that minister. And if you don't know how to do that or you don't feel well equipped, we've got all sorts of resources. And frankly, I know from having served in parish ministry before going back into the academy, from talking to other clergy, uh, we would love to have lay people who, even if they're not yet formed, would love to be trained and to take on things that would be uh, increase the ministry of the local parish that don't require the priest's constant oversight. These are beautiful things. And, he, and like I said, again, to, to make it about the, the point of this, uh, of this conversation, if we were to have a restoration of the historical role of the deaconess, uh, I see that as part and parcel of everything that I've been talking about just now. Yeah, often we make excuse over the lack of a clerical title. Oh, well, I'm not a deacon, I'm not a priest, I'm not a bishop, so it's certainly not my job to go do this work. And we are selling ourselves short as people who are ordained uh, in our very baptism to do this work and, and to yes. do it. Uh, you know, I've heard that, well, we need deaconesses because they will be representing the church. Uh, out in in the public and and I get that but I don't have an excuse not to do that because I don't right. have that official representation right. or clerical title so I'm, I still right. got to do it and I would like to encourage if if the church I mean really this decision comes to the to the bishops exactly um, we're we're talking about it but this is the province of uh, of bishops yep so if if the Holy Spirit working through the bishops of the church doesn't decide to restore what I'm calling the historic order of the deaconess, uh, so that those practices we've discussed earlier, according to the church's history, tradition, and canons, um, even if the, the church doesn't do that, I hope, I pray, that our faithful women, who are wise, theologically trained, sensitive, are given the opportunities to do, as you just said, John, uh, to the opportunities to minister 
Um, some of this comes down to, um, <laughs> uh, boy, this is going to get, this is not going to sound very spiritual. <laughs> it comes down to, it comes down to parish budgets. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and I get it. Our parishes are not all flush with cash. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we can have people, men and women, but we're talking about women. We can have women in full-time roles in our parishes, working hard, uh, using their training uh, in our communities. And oftentimes what we do is we'll hire them as, as a youth director or something, right? But we can certainly hire pastoral assistants who can do some beautiful things. Uh, there are ways of doing this in, in ways that I think are completely faithful to our, our tradition and absolutely meet the legitimate needs that have been identified by women theologians and uh, women non-theologians. Uh, faithful women who say that, uh, you know, and we need to hear them. I, 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 there's something missing. I need to be ministered to in a particular way. And not everybody has recourse to a women's monastery just an hour and a half away as you and I have. Uh, you know, you and I could uh, bop right up to Holy Door Mission Monastery yep. in Michigan, a yep. beautiful mi- monastery uh, with with a beautiful community. And um, what a blessing uh, for women to be able to go there and to speak with someone like Mother Gabriella or yes, the other indeed. mothers there. Um, and certainly, frankly, I benefit greatly from talking to Mother Gabriella. Um, but not everybody has that. So what if our parishes could hire, uh, you know, a pastoral assistant who's a woman who is faithful, who's trained, who's wise, uh, who, who's demonstrated that capability you know, she's already appointed to that service by the fact that she's been baptized. If the church should decide to restore that historic order of deaconess, that's, you know, that's another dimension to that. But really, I think it's beautiful that she could be doing so much of what is needed even now if uh, if our parishes were to take those steps uh, to fund it. Yeah, let's let's not not do it while we're waiting for this other question to be resolved. Yeah. Because in the meantime, yeah. people are in need. So. Yeah, and you know, ultimately, the question of church, uh, you know, all of this comes down to the <laughs> to the problem of uh, the current understandings of authority and power is being mm-hmm. conflated. Um, and you know, we clergy at, at times have, have caused the problem too. I'm not going to identify particular people, but. Authority and power not identified uh, in Christianity. In fact, in Christianity, Christ says it, of course, and we're coming back to that idea of deacon, when he says the Son of God didn't come to be served but to serve, that verb is the same word that we get deacon from. Not the akonithine, not to be served, ala the akonise, in order to serve. In other words, to deacon. And what that means then is we need to distance ourselves from the idea that the clergy have power. And we need to understand the clergy's authority is the responsibility of care. And even if you're given a role as a subdeacon or a deaconess or a taper bearer or a cantor, you don't have power. In fact, you've just taken on more responsibility of care for the people of God. Just as when you're baptized, you're not given power over other people. As soon as you're baptized, You're given a great deal of responsibility of care over the whole world. And so I think it would be a beautiful thing if we recovered this sense that uh, Christian authority is a responsibility of care. It isn't about power. I think there are legitimate concerns that have been brought up in certain fora because of that mistaken understanding of Christian authority is power. Um, because oftentimes we've practiced it that way, uh, unfortunately. And understandably, then people see, well, if access to power is only achieved through these means, then we're being kept from access mm-hmm. to power. And I'm saying, you know what? That may be historically what has happened through abuse. The answer to that is not to give more people access to power. The idea is to divest ourselves of that idea of power entirely, yeah. to recover a truly Christ's Christ's idea, the Christian idea of what to what being first means hmm. means being last, being last. servant of yeah. all. Yeah, and if we could recover that, then we could say, guess what? We can all serve. 
Yeah. We can all take on that responsibility of care for others. We can all serve one another. And gosh, doesn't that sound scriptural? Doesn't that sound like the history of our of our church's faith? That to serve one another, you know, we have the greatness in the kingdom of heaven is through that service of all. And so, like I said, I think I, you know, I completely understand why there's a confusion of authority and power. But I do think that's anti-Christian. I think that's against Christ. Yeah. I do think that Christ, I, I know that Christ, and I, I think the uh, what we could call the authentic tradition of Christianity is all of us are ordained, and we have a responsibility of care for one another in the whole world. And some are appointed and ordained to particular ministries where they have an intensified responsibility of care for particular communities, larger or smaller. Take up a towel. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's well, that's exactly a, right. a great place to uh, to wrap up. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time. I have learned so very much. And well, it just tells me that uh, we're going to have to have you come back at some point and, uh, and share more. So, Father, I would love to. Thank you, Father Lucas Christensen, Ph.D. candidate in theology at Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana, exploring sacred arts, homiletic image, architecture, and ritual. Also teaching a class on foundations of theology at Notre Dame. Father, thanks so much for taking the time with us. Thank you, John. Thank you. Mitred proto-priest Alexander Lebedev, rector emeritus of Holy Trinity Russian Orthodox Church in Los Angeles and dean of the Southern Deanery of the Western American Diocese, was blessed to speak with us by Metropolitan Nicholas of Eastern America and New York in the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia. Father Alexander, can you tell us if there has been any discussion in Rokor related to the restoration of the female diaconate? No, as far as I know, uh, that this is not a matter that has been discussed. In my opinion, the reason for that is I believe that to the Orthodox Church, and particularly uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, both in the homeland and abroad, this is a type of casus irrealis, something that is so unthinkable that it doesn't even get discussed. Is there a history of deaconesses in the Russian Orthodox Church? Yes, but the history of deaconesses in the entire Orthodox Church uh, is complicated by the fact that the word deaconess is quite often misunderstood. The basis of that is that many people, and right now who are calling for the restoration of deaconesses in the Orthodox Church, consider that that should be making female deacons who would be uh, ordained to the diaconate exactly the same as a male deacon is and would be able to perform all of the functions, the liturgical functions of a deacon. In my understanding, uh, the evidence is scant that even in the early church that the deaconesses who were certainly present uh, fulfilled any liturgical or sacramental function. The word deacon or deaconess comes from diakonia, which is used, I think, I looked it up uh, 32 times in the New Testament, and in every case, it means service, such as helping to provide food, uh, such as the service that Martha, the sister of Lazarus, uh, gave and provided food to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, in fact, uh, or the apostles uh, having appointed deacons to serve at the tables. And in other uh, ways, when St. Paul talks about 
diakonia, he's talking about his service to the church, meaning the call to help people. So I believe that deaconesses, uh, or maybe that title or name might be restored. Uh, I believe that would be very good, as long as it was uh, an understanding that they would be basically sisters of mercy uh, who would not be ordained to the liturgical rank of deacon, uh, but uh, would organize uh, to assist the diocese or the parish in outreach to the poor. And we know from the early times uh, they were uh, called to assist in preparing women catechumens for baptism and to assist the priest during the baptism of women. And they did other ministry uh, assistance in feeding uh, the hungry, um, taking care of the sick. So you would not be opposed to the term deaconess as a title, as long as it doesn't venture into a liturgical role. Would that be accurate? That's correct. And uh, there would not be uh, an equal sign uh, between the service of a male deacon and uh, and, uh, and a woman. This confusion with the word deaconess is something that's been uh, very much uh, in my mind. Uh, it's the subject has come up uh, several times uh, in the in the Russian Church, and in every case that I've read, and I just just finished reading a very lengthy article uh, by Professor Sergei Troitsky that was written the uh, title deaconesses in the Russian church. Uh, uh, it was written in 2011. And uh, he speaks that uh, from the earliest times, the Russian church encouraged women to participate in functions of assisting uh, with the poor and uh, distributing alms and taking care of the sick and frail and, and uh, teaching uh, children, especially girls and women, the basics of their faith. So they were a very, they fulfilled a very important function. Some have said that this was actually considered in the Russian Orthodox Church a century or so ago. Is that true? Uh, not from anything that I've seen or heard. And uh, although uh, Professor Troitsky in his article quotes extensively from uh, the discussions of uh, the pre-conciliar meetings uh, that took place in preparation for an all-Russian council. These uh, meetings took place between uh, 1905 and I believe 1907, and the question of uh, deaconesses uh, did come up, and uh, that question was brought up uh, before the Holy Synod, and uh, it was tabled. No resolution was made on that issue. Uh, and. Uh, when the uh, final council did open in 1917, uh, it coincided uh, with the beginning of the Soviet Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. And so, although the council met uh, over a period of two years, uh, that was a very, very turbulent time. Uh, they did not make uh, any decision regarding the reinstitution of the order of deaconesses. As a priest for over 55 years, what are your thoughts about the need for a restored female diaconate today? Well, I do not believe that there is any need uh, for uh, a restored female diaconate if it means a liturgical or sacramental function. It seems to me, from reading the historical uh, documents that I have seen, uh, that women were chosen and given a blessing by the bishop to be able to serve uh, the church. Although some of them were called deaconesses, they had very strict rules and regulations that don't apply to male deacons. For example, none of them could be married. All of them had to be over 40 years old, and uh, they could never if they had been married, they had to be widows and could never remarry. So in some ways, 
when talking about women's service to the church, those who were at some times called deaconesses uh, were people who had dedicated their whole life uh, to the service of people in the church, but they did not have a diaconal ordination. Uh, they, in convents, uh, we have always had uh, women who assisted the priest in the service uh, by preparing the vestments, by uh, giving the priest uh, the censer when necessary. Uh, none of them had the right to venerate or touch the holy table or any of the sacramental objects on the table. Well, we know that a deacon during a liturgical service at, at the Divine Liturgy uh, assists the priest. He uh, raises the discus and the chalice uh, during the words, thine own of thine own. Uh, so he uh, is, uh, uh, for example, in our c cathedral, the, the, the deacon uh, is the one who uh, cuts up the holy gifts in the chalice. And the deacon uh, traditionally brings out the chalice, which already has the uh, uh, body and blood uh, of Christ in it, uh, facing the people and, and says, with fear and faith, uh, draw near. And then he hands the chalice uh, over to the priest who actually gives the communion. So the deacons in the Russian tradition and practice uh, do not themselves uh, distribute uh, communion uh, to the people. I know that in some churches now, uh, in Antiochian church, uh, it is considered normal for deacons to be able to uh, visit the sick and give them communion, uh, but that is not a practice of the Russian church except in cases of extreme need. For example, after the Bolshevik Revolution, a part of the Russian church in Russia went into the catacombs, just like the early Christians. They had catacomb services, catacomb priests, and the priests, because they were catacomb priests, were not able to go to the homes of parishioners and administer the sacraments to them at the home. It is clear that they deputized some men, and in some cases women, to be able to do that. But that was a case in extremis. Uh, there was no other solution. So, And uh, these women were not ordained or consecrated, and the uh, uh, had, had no sacramental function in the church. Now, we are grateful for your time, Father. Is there anything else you would like to add? Yes, uh, I'd like to speak a little about the opportunities for women's service in the church and in the Russian Orthodox Church in particular. There was actually a time in the Russian church, uh, well into the 16th or 17th century, that women... Uh, were not allowed to sing in the church. And uh, in the 18th century, that changed. Uh, women everywhere are allowed to sing in choirs and in many of our parishes, including our parish, both our choir director and the uh, substitute choir director are females. And uh, there is no problem with that. Uh, they read the epistle readings and uh, they act as a reader uh, if there is no other reader present, and uh, that is not forbidden. The majority of members of our parish council are women in our cathedral, uh, and um, the administrator of our church parish school, which has about 100 children. It's a Saturday school from 9 to 5, so it's a very, very good school. The majority of teachers are women, and the administrator of the school is a woman. So I think that the opportunities of women to give service to the church uh, have opened up greatly. But the barrier is at the point of ordination. And in that, I believe we're following the example of Christ and his apostles. Because Christ, although we know he had women that were uh, helping and serving and taking care of the needs of the apostles, our Lord did not choose any females to be among the 12 disciples or among the 70 apostles. 
uh, even though uh, one of them, uh, the women that was uh, close to the apostles and helped Christ, Mary Magdalene, uh, was later declared by the church to be equal to the apostles. But none of them held apostolic rank, and there is absolutely no evidence in the scripture, in the book of Acts, or in any of the letters of St. Paul, or the other epistles, uh, that any deacons uh, were female. So I think uh, that uh, the church has uh, is very, very clear uh, on this distinction. Another thing that is, to me, of note is that one looks not only at the history of the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church, I mean, if we look at the ancient churches, sometimes called the non-Chalcedonian churches, uh, the Copts, the Ethiopian Church, the Armenian Church, the Church of Malanbar in India, uh, none of these churches has ever allowed the liturgical ordination of deacons. So I think the consensus of the church for the past 2,000 years is that uh, ordination to sacramental orders is restricted to men, uh, to the point where women, except for specially appointed nuns in convents, are not allowed to enter the sanctuary. And that is something that is not uh, permitted. So I just wanted to uh, add a little bit uh, to this. Uh, to me, I do not believe that uh, it is correct to speak of the restoration of the female diaconate at all, because what we're talking about is not restoration, but innovation. Because in the ancient church, the deaconesses, although they played a great role in service to the church, never were ordained, uh, just consecrated to service. And that was mitered proto-priest Alexander Lebedev, rector emeritus of the Holy Trinity Russian Orthodox Church in Los Angeles. He's also the dean of the Southern Deanery of the Western American Diocese. Next on our journey of exploration about the restoration of the female diaconate is Dr. Helen Theodoropoulos. Helen is currently adjunct professor at St. Sava Serbian Orthodox School of Theology in Libertyville, Illinois, teaching the study of the Church Fathers and Christianity in America. And Helen, thank you very much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Now, you've spoken frequently about the role of the deacon in the Orthodox Church, and I've heard you give uh, some wonderful talks about uh, the need to just relook at the office itself, apart from male and female. And I just wondered if you could say a word about what you feel needs to be addressed that would enhance the role of the deacon, whether, again, male or female, compared to what it has become today. Okay, thank you. Yes, the order of the diaconate was instituted from apostolic times as the ministry of service. And this is crucial to understanding its vital importance. Throughout the life of the church, and especially for today, deacons represent to the church its calling as servant in the world. In this deacon's model and exercise, the diaconia of Christ, who tells us that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. While all Christians are called to imitate and follow Christ in this service, the church set apart the deacons and also the deaconesses through ordination for this specific ministry of service. They exemplify the interdependence of worship and service in the church's life. So the work of the deacon varied according to what was needed. In the past, this ministry included care for the widows, orphans, and the poor, care for the sick, 
including bringing Holy Eucharist to the invalids, religious education, administrative duties, and liturgical duties. For men, these were in the public sphere, but for women, for the deaconesses, they occurred only within the private arena. It was through the work of the deacon that the practical physical needs of the people were met. Furthermore, the service was always connected to the presence and work of the bishop. They were the go-between, the agent of the bishop to the people and from the people to the bishop. The work of the deacons was to move between laity and clergy, life in the world and worship, and to enable, enhance, dispense, share, connect, and serve. Today, though, we see this pretty much only in the liturgy. The work of the deacon has been reduced to service enclosed within the doors of the church, whereas it once and four centuries moved dynamically and with healing power into the lives of the faithful and the world beyond. This is missing today and is so desperately needed in this suffering, broken world, a world where the presence of Christ is being systematically eliminated, or at least the recognition of the presence. We know his presence is always among us. There is this wisdom in the coupling of pastoral and liturgical activities in diaconal ministry. To see the deacon out in the world, standing with, accompanying, serving the faithful as they meet the challenges of illness, financial hardship, grief, trauma, spiritual doubt, other difficulties. The deacon stands with the faithful and then circles back to the liturgy, offering their names for prayer, petitioning for the suffering, serving, distributing Holy Communion to those he has been serving. This connection to the sacramental life of the church is critical and is made possible because the deacon or deaconess is ordained. The deacon, then, is the personal face of the church present to the one in need. This person feels not only that a friend or a fellow Christian has come, but that the church, my church, has come to me here in my need. So I'd imagine there's an economic reason why we don't see more of that. I mean, you're right. We basically see the deacon on Sunday mornings uh, doing the litanies, uh, bringing the communion to the faithful, involved in the processions. But then on Monday... Uh, he takes off his vestments and goes to work because he has to. And I just wonder, without making that deacon feel guilty, what can we say to a deacon who would like to do that but just can't afford to do that full time? That's a good question, John. In our world today, we have many uh, demands on our time, but I know that deacons have a love to serve, and in the past— they have been empowered and given the task, the vocation to go into the world. We don't offer that as a path for their service today. Through centuries of diminishment of this role, uh, it's been taken on by other areas of society. I know that a faithful servant will find time and opportunity to serve as much and as best as he or she can. We see this with lay people who have many tasks and obligations and yet offer so much of their life to the service of the church. And I know that ordained people who have the permission and the expectation and the empowerment to go into the world to serve in the diaconal role will appreciate and value this opportunity to expand their diaconal ministry. 
Yeah, and maybe it's just a matter of the deacon thinking in terms of, well, what else can I do? Let me talk to the bishop and to my priest and maybe suggest something that I know I do have time for, uh, you know, maybe on a weekend or on a, in, in an evening during the week, just to start thinking in those terms. And we certainly want to let our deacons know that we appreciate very much, you know, what they are doing, and uh, but also... It's fun to imagine some additional uh, tasks that might resemble a little closer uh, the New Testament model. Well, let me give you an example, John. In our own parish, although we only see him functioning liturgically on Sunday, our deacon actually is active in the Orthodox prison ministry. And so he is actually moving into the world with his diaconal service. And all of that is, again, not paid in terms of his vocation. His actual employment, his profession is quite different. But his desire to serve is clearly uh, uh, drives him to serve as much as he can and always possible. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because one of my other panelists, when I asked the same question, uh, she politely said, well, that may be the deacons you've seen, but that's not what's happening in my church. You know, we do have our deacons or deacon who are involved in as many ways as they possibly can. So we also want to uh, affirm uh, what's already happening, and that's that's good to see. So, mm-hmm. Dr. Theodoropoulos, when you envision a specifically female deaconess, describe what that would look like in a practical way. In other words, what would the faithful in the church see if we had female deacons? Mm-hmm. Well, we have long recognized the value of same-sex counseling, assistance, and mentorship. And today we are even more sensitive to the needs and talents of women and understand that women have particular insights, experiences, and gifts that can address the unique challenges women face. Places where female deacons are particularly needed would include issues related to marriage, divorce, pregnancy and birth, sexual harassment and abuse, and illnesses specific to women's bodies spiritual mentoring of girls and women, and the like. But the gifts of women also benefit the entire church. And whereas women in earlier times remained primarily in the private or domestic realm, they now exercise these talents also in the public arena and can take on many of the works of service so needed by a vigorous, dynamic church. These might include pastoral counseling, chaplaincy, spiritual companioning, teaching religious subjects and catechesis, missionary outreach, interfaith witness, philanthropy, nursing, social work, parish administration, youth and young adult ministry. The work of the deaconess, though, as with the deacon, must always be under the oversight and direction of the bishop. It would include theological education, and very likely other training, such as professional education specific to her gifts and the ministry she undertakes. But I know a question people ask is, would she undertake liturgical duties? While her work may not be primarily liturgical, it will necessarily and crucially be tied to the liturgical life of the church because, and we have said this regarding the diaconate, This ministry circles between what we do in the world and what we do in church, synchronizing the life of the faithful in the world with the worship of the community. As one who's ordained to the diaconate, she would be able to function liturgically as a deacon functions, but what she is given to do would be dependent on the direction of the hierarch or synod under which she serves. We know that in antiquity, deaconesses distributed the Eucharist to the infirm, to the women within the women's quarters, kept proper order in the liturgy, participated in liturgical processions, and in women's monasteries, read the epistle and gospel, sensed, chanted, and served in other ways. So it would seem that these liturgical actions 
adapted to modern parish worship could be part of their duties, but again, given the direction and decision of their hierarchs. So is this an ordained role in your view in the same way we see male deacons and priests ordained, sometimes referred to as major orders? Yes, <laughs> this, that this was and is an ordained order belonging to the major orders is well documented. The Greek theologian evangelist Theodoro settled the question with his three-part publication almost 70 years ago, and subsequent research and publications by American, British, French, German, and other scholars have verified his conclusions that female deacons were ordained to major orders. What is the evidence? <laughs> well, the ordination rite with prayers for her ordination are included in the earliest extent of Hologion, or prayer book of the church, the Barberini Codex, and in other codexes. And we see in this text, in other texts, an ordination rite for female deacons virtually identical to that for male deacons. And what's even more important, all the crucial points of a higher ordination are present. She was ordained by the bishop during the liturgy at the altar, at the same place in the service that the male deacon was ordained, with two prayers, including the calling upon the divine grace of the Holy Spirit. All of these are crucial. In addition, she was vested with the orarion, the diaconal stole, presented with the chalice, and received communion with the clergy prior to the reception by the lower orders of the clergy, like the subdeacon, and the laity. The evidence is overwhelming and conclusive, <laughs> and that this is an ordination to the higher clergy in the rank of deacon. So let me drill in on it a little bit more, because you'd mentioned earlier the public liturgical versus the private liturgical functions, and we think of the history of deacons, male deacons, uh, and what they do liturgically, publicly, and and we know from uh, the research that there was more of a private liturgical function of the deaconess, particularly bringing the Eucharist uh, to the infirm or to those who could get, could not get out, uh, etc. So I'm trying to determine uh, whether you're envisioning a restored diaconate that is primarily uh, the way that it was, or a something different, something new, enhanced? Actually, I think you would find that in some ways, the deaconess of today would be the same, and in other ways, very different. She will look different, and her tasks will be different, because the specific functions of the deaconess today would need to meet modern needs and customs. And so what she does, how she does it, rules regarding her training, discipline, life, and such will not be the same. But she is not different in that her work would be circumscribed, dictated, and defined by the specific work of the diaconate. In other words, she's the same because she is a deaconess, and that's what the, the deaconesses of the past were. That is, just as in antiquity, she serves the diaconal ministry and operates within that framework. She is not taking on a different order of ministry. It will look different because we are in a different historical and physical reality. We have different expectations, we have different needs, we have different ways of training, we have different ways of behaving. But what it means to be a deacon does not change. And she will still manifest that in today's reality. 
Well, I'm glad, uh, Dr. Theodoropoulos, that you'd mentioned a private liturgical role in the past and the public liturgical role that we see today in the diaconate, uh, which at this point is male only, uh, with, with certain exceptions that have been noted in the Arminian Church, or uh, someone has mentioned St. Nectarios uh, ordaining to liturgical functions uh, a couple of nuns in the monastery in Agena. What people that are concerned about this tell me is that if you're talking about restoration, then do a restoration of what it was. But what I'm hearing and what the St. Phoebe Center says is not just a restoration, but an enhancement with all of these other liturgical duties. And you had mentioned, well, we're in a different world today, but not liturgically. So help me understand why it is being suggested that it be an identical role, but yet still being called a restoration. If we look over the historical path of the diaconate, and I'm talking about the male diaconate as well as the female diaconate, uh, we see with the male diaconate that there was actually a development of the tasks and roles. Um, They always related to service, but the activity of serving within the worship of the church expanded over time. And the activity of service in the community declined. So it was not a static, always identical path that the deacon did the exact same thing in the first century as they did in the 12th century or today in the 20th century. There has been some development and diminishment. What the deacon does, however, has always remained the same, and that is to serve, to enable, to enact, to distribute, to connect. These are the tasks that the deacon has been given sometimes with greater liturgical participation and other times with less. Now, the female deacon had very limited liturgical duties in antiquity, and they were circumscribed into the domestic or private sphere. The question, really, we have to ask ourselves is why? Is that because there is a theological reason is that has to do something with what it means to be a woman or what it means to be a deaconess? Or did that have to do with the circumstantial and historical uh, conditions of the time in which the ancient uh, female diaconate operated? We don't see women operating in the public sphere in other tasks or services. We don't see them doing um public education or medicine or any of the other kinds of work. You're saying back back then. Exactly, back then. And so the circumscription of women to the private arena, I feel, is not related to anything that has to do organically with the teaching of the church, but in fact was conditioned by the historical needs and customs and realities of that day. In fact, women were given the ability, they were actually given the vocation to distribute the Holy Communion. To me, (laughs) that is the most elevated liturgical act a deacon can do. And this was given to the deaconess. Offering petitions, Those are wonderful. We all offer prayers for one another, and to do so liturgically is something that does not overstep what um, a deacon or a female deacon could do. They were able to do that within, again, the circumscribed conditions of their reality and their world and their historical situation. But now the conditions that we live under are remarkably different. I feel that we need to understand that there is no overstepping or moving outside of the teaching of the church about what a deacon is or what a deacon does in enabling a female deacon to do these duties. I do think we have to ask ourselves what is needed, what is good for the life of the church, what brings the service of Christ most 
impactfully into the lives of the faithful and seek those paths to express diaconal ministry. As I said before, a connection to the liturgical life is crucial so that we understand this deep connection between what we do in the church and what we do in the world. And the deacon or deaconess can offer that. But I don't see the necessity of of establishing identical patterns of behaviors uh, and functions and tasks. These will be determined according to the needs of the parish, the community, and through the discretion of the bishop. So how are trained women hindered in their professional service to other women in, say, chaplaincy, counseling, teaching, and catechizing by not being ordained? What's missing? This gives me an opportunity to say what I often say, in that the church needs both and, not either or. We both we need the ministry both of actively engaged lay people and the ordained ministries recognized by our church and as part of our tradition. Orthodoxy is a lot about both and, not either or. Christ is both God and man. Um, The Trinity is both three persons and one. And we see this in multiple areas of our teaching. But truly, uh, we do know that women can and do work in multiple spaces within the life of the church, and we need to continue to encourage their various ministries. We should never think of their work as hindered or imperfect without diaconal ordination. What each offers, deaconess and laywoman, is important, but different. Ordination to the diaconate is transformative. Changing the deaconess and her relationship to the community of faithful. She is now accountable to the community, and in turn, she's vested with the gift of representing the church. Her commitment is permanent for the remainder of her life, and her diaconate now governs her behavior and guides her work. Furthermore, this diaconal ordination connects her work in the world, whether it's counseling or education or therapy or visitation, to the liturgical life with what we are doing in church. So in this way, her work becomes the work of the church. And she can bring the grace of the body of Christ, the church, to those she serves. So this is how it's different. Ordination makes it different. So let's talk about those major orders of ordination then. As we understand, major orders are deacon, priest, bishop. A male deacon may become a priest. A priest may become a bishop. Of course, they would have to be uh, not married or a widow. So if you correlate a major order of a female deaconess, can a female deaconess become a priest? And I think here is kind of uh, where uh, your critics are showing concern. Uh, Is this actually a path to the female priesthood? I mean, for the sake of equality. What the men can be priests, why can't women? What would you say about that? Okay. I have heard uh, frequently that this is a path to the female priesthood, that there is an agenda here. Um, I think that's the first concern we need to address. And the second is this question of, is this all for some sort of equal rights position? First, the suggestion (laughs) that there's a secret agenda, that there is an intent to ordain women to the priesthood. And... To that, I would like to say that advocates for the female diaconate have affirmed repeatedly, consistently, and widely for the last several decades that it does not call, they do not call for the female priesthood. In fact, 
all the calls for the restoration of deaconesses have repeatedly and consistently affirmed that this revival is not a path to the female priesthood and should not be considered as such. The idea, though, that this is somehow the pursuit of equality brings in another series of concerns or questions. But we Orthodox actually do not use this language of equality or equal rights because ordination through the diaconate, it's not about rights, but it's about service. It's not about what is due to women, but rather what women can offer and how they can serve. I, I think this language about equality comes out of the modern equal rights movements, but it really is not part of the discussion of the female diaconate except maybe by its opponents. But the actual movement to restore the female diaconate began in Russia some 150 years ago, well before the current upheavals of the recent equal rights movements. Um, and I would also like to say that the language of equality is used in orthodoxy to underscore really the equality of creation and vocation of men and women to be in the image and likeness of God. And I'm going to quote St. Basil here, (laughs) one of my favorites, who says, and I, I love it because he uses words of equality in the way the Orthodox Church thinks of equality. He says, the woman also possesses creation according to the image of God, as indeed does the man. The natures are alike in honor. The virtues are equal. The struggles equal. The judgment alike. Soul indeed is equal in honor to soul. In the coverings is the difference. That's from his On the Origin of Humanity. I also think, though, that we can see behind this concern that female priesthood is the inevitable outcome of the female diaconate, a fundamental misunderstanding of what diaconate is. You've pretty strongly stated that this is not what you have in mind. It's not what the St. Phoebe Center has in mind. We are not seeking a path to female priests. Yet when I've asked some of the proponents about it, and I say, you know, I make a comment like, well, well, I think that will help some of your opponents rest easy. And they said, well, not so fast. Uh, well, I'm not saying never. I'm saying that's not what we're currently seeking. And I think you could help kind of put this to rest once and for all by letting us know or letting people know Is this a non-starter? Is it off of the table forever? Many of the people who advocate for the female diaconate are very clear that they would never consider female priesthood. However, I do want to say that it is obvious that introducing the question of restoration of the female diaconate will bring to the fore the question of the female priesthood. We're talking about it right now. Exactly. You can't introduce the one without people thinking about the other. But they are two very separate topics and questions. Because in Orthodox teaching, in the Orthodox Christian tradition, diaconate does not automatically lead to priesthood It is, in fact, not a precursor to priesthood. I have to stress that I'm talking here about the theological and liturgical understanding of the order of of diaconate. And according to the way the teaching of the church establishes diaconal ministry, the diaconate was not and is not a precursor or preparation for the priesthood. It's not a type of quasi-priesthood. Their functions are different. Deacons are not priest apprentices. There was never an indication or implication in our teaching that the purpose of a deacon was a stepping stone to priesthood. So to discuss whether a woman would be qualified for priesthood 
is not related to whether she is qualified for the diaconate. They are two distinct ministries. One is not, to enter one is not automatic admission to the other. In fact, the diaconate is itself a full and complete ministry, distinct from the others. It's a ministry entire to itself, but of course, deeply related to the bishop and deeply related to the priest insofar as he or she functions according to their direction and enacts and enables their directions to be fulfilled, to be the agent of the bishop in, in, in the world. The priest is different. What the priest does is different than the deacon. Yes, the question would be raised, but the reasons for supporting female diaconate are not the same as ones that you would give for female priesthood. The understanding of how that functions will be different. We need to have some really good, serious discussions about what priesthood is, what it does, and uh, what we expect with priesthood. But it's a different topic <laughs> than the diaconate. I appreciate that, and I, I think you articulated it well. One of my panelists, who is a proponent of the restoration of female deacons, said, in the 2,000-year-plus history of the Orthodox Church, we have never had female priests, that there is no precedent for female priests in the Orthodox Church. However, there is precedence for female deacons. And I think the point she was trying to make is that would be something new. Now, she also wasn't willing to say never, which I, I was kind of looking for, and I think your opponents are looking for it. Uh, because even though I get that they are not the same, and I think sometimes we bring our Protestant understanding of the role of deacon uh, to orthodoxy, and it's because some who are converts to orthodoxy came out of a church, the Episcopal Church or liberal Lutheran Church, where first it was female deacons, then, sure enough, it was female priests and now female bishops. They see that as a pattern, but I did appreciate what uh, one of our guests said about we've never done it in 2,000 years. And if we started doing that now, can we all admit that would be indeed innovation and is a non-starter, period. I am convinced that the Western churches have a different understanding of what ordination to the diaconate means and its relationship to priesthood. And I think that that has operated to heighten the concern about uh, female deacons, um, given the rather catastrophic changes we've seen in Western churches. For the least you can say, at least, that we've seen dis disunity and significant disruption in the Western churches yeah. through the various changes that have occurred. For sure. I think there is a very much a concern that there's an inescapable slide into priesthood from diaconate. But again, that is operating with a Western, not an Eastern Christian understanding of ordination, of clergy, of diaconate, and of priesthood. I think we can underscore that for these many, many centuries, the historical record clearly and definitively establishes that female diaconate did not and does not lead to female priesthood. And it's not happening either in the Armenian church, which has actually restored the female diaconate for a, a, actually the last couple hundred years, so more or less in the modern era, and it still hasn't happened. In fact, there's no movement towards female priests. I am not a liturgical scholar. I cannot actually make any statement about what could happen or might happen or can happen um, with regard to priesthood for women, because I don't know enough about what it means to talk about priestly ordination. That's not my area of study. I have spoken to people who see it, and I've spoken to people who absolutely do not see it. And I think that this is something that the 
the hierarchy of the church, the mind of the church needs to address straight on, to consider it carefully and thoughtfully, and to give an answer that is faithful to the tradition and teaching of the church, and they can articulate it properly. And I am waiting for that. I'm waiting for that. Yeah, and it's unfair for me or anyone else to broad brush uh, all proponents of restoration to the female diaconate in one category of people who are also in favor of the female uh, priesthood. Because then you have to know individual people and what they're thinking, how they're processing, what their background is, how they've looked at this and thought about this. So I would just caution those who are concerned about this, uh, you know, let's be fair and not broad stroke here. Yes, I I can understand why you would like to see a more definitive statement, and perhaps that will come. Uh, but uh, there may be people who actually do have that in mind. And uh, I think uh, if that is the case, then uh, that's probably not going to see the light of day, uh, especially in our lifetime, and maybe, maybe never, because... Why hasn't it been yet? I mean, the church has been around for well over 2,000 years. If it was going to have female priests, it would have done it by now. And I, I just don't see it happening. And I totally understand and um, agree that you are absolutely right um, to not conflate the position uh, of advocacy for the diaconate, female diaconate, with advocacy for the priesthood. That's certainly not, in fact, I would say the vast majority of the people who advocate for female diaconate are not uh, even considering a female priesthood. I can't speak for everyone, but no broad brush strokes that, that paint everyone with the same um, brush. I will say this, that the women that I know are faithful Orthodox who are obedient to the mind and teaching of the faith. And within the life of the church, we encourage discussion, we encourage thought, we, can, we encourage um, questioning. I feel that questioning is part of the process of faith. This is how we actually help to define the teachings of the faith. We have seen over the centuries many, many, many big questions, many big teachings questioned, and the church working together to find uh, answers, to articulate what it believes in its faith. Um, so we shouldn't be afraid of the process. We should encourage it, but we should do it with, with kindness, with thoughtfulness, with respect, with care. And yes, ultimately with obedience to the teaching of the faith. I will also say that as part of this tradition and life of the church is the ordained female diaconate. And for people who respect the life and tradition of the church, where is the recognition that we need to respect that? The reality of the female diaconate and what it can bring to benefit the life of the faithful. So are you concerned about division in the pan-Orthodox Church if the restoration of deaconesses only happens in one jurisdiction in the U.S.? I think division always is a concern. Christ calls his body to unity, and so we should always be grieved should we see division among the faithful, and we should always work to overcome it. The, the church has weathered multiple storms of disagreement. Our history is filled with examples, right? But we weather it precisely because we are compelled as brothers and sisters in Christ to work together, live together, and to love one another. So I don't want our thoughts to spiral to the darkest places and think that we are, we are splintering over everything, but rather trust in the bond that we have. In fact, we are actually advocating for this renewal of the female diaconate and have the male diaconate as well, because it is the faithful teaching of the church. And 
also because it meets real needs among the faithful. It's actually working to heal divisions and losses that are already present. That's a, that is our hope. We know that the Orthodox faithful live with significant differences of practice across jurisdictions, and for good reason. We are an embodied faith, a faith lived in a time and a place and among a people. The Orthodox faith embraces the diversity of expressions and, and practices that relates to the lives and needs of its people. So what we see in the church in Africa will be in many ways different in its expression and in some of its practices from what the churches in Mexico or in Chicago or Kentucky or all the different places of the world, the Middle East. And, and we see some differences across jurisdictions too. They don't break us apart even when they are fairly substantial. The point is that these differences operate to really address what this particular community needs. But what can we not tolerate, okay? The one thing that we do not tolerate is difference in matters essential to the faith. We cannot differ on fundamental doctrine. We can't agree to disagree on that. So I think it's fair to ask ourselves whether the female diaconate is a matter that falls into the arena of doctrinal error. And in fact, I think we have to say it does not because for the very reason that it's the church itself that established the female diaconate and ordained female deacons from the apostolic times. Our church fathers and saints ordained these women. We venerate deaconesses among our saints and the Orthodox Church has never pronounced any teaching to suggest that this order is an error or to terminate it. So I believe that shows it's, it's not a threat to Orthodox doctrine and faith. And to me, that suggests that other perspectives and concerns have attached to this topic of the female diaconate and are driving the sphere of division. I think we, we see in the Western churches that there have been so many changes that have led to catastrophic division and disunity. And we imagine that could be our fate. But the Orthodox Church is not like the Western churches in important ways. And our path has not been and will not be their path. We should not compare ourselves to the other churches or operate from fears about what has happened there. We have a different tradition, structure, decision-making process, history, and life. Unlike the Western churches, we do not splinter into separate pieces when faced with division or disagreement. We work toward unity. Our strength and our resilience is our living tradition, which holds to the unity of faith as it moves through time and place, a living, creative, loving, responsive tradition, responding to the needs of the present and building for the future. Well, as we wrap up, Dr. Theodoropoulos, what message would you have for that lay person who's listening to this right now, and they're just on the fence about this issue? What would you say to that person who's just trying to figure this out themselves? I would first say, let us not be afraid. Not be afraid to think and talk about this topic, which is why I'm thankful that you're actually thinking and talking about the topic. Uh, let us speak to one another with respect, thoughtfulness, kindness. And again, I'm thankful that this is the path that this documentary is taking. Let our focus be Christ and how we may offer his servanthood, his diakonia to the world. Given the lack of understanding and information about deaconesses and even about the order of the diaconate, we need to follow a path 
of the reintroduction of female deacons that's sensitive, careful, responsive to the needs of the church and particular parish communities. But I want to underscore that the diaconate, male or female, is not about recognition or status or power. It's about the church going into the world to meet the needs of a suffering humanity, both those within the body of Christ and those still seeking him. The needs are many, the workers few. Do we have the courage and vision to restore this ancient order, to act as the hands of the church in meeting the particular conditions and needs of our parishes and the wider world today. We are not a church of scarcity and lack, tolerant of or blind to what is missing or what we can't do or provide. We are a church of abundance and love. Through the grace and power of the Holy Spirit conferred in the ministry of ordination to the diaconate of women and men, this infinite abundance can reach further into the lives of all. So we've been talking with Dr. Helen Theodoropoulos. She is currently adjunct professor at St. Sava Serbian Orthodox School of Theology in Libertyville, Illinois, teaching the study of the Church Fathers and Christianity in America. And Dr. Theodoropoulos, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, John. So next we have Mother Christophora, the abbess of the Orthodox Monastery of the Transfiguration in Elwood City, Pennsylvania. So, as I recall, the nuns of the monastery are serving in multiple capacities, including in and around the altar, spiritual guidance, praying with and for people who pilgrim there, giving hospitality, and in some cases teaching and speaking publicly. Do you see a need for female deacons who would be ordained to fill similar or perhaps enhanced roles, either within or outside of monastic life? Well, beginning with our monastic life, um, as you summarized so well, uh, we're kind of doing really uh, many, many things, serving in many capacities, um, and that's really the function of, of a blessing that we receive from our abbess and also the blessing of our monastic vows and our life, wearing each time we receive a part of the habit, we, that's another blessing. So we already have blessings and, and the grace that comes with that. Some sisters are selected by the abbess to have the obedience to serve actually in the altar. So that's a little interesting because... Uh, those nuns do go in the altar, they assist the priest, uh, just as an altar boy might do, or, or an altar server or a subdeacon, but they're blessed, and that, that's a special obedience, so we're not, the rest of us are not running in and out of the altar for any reason. But in a women's monastery, we don't have a community of men here, or a community of altar boys or anything, so it's a very practical reason that the nuns serve in the altar. When we receive this blessing to serve in the altar, I just want, at this point, just to tell a little a side story from a monastery in, in uh, Romania. So one of the nuns was tonsured Rossifor and then received a, a blessing to serve in the altar. And the priest, a good, venerable old priest, said to her, Well, when you're here, your job is not to pray. Your job is to help me to pray by doing what what has to be done. So, in other words, handing the censer, lighting the candles, and all that. I just thought that that was such a clever review for for our clergy who might be um, uh, struggling with a lot of distraction in the altar if if there's a wiggling altar boys. But that nun was told, your job is not to pray here, it's to help me to pray. Okay, so um, beyond the... uh, service uh, in the altar, around the altar. There are many tasks, of course. We live here full-time and 
take care of, of things like cleaning the church, uh, which is a very special obedience as well to keep it tidy and keep everything uh, arranged and all of the altar coverings and so on ironed and ready for when it's time to be changed by the priest. Uh, the other things that you mentioned, offering hospitality, listening to people unburden themselves. Um, that's really important. Women appreciate another woman to talk to. And very often uh, pilgrims will tell our guest mistress, Mother Paula, while they're here, they would like to speak to one of the nuns. Uh, I think the reason is confidentiality, comfort, um, safety, and the um, ease for a woman to talk to another woman about particular things or personal things. Sometimes, not very often, but sometimes it actually becomes a confession, uh, a non-liturgical, non-sacramental confession, but an unburdening and uh, very rarely, but it has happened, that that person maybe has not been able to tell a, a priest because being a, a male, and um, we might be able to tell the priest that she has made a confession and suggest the priest would read the prayer of absolution. So it happens, but that's rare. Now, that's I don't really see um, in terms of the question in the monastery that we would do anything beyond what we're already doing if there was an ordained deaconess. I also read an article that said in the early Byzantine era, the abbess was sometimes combined as a deaconess, as well as wearing both hats, so to speak. Olympias and her successor, Elisanthia, are cited as an examples. Can you speak to that? Yes. I, I don't know a lot, but I think that was the case. The case that an abbess could commune a sister if she was sick or dying from the reserve sacrament. I believe that that existed, so that was that kind of a blessing to do that. I know that because of that history, um, a monastery that I know that is in a non-Orthodox country and rather very, very far removed from other Orthodox churches or bishops or so on. They, they have their bishop, but they don't have a full-time priest in that women's monastery. And recently, their bishop did bless the abbess to commune the sisters um, on great feast days, I believe, uh, because they receive communion so infrequently. And that, to me, seems to be a practical application. Seems that the church, if the church finds the need, it also finds a solution. So in some ways, the question right now of deaconess is, I would think we would have to say, what is the need? Where is the need? And what is the solution? You mentioned the word need. That's come up a lot in my research for this project. Have situations arisen that you're aware of where an ordained female deacon would serve a real need? Personally, from my own point of view in Pennsylvania, I'm having a hard time finding that need. We have a lot of Orthodox churches, we have a lot of Orthodox clergy nearby, and um, so I'm not really seeing the need. However, in preparation for this interview, I took advantage of just chatting with a number of women on the subject and a few priests on, uh, also on the subject. And some of them see actually no need or no cause for any kind of an ordination at this point. But others wanted to have some something that would be a kind of training and a blessing uh, not necessarily an ordination, but a kind of a training, a blessing, and uh, a way that they could serve their sisters in Christ. So again, these women were saying that women are comfortable talking with women. Not everyone lives near nuns, so that's a reality. Um, those who live nearby monasteries maybe have that opportunity to talk to a nun, but um, there's many situations in parishes where women will be more comfortable talking with women. 
I think that a lot of this is going on and has gone on for many, many years without uh, official uh, acknowledgement or official blessing or ordination. I know there's many women that have the grace of God with them, have an open heart, have a gentle spirit, are confidential and trustworthy, and, and they do a lot of this just by the nature of who they are and their relationship with Christ, their relationship with, with others in the church. Um, so I think that it happens. But the ones who were saying that, no, we need some training, we need some, some official recognition, some kind of blessing, uh, I think they were saying that we want to recognize it, but uh, we also want to proceed with, with a blessing. So, And they were talking mostly about really serving women uh, through compassion and confidential conversations uh, more than anything else. Now, also, there was the question of visiting in hospitals, visiting people in nursing homes, which again, I think has gone on and does go on but maybe with a kind of certificate or acknowledgement or something so that they would be recognized by the hospital or the nursing home as, as an appointed uh, trustworthy person to visit uh, these people. The call for the restoration of the female diaconate is sometimes called for a very similar non-liturgical role, but sometimes a call for an enhanced role. That would look very much like the role of male deacons today, in particular, a liturgical function. Do you have thoughts about that? In uh, my own sense, is I do not envision a liturgical deacon. I do not think that that would be a good idea to have vestments. In my mind, it just disrupts the altar as it is. There's enough people in the altar already. Some churches have many people in the altar, many men in the altar, I'm not sure why, but that's another question. The women and the priests that I talked to on this subject, uh, none of them were proposing a liturgical deacon. That's, they, they really didn't want that or couldn't envision that. Now, as, as a woman watching the nuns here that are blessed to serve in the altar, when we have a, a major feast day, a number of priests, bishops, subdeacons, deacons, maybe metropolitan and a few bishops. I look at that altar full of all those men and I think, whoa, I really wouldn't want to go in there right now. So actually our sisters, they kind of stand on the side on a day like that in the sacristy and they just keep things moving by handing hot charcoal sensors and candles, but they're not actually weaving in and out between all of that during a hierarchical service or anything. So we don't have any desire to insert ourselves in that. Um, but I, th I think that a liturgical deacon would cause unnecessary confusion and, and disruption and uh, some panic. So a few people that I did have this conversation with, a dozen or so people, uh, none of them were really looking for a liturgical function. Well, we really appreciate your time and your perspective on this, Mother Christophora. But before we let you go, do you have any other thoughts on the role of women throughout the history of the Church? Celebrating the daily saints in a monastery kind of broadens our horizon as to the women that um, served our Lord and have been formally canonized by the Church. Many of them, of course, were, were martyrs in the early Church. Um, that's a pretty common celebration. And just interesting, uh, often in the verses to the female martyrs, there'll be a line that says something like, you were very manly, meaning that you had courage. I think you had courage. This woman had courage, strength, and um, stick to itiveness to, to stand her ground. Uh, someone like Martyr Catherine was very intelligent, very bright and put the orators to shame. The church recognizes her and others like her. Someone like St. Elizabeth, who was a, a royalty, but she founded a convent that would serve the poor and the needy, and still going on, of course, in Belarus is the very well-known St. Elizabeth convent that has lay sisters, so that's an interesting 
role. I don't know much about how they define that, uh, but they call them sisters, but they call them lay sisters, so they're not monastics. Some of those are actually married. And of course, the sisters of Lazarus, Martha and Mary, uh, among the saints, friends of Christ, uh, offered him hospitality. So we, we see that the church is saying, you know, women have a gift and they have strength. And then there's Venerable Paula, who was an abbess, and she was a disciple to St. Jerome, but she was also an advisor to St. Jerome because he had the rough edges, so she would tone him down sometimes. Uh, Venerable Macrina, an abbess, whose brothers are well known in the church, uh, Basil and Peter, and she toned them down. Uh, Gregory, also St. Gregory, she had to tone them down and teach them some things. Um, Juliana, a mother of 13, Juliana of Lazarezzo, so we know that the mother of a family is, is the priest of a family. Now, that's an interesting uh, way to look at it, but Father Roman Braga, he's known to many, but he was chaplain here at our monastery for some years. He would say that uh, the mother is the priest of the family. She blesses the children. She prepares the meal like the holy altar that they gather around the family table. Uh, she teaches catechism. She teaches how to read prayers and how to say their prayers, how to cross themselves. She blesses them when they go to bed, when they go to school. So imagining as women how far, how much effect we have on others, uh, we can't neglect that. So whether we're actually going to have a, a ordained deaconess or blessed deaconess, we already have so much um, spiritual authority, let's say, spiritual possibility. And then finally, Blessed Olga, who's made herself known after her death of, of bringing healing to women who have been abused. And we don't know a lot about her life because she lived very quietly. She worked very hard as a midwife, as a mother, charitable worker in her village, but it's a, the, um, Native Alaskans are rather silent people, so she wasn't writing or corresponding or making phone calls or probably not even visiting except maybe for the birth of a child as, an, as a midwife. But we find that she had a lot of spiritual authority and God was working through her and continues to work through her. So I would just encourage women to keep doing what you're doing Grow closer to God and give yourself to God wherever you are. It doesn't have to be given yourself to God in a monastery. Wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, grow closer to him and he's going to use you because he's not going to waste the grace he's giving you. He will bring others to him through you. That is such an impressive list, Mother Christophora. Thank you for reminding us about the rich and beautiful heritage of women who were obedient to Christ and served strongly in the roles to which they were called. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you. Thank you for the opportunity. Sarah Byrne Martelli is an Orthodox lay chaplain and bereavement counselor who has served in acute care and hospice since 2002. She is the inpatient chaplain for the Massachusetts General Hospital Division of Palliative Care. And Sarah, thanks for taking time with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us about the years of experience you've had as a chaplain. Well, uh, back in the day when I was discerning uh, my vocation, I went to Harvard Divinity School and I was actually, I was raised Presbyterian, but I was in the process of becoming Orthodox and I had several Orthodox mentors and professors at the Divinity School. And one of the requirements is to take what's called CPE, clinical pastoral education. And so as I was sort of simultaneously sorting out my call into the Orthodox Church, I experienced uh, a chaplaincy summer internship. And so for me at the time, 
you know, I was thinking of going into some type of ministry or maybe academia, or I wasn't quite sure. Um, and so when I had my first summer working as a chaplain where you do kind of mentorship and education and peer groups and then direct clinical care to patients and families in the hospital, that was when it became very clear to me that I really loved this ministry and this could be something that I could do. Well, some people may not even know what the work of a chaplain is. Could you explain that? Sure. So chaplains are lay men and women, typically in settings, institutional settings. So that could be hospitals, schools, prisons, hospice, etc. So for me, I'm a healthcare chaplain specifically. And there uh, has been for many, many years, a set of qualifications to provide spiritual care to patients and families in the healthcare setting. And so typically that involves having a master of divinity, having a year of internship an intensive kind of clinical training with a peer group, a mentor, lots of different didactics where you learn about kind of healthcare related spiritual care. Mm -hmm. And then also you either are ordained or endorsed by your faith tradition, whatever that is. So like a Presbyterian person might be ordained as a Presbyterian minister. For me, I had just become Orthodox maybe a year or two prior to my ch uh, chaplaincy education. And so at the time, there were not really any board-certified lay Orthodox chaplains, male or female. There were okay. a few priests that I did know. And so the real question became, and my learning goal actually for CPE, you kind of set these very specific learning goals for your training was, is this even possible? Like, can I be endorsed? And, you know, which I like that there's this formal endorsement process, yeah, right? Yeah. It means you're not just like a random chaplain doing spiritual care in the hospital. It means that you have a faith community that supports you, that you're in good standing with your community, that you have the training you need to provide care, and that you really have a spiritual home, right, that nourishes you and that gives you, you know, sort of the spiritual background um, and the home for your work because you're yeah. facing a lot of really hard situations, you know, a lot of suffering, a lot of pain and grief. And so during my clinical pastoral education, I was already Orthodox and I was, you know, spoke to my priest and got to know different priests and bishops. And so then thankfully, um, I was at a OCA church at the time and I met with the Metropolitan at the time and he just said kind of, what do you need? And I said, well, this endorsement um, to be a chaplain and to provide care for the sick and dying. And he said, okay. And then, so I got a letter and that is my endorsement that I've now had. Now I'm in the Antiochian archdiocese. You know, I moved and yeah. got married and various things. So, yeah. yeah. So you have a letter that states that you are officially connected to the Orthodox church and serve with her blessing. Would, would that be a good way to describe what you have? Indeed, yes. I mean, the concept of having a blessing to do something is not very unfamiliar to us, right? And so, um, yeah, it's just like an official blessing says I'm in good standing with my parish, I'm actively involved in the parish, and I have the training. Um, and it's been great because I've really been able to get to know, you know, priests in the area and get to know my bishop um, and really remain in close communication with him about my work and what I'm doing. Okay, so you are a lay chaplain, you have this letter, you're not ordained. Are there times when you wish you could be ordained so that maybe you could bring the Eucharist to an Orthodox patient? Well, I don't think about it exactly that way. When I was discerning my call into chaplaincy, as I mentioned, I was raised Presbyterian, but I quickly found that I was not a Calvinist. And so for me, it became very important to kind of figure out my spiritual home, which was the Orthodox Church, and then kind of that my ministry would flow from there. And so that was my prayer and my hope was that, you know, can I do this ministry from within the church? You know, of course, one of our core values as Christians is providing care and love. You know, it's like the Gospel of Matthew 25 ministries, you know, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison. And so I really felt like once people understood the ministry of chaplaincy, that I would be able to have this blessing and do it as a lay person. And so for me, it's incredibly important that my ministry comes from my faith, my parish community, the sacramental life of the church, right? Not me, but Christ in me. And so the work that I do, and just like all of us as Christians can do to care for others, right? It comes from God. I like to think of myself as someone who 
you know, I studied theology, I study all different religions, pastoral care, grief support, you know, medical ethics. So I'm really be able to be present with patients and families in their suffering. For me, it was more just a matter of educating people about what the work is that we do. And so thankfully, you know, in the United States, we have a really robust understanding of professional chaplaincy. And there are many, many lay chaplains, men and women, and also ordained chaplains of different traditions. So I went into this ministry feeling like the most important thing was that I was just able to do the work with the blessing of my parish, to be active in the life of the church, and to really stay grounded in my faith, um, you know, and, and be participating in, in my parish life. And so I minister in, in my work. Um, I've worked in hospice for about 10 years, um, doing home care to patients who are terminally ill, um, most of whom were probably, I would say, maybe Protestant or Catholic. Certainly, I always have Orthodox patients. Mm -hmm. um, and then now in the hospital at Mass General, I always have a few Orthodox patients, for sure. I have a few at any given time. And, you know, so you ask, is there a concern that I can't bring communion to them? I guess I don't really think about it in that way because it's not something that I was thinking about. Generally, instead, I really just wanted to be able to be with patients. And certainly with my Orthodox patients, they love that I'm an Orthodox person. Sometimes they're surprised, truthfully, um, but they love it. And, you know, I bring a paper icon, I bring little battery powered little candles. Mm. Certainly I can pray with people in familiar ways. And also, truthfully, I can just support them, be with them, you know, go to goals of care or family meetings with them or help them think through medical decision making from an orthodox perspective. And so, you know, we have a different way of thinking about a lot of things, you know, about the way we think about suffering, the way we think about, you know, discerning God's will for our life or discerning, you know, the ways we think about God being present with us or the way we think about healing. Um, so those are really the main things that I do with anyone. Um, I can think of a few times here and there. One time there was a little Orthodox, a baby of an Orthodox couple um, who was sadly dying, who mm. was a preemie, and they wanted someone to baptize the baby. And the NICU chaplain is a lay Catholic woman, and she offered to them, we had a Catholic priest on staff, like who could be there right in 10 minutes, or me. And they actually chose me because I think, you know, they wanted someone who was from their tradition. And so I actually called... Like I talked to Father Anthony, I talked to Bishop John, um, you know, and I had oil that we can, you know, we bless people with. So, and and so actually I did a baptism sort of as faithfully as I could, you know, faithfully using the prayers of the church. Now, it wasn't, you know, an official like church baptism, but that was an instance where I was connected to my clergy who could kind of talk me through it. And I do think that you know, certainly in a time of where someone is about to pass away, you know, we can kind of step up and do this, you know, as authentically and prayerfully as possible. And I don't think anyone would have a problem with that. Well, I suppose the key there is what you did. You did it in direct communication with your priest and your bishop. Yeah. And, and it, you know, that was sort of an anomaly, like in the moment, kind of quickly, you know, I do have a lot of situations where I'm just, you know, praying with people, sitting with them. And again, really just talking with them theologically in a way that's like very familiar, or even just, you know, I work with many chaplains or chaplain students who, you know, I have to remind them like, when you visit an Orthodox patient and they ask for prayer, they're probably not going to want you just to like hold their hand and close your eyes. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm yeah. just like, here's what you do. And so yes. I printed out a few prayers right? and I said, you can bring them an icon. They love that. Mm -hmm. You know, but it, it's just funny, even just like the language of prayer I could even tell like a, a short story that was lovely. Yes, please. But one time our palliative care team gets called in for patients who are dealing with serious illness, some more end of life situations or some people who are just struggling with very serious symptoms. And so we were, had a new consult to go see a patient whose last name I recognize uh, seemed Lebanese Christian, but I hadn't met them yet. 
So I went with the nurse practitioner and a couple of physicians to go meet this family. And as we walk in, the patient, sadly, um, had just passed away, actually. She was in her 90s, a beautiful you know, grandmother and mother. And there were probably eight or 10 people in the at the bedside with her from her family. Um, none of them spoke English. They all spoke Arabic. But, uh, well, there was one who sort of spoke a little English. And so I guess from their last name, I, I said, hey, actually, are you Orthodox? And they were like, oh, yes, we're Orthodox. And I said, would you like to have a prayer? You know, this this holy, sacred moment, right? The woman had just like yeah, taken her yeah. last breath. Yeah. And so um, I had, you know, an icon of the resurrection. I put a little candle on the table and I just offered you know, the Trisagian prayers. Beautiful. I have heard them in English. Well, mostly in English. I threw in my best Arabic <laughs> as far as, as best as I could. Yeah. But, you know, they all immediately stood up. They stood around the bed and they prayed with me. Half of them sort of mumbling in Arabic. I'm doing it in English. We're all doing the sign of the cross together. It was, we all knew when the Lord's prayer was, we all prayed it in our oh, own languages. I love that. And then, you know, at the end, they all came and, you know, hugged me and gave me a million, you know, kisses. And it was sort of interesting. It was just really beautiful because, you know, it was like this totally universal yes. language. We all knew what we were praying for. That's right. And the that medical team, I think, was sort of like, what is going oh, yeah, on here? Yeah. What's happening? <laughs> like, we can't even speak with this family. But um, so that was really beautiful. That so is. things like that happen a lot. And that feels really meaningful. Uh, that is a beautiful story, Sarah. Thank you for sharing that. So can you imagine any situation where there would be a better way to connect the work of chaplains more officially to the Orthodox Church? Have you ever thought about that? I have. I mean, really, I've I've spent my 20-something years in chaplaincy really sort of thinking thoughtfully about how to best grow this ministry from within the church. I have a friend, Elizabeth, who's a pediatric palliative care chaplain at St. Jude. And I remember when she was doing her chaplain training, her supervisor said to her, you know, you Orthodox people, you have the most rich, beautiful theology and liturgy and sacramental practice, like you guys, you, like you're perfect chaplains, hmm. you know, because we have this incredibly deep, like incarnational way of looking at the body, of looking at, you know, the spirit, of looking at the way we're all connected, the way that, you know, yeah. we be really believe God is present with this. Well, in death, and so, I mean, in, in, in oh. you, I mean, you wrote, you wrote the book on this, but the, the orthodox theology of death, um, what better a way and place to uh, bring that healing medicine than in pal palliative uh, care. So that's beautiful. Absolutely. Well, and so for me, so knowing that, you know, for me, again, it wasn't an issue of like, oh, we don't need chaplains in the Orthodox Church. It was more like, you know, we just had really, I think, focused on parish ministries primarily and other types of ministries. And the healthcare ministry world has really just been growing. And so over time, for the past 20 years, bit by bit, sort of email and phone call here and there, I've gotten to know many different students, um, you know, some second career chaplains or seminary students. And, you know, bit by bit, I've kind of pulled them in and um, gotten to know different people and mentored a lot of chaplains. And so now, you know, I oversee, uh, I have an email list of about 140 Orthodox chaplains of all different jurisdictions. Wow. Yeah, and it's uh, I had no idea there were that camper. many. Yes, well, and I think there's more that honestly that I don't even know about because there hasn't really been one central way to gather them, and so I I really sort of did it under O Camper, which is a min an affiliate ministry of the Assembly of Bishops, which is a perfect place for chaplains to gather because it's we're really looking at you know medicine, psychology, and religion, and I do wish. Right now, the endorsement process is by jurisdiction, which is fine in the way it should be. Um, but the problem is that sometimes, you know, the Greeks might not know the Antiochian chaplains or this, you know, one like Ethiopian hospice chaplain over here. And so I've gotten to know all the folks, you know, here hmm. and there, or they email me. I would love it if we could be more actively engaged in sort of the day-to-day -day communications and sort of the day-to-day workings of our church organizations. I did actually speak at the Antiochian convention this past summer, and that was such a blessing because I was able just to briefly share about the Ministry of Healthcare Chaplaincy. And 
many, many people came up to me after and said they didn't know we had this. And again, it, it was not like people weren't supportive of it. It was more just like it didn't, you know, we don't quite have the infrastructure to always include people like me in sort of bigger conversations about things. So mm-hmm. I would love, you know, for us to have more intentional healthcare ministries or, you know, think about advanced care planning or think about healthcare decision making or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, we're getting there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I really know a lot of people now from doing this for a while. And so, yeah. Is there a directory of Orthodox chaplains anywhere? Not one that the public could find exactly, okay. but um, I mean, I have one through Ocamper, yes. So if you if you join Ocamper, then you will have access to the chaplains group, and we welcome inquirers or people who are interested in it. I mean, sometimes people, again, when they do a chaplaincy unit, um, like at St. Vladimir's, they require people to do one unit of CPE, which is amazing because even if you know you're going to be a parish priest, like it's so important to understand how to care for people, you know, at end of life in the clinical setting. Right. Yep. And yeah. so some people, when they do their required unit of CPE actually realize like, wow, this is something where I really can use my gifts. You know, maybe I actually want to be a chaplain and be a priest or a deacon, or, you know, maybe just to not be an ordained man, but instead to be a lay chaplain. And that, is good too, you know? And so I think just encouraging people to understand that it's a beautiful ministry that is like super foundational to our life as Christians. Let me just say that Ocamper is, again, the Orthodox Christian Association for Medicine, Psychology, and Religion. It's ocamper.org. And uh, there you could find out more about Sarah's work as a chaplain and, of course, uh, any other professional ministry that is, exists. It's such a good location, a good resource for, for information. So do you need more chaplains, Sarah? I mean, if what would you say to someone who perhaps should consider chaplaincy as a vocation? We definitely need more chaplains. I mean, I think first, kind of two ways. One is within the church. I think we need more people. You know, it builds up the body of the church. I remember talking to a priest many years ago, and he was like, listen, the way you think about chaplaincy is like, is it going to support and help and care for the people in the church? Does it build up the body of the church? And so I think within our parishes, we can always use, you know, the gifts of people who you know, are maybe skilled at being with dying people or providing grief support or caring for the sick. Certainly to have more people who are trained and comfortable with this work will help us in our own parishes. You know, over the years in different parishes, I've been a member, you know, our priest has said, oh, you know, our parishioner is having heart surgery. Could you go talk to them? Or, oh, this person is really struggling with trying to decide about hospice care. You know, I'm not an expert on hospice, but the priest says that, you know, and then says, could you go talk to them about hospice? You know, there's a lot of misinformation, even within our church, about what hospice is or what palliative care is. And it's so important for people to understand what this is, because it's hard to decide when you're in a crisis, um, instead to learn more about it, which is why, you know, I give retreats, I I try to give talks and webinars and different things just to talk about this um, healthcare area because we need to be informed. Mm. So that's one piece. The other piece is I think there are people who are gifted at this that might not even realize it's a ministry and might really find joy and beauty in really doing this ministry full-time or part-time. And the other piece is that in the healthcare world, there is a strong move towards sort of official chaplaincy ministry. So that means you have the MDiv, you have the endorsement, board certification. So you're really trained and skilled to do this work because it's, you know, it's a growing area, especially within palliative care. Spiritual care is a core value of palliative care. And in hospice, some people might not know this, but it is actually a hospice Medicare requirement to within five days of hospice admission to offer a psychosocial, like emotional social work assessment and a spiritual assessment within five days okay. of admission to hospice. It's actually required in order to get Medicare reimbursement. And so you can always say, no, thank you, of course. Yeah. But the point is, there is always someone doing this ministry in hospice. And like my, my kind of line that I say is like, someone's going to be doing this ministry. Why not us? 
So we're talking to Sarah because we're in the midst of producing this documentary about the call for the restoration of the Orthodox deaconess. And so, Sarah, since you're on with us, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I guess you could say I take a position of sort of studied neutrality. I'm open to it. I think it's great that we're having this dialogue. And some of my best friends are people who are studying and thinking about it from all angles. So over the years of doing the Ministry of Caring for the Sick and Dying, Certainly people have said to me, including all different priests or lay people have said, you know, that seems like, you know, diaconal work, or that seems like maybe someday we'll have this ministry of the diaconate. And so for me, I feel very strongly that, you know, I'm open to what kind of the church discerns and decides. And if our priests and clergy and hierarchs really come to the conclusion that this is something that will really build up the church, then we'll see how it goes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to that. It, my strong sense is that it can't come from me. This is not something I advocate for, for myself. Instead, my whole, um, really my area of calling has been building up the ministry of the sick and caring for the sick, caring for the dying from within the church, working with what we have right now. And to do this as a lay person has been, I think, important because it reminds us that this type of work can be done by trained, skilled, you know, skilled, loving people who are ordained or lay people. Um, So that said, I also feel really thankful that we're talking about it because we can only benefit, I think, from continuing to discern the needs of the people in our parishes and in the world. And so if having a more robust ministry conversation, um, you know, helps that, then I think that's great. But again, for me, my focus really has just been on doing the best professional work as a female lay chaplain and to mentor and encourage others who may be called to this ministry. So maybe the way to put it is, yeah, let the discussions continue, but don't wait. (laughs) If you feel led and called to the Ministry of Chaplaincy, uh, there is a need. And so... uh, Absolutely. Sarah, what would be a way that people could get in touch with you if they wanted to ask you about that need? Sure. And, you know, again, I'm not afraid of dialogue. That's the thing is, I, I mean, our church is, we have so much rich theology. We have so much beauty and like complexity and nuance, and we're able to hold seeming opposites together at the same time, you know? So I, I, again, I, I welcome any conversation on this. So one way is that, um, Father Adrian and Budika and I, Father Adrian is a CPE supervisor and priest, and I have a podcast on ancient faith called the wounded healer, visiting Christ, visiting the sick, visiting ourselves. And so in our podcast, Uh, we describe and share and reflect on experiences of caring for the sick and dying in our work as chaplains. And we interview a variety of chaplains and talk about important concepts, you know, such as forgiveness or anger or suffering or medical aid in dying. We talk about that. We talk about what is palliative care. We talk about what is hospice. So you can reach us through that. Also, as you mentioned, um, I wrote Um, my book, my first book called Memory Eternal, Living with Grief as Orthodox Christians. And I have a website. So if you look up my name and the book, um, you can reach out to me on email. And I say my first book because I really want (laughs) friends, chaplain friends and I are are thinking of really writing more of another book about Orthodox uh, spiritual care and chaplaincy too, because I think it's such an important growing ministry that the more people know about it, the more People are interested in it and realize it's really a beautiful resource that we have in the church. Well, and may God give you strength to carry that dream out as well. And thank you for the wonderful resources you provide, the information in both your book and your podcast. I have learned so much just listening to you speak at O'Camper and uh, listening to the podcast, reading the book. And I just think everybody should. I think it's something that you may not be aware is happening in the Orthodox world. Uh, The ministry of chaplaincy is very much needed, and it is happening by professional, educated, trained lay people right now. And you can be a part of that, too, if you'd like. So anything else, Sarah? Could I share a little quick story? I would love it. 
I mean, I have a million of them. All right, let's get one. on, On this all day. But I guess what I want to stress is that I really do feel like our way of looking at life of looking at being a person, you know, personhood, um, of the sacramental nature of our lives as Christians, of the sort of the ongoing dialogue that we have, like living in the church, praying, holding joy and grief, and, you know, really kind of thinking about the sacramental and communal nature of our lives, right, that's centered in the life of the church. You know, I really want to encourage people who are interested and who could who are good listeners, who are caring people, who feel, you know, they're the, always the ones who are showing up to, you know, be a caregiver or those people who are really good at kind of sitting with people and suffering. This is your call <laughs> to consider this type of work. And a quick little story that I think is a good one. So this was my first day ever as a clinical pastoral education resident. So I was doing a year of full-time chaplaincy. And as I mentioned, my one of my learning goals, you know, you, you, you set these goals. One was to be, uh, you know, learn how to be a better listener. One was how to learn more about medical ethics. The other one was, can I be an Orthodox person, lay chaplain and like do this work? Is it sort of possible? And what does that look like? And so I had my first night on call at the hospital and, you know, I'm all, you know, you sleep over at the hospital and you carry the pager. And so I slept over and about 4.30 in the morning, I got paged. I'm like, oh boy, okay. So I talked to the nurse and she says, um, there's a guy in the ICU who's about to go into surgery. He's very anxious. He's crying. He's very stressed. Um, he's Jewish. And, you know, could you come be with him before he goes to surgery? I say, sure. So I get ready to go. I go over there with, you know, my books of prayers and all my things. And, um, I walk in and I see this elderly man with a like a scraggly beard. He's intubated, so he can't speak, but you know, his eyes were so sad and he was very tearful. So I walk in and I say, Hi, uh, I'm Sarah. I'm the chaplain, which like I had barely even said those words ever in my life. <laughs> and I said, um, I know you've been feeling kind of nervous before your surgery. I'm here to support you. And uh the nurses said that you were Jewish. And so I can, you know, I can call a rabbi if you'd like, or, and he shakes his head, shakes his head, and then proceeds to reach up with his right hand, with his three fingers together and make the sign of the cross in the Orthodox way. And I look at him and I go, (laughs) you're Orthodox. (laughs) So am I, which of course I'm sure he was like, who is this crazy lady? But you know, cause I was, but it was like. So I think he probably had said Orthodox on admission. Maybe they just assumed Orthodox, Orthodox Jewish. Jewish. Yeah. Right. But he's, no, I'm Christian. So, if, and the thing is, even just to recognize that it was like an Orthodox style of crossing himself, right? <laughs> yeah, not yeah. not the Catholic way or whatever. I know you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that's so amazing. he was like, he looked, I was like, okay, God is with us. This is funny. Amen. You know? Yeah. And, and so then I, I had some Psalms, you know, I taped up an icon on the wall and, said prayers with him and and you know he was really visibly calmed yeah. and then he went to surgery and I never saw him again and uh, I don't know what happened to him because yeah. they teach you kind of to you know let go and yep. trust the yeah. process but yeah. well um, I mean at so the very least it was a moment what a wonderful know, it was a moment of uh, yeah. ministry that was to this man as he's afraid and going into surgery and to see a fellow orthodox come in to pray with him that's right and it, for me it was special. felt like you know my prayer is god can i do this yeah and i yeah. think god was saying like yep i think there's room for this absolutely well, that's Sarah Byrne Martelli, an Orthodox lay chaplain and bereavement counselor who has served in acute care and hospice since 2002. She is the inpatient chaplain for the Massachusetts General Hospital Division of Palliative Care. And Sarah, you've inspired us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate it. Next, we have Father Joseph Lucas, an Orthodox Christian priest, theological scholar, and practical philosopher. He received his Ph.D. in theology from the St. Irenaeus Orthodox Theological Institute at Radboud in the Netherlands. And Father Joseph, thanks for taking the time with us today. My pleasure. 
So you're a patristic scholar, so I would imagine you'd be familiar with how the fathers of the church looked at the female diaconate over the first centuries of the church. So what can you tell us? Well, from what I can tell from looking at the, uh, the corpus or, or list of standard books that are authentic, written by the fathers, uh, you would think that an order that is mentioned so much maybe in lists of you know clergy at various churches would get a little more airtime, you could say, in the writings of the fathers, but you really have to dig to find references to them. Uh, obviously, within the, the Synaxarian tradition that came about, we have a, a few different deaconesses who are saints, probably the oldest being St. Phoebe, commemorated on September 3rd. Of course, scholars debate whether she was a deaconess in the later sense of the term as an office or, or maybe just a patroness of the church in Corinth. But some of these references begin to pop up later on of, of deaconesses doing various things. And we find them in the literature in at least the Byzantine or Chalcedonian churches, at least up through the 12th century. Uh, the canonist Balsamon is one of the last ones to reference them, that there are still deaconesses in his time in the 12th century. And it seems they sort of fade out of the sight of the church after that, except perhaps in the non-Chalcedonian churches, the Oriental churches, particularly the Ethiopian church I'm familiar with has a had continued to reference them in writings and still has them as active today. So there's a lot less than you would think in terms of references to them or, or any kind of literature about them. So a lot of what we know about deaconess is going to be uh, guesswork. We do read occasionally of uh, one of the fathers of the church referencing uh, a deaconess. Who of the fathers actually served with deaconesses or were personally familiar with them? Do you have any idea how many there would be? Total number, I couldn't say. I think the earliest reference I found as someone who was familiar with the deaconess was Clement of Alexandria. Uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa mentions them in passing that he knows deaconesses. St. Epiphanius of Salamis has a little section in one of his books where he talks about what the deaconess is, and so he obviously was familiar with them. Interestingly, St. Epiphanius, in that same little part of the text, is very clear that the deaconess cannot be considered in any way a priestly vocation. They cannot in any way uh, fulfill the role of priesthood. It's completely distinct from that. But probably the most famous person who had interactions with the deaconess, I think many people are aware of, would be St. John Chrysostom, because he, he became very close friends with St. Olympia. St. Olympia uh, came from a, a fairly prestigious family in Constantinople, and she used her, her rank and station and her funds to, to be very charitable, to do all kinds of various ministries within the city, and developed this friendship with St. John Chrysostom. And they became so close as friends that after his exile, they continued to write back and forth to each other. So we have the correspondences. Uh, you can find those in English. I think it was Dr. David Ford who, who translated the letters to St. Olympia by St. John Chrysostom, which are pretty interesting to see this interaction, this close friendship that they had. So in your understanding of the canons of the church, uh, are there many that actually reference deaconesses and if so, are there limiting uh, factors that the canons uh, indicated? So in the uh, ecumenical councils, there are a few references. Um, and this is dealing with mostly the way that deaconesses are seen in the West. Because just an aside, it's very interesting that in the Western tradition rather than the Eastern tradition, the local councils in the West absolutely forbade the ordination of deaconesses. So you have the Council of Orange, you have the Council of Orleans, uh, both of them forbade ordination of deaconesses. So the, the order never, if there was some sense of an order of it in the West, uh, very early on in the period of the ecumenical councils, it was it, it basically disappeared uh, or was forbidden. But in the East, the canons that, that govern them are just a couple of them. The earliest one is the 15th canon of Chalcedon, or the Fourth Ecumenical Council. And this was the canon that lowered the age of ordination of a deaconess from the age of 60 down to 40. Uh, it still ha it still assumes that it's, you know, that the same guidelines apply as we find in other writings, that they had to absolutely be uh, celibate. So they had to either be uh, a virgin for life, so some kind of consecrated virgin or someone maybe who was in the monastic life, or they could be a widow. And from writings and interpretations of the canon, we see that it's oftentimes considered a continuity with the 
the early apostolic ministry of the widows, the widows who, who didn't remarry, who consecrated themselves to, uh, to, that, uh, to, re to continued celibacy and to praying and serving and ministering the church in that way. So it's always connected in, in these early canons or early descriptions of the canons with, uh, first of all, celibacy and with it being uh, a certain mark of age that they had to pass before they could, before they could actually uh, be ordained to that, that ministry. Then there's not really much literature about them until you get to the Quintus Ex Council or Council of Truro. Truro yeah. yeah, that's the big one. And that's the one that speaks clearly about... Uh, First of all, that's the one that mentions in passing, in Trullo, it mentions in passing that the original age was 60. We don't actually get that in Chalcedon. Mm. But in Trullo, it's really dealing with the bishops because there was a movement over time uh, for, the, for the episcopacy to be celibate. It, it wasn't originally celibate, and there's this movement from the 4th to the 6th century towards the, uh, the bishops actually being celibate. And sometimes the bishops were married, they were presbyters, they were married, and then they got elected to uh, or appointed to a Episcopal position. And so the assumption was the only way that, that was possible is that the wife, it says by her own free will, has to you know, choose either to go off to the monastery and become a nun or be elevated to the rank of a deaconess. But it says that she cannot live with her husband anymore. So again, you have this idea that, that she's going to live the rest of her life in kind of a consecrated celibacy, serving the church within this rank, as her husband goes off and lives in celibacy as the bishop. So this is kind of that transition of the episcopacy to complete celibacy, and then the wives, if they are married to the, uh, to the episcopal candidate, are, are being encouraged either to go to the monastery or to the... Uh, or to the uh, role of a, uh, a deacon within the church, but living separately from their husband, it makes that clear. So other than the changing of the age requirements, do you see a consistency between the canons on how the rule of deacons uh, was to function? I guess what I'm getting at is, can we point historically to a role and a function of deaconesses that we could then look at today for those who are calling for restoration and say, well, that's how it should be. Well, I think the, the most important thing is that, so when you compare the canons for a male deacon to a female or deaconess, right? Some people want to say female deacon or deaconess, uh, but let's look at what the canons say. A male uh, could be ordained a deacon at age 25, okay? As opposed to even after the lowering, the youngest that a deaconess could be ordained was 40. So there's a big difference there, right? 40 was really past the age of childbearing as it was seen in the ancient world. You were an elder at that point. You were, you were an older person. And the second big difference is, is that a deacon, a male deacon, was permitted to be married before his ordination and maintain that marriage. Hmm. He was allowed to, to, to be married, have children, continue to procreate while he was a deacon. He could be elevated to priest, to presbyter, and still remain married from the age of 30 on. Uh, it's the age for, for ordination to priesthood, according to the canons. Whereas the the deaconesses always had to remain celibate. They either had to be a virgin or they had to uh, be a widow. And they would, if they remarried or had any uh, sexual relations after their ordination to deaconess, they were deposed. So there's very strict rules about that. So it was a celibate ministry, which tells you it's very different than what was expected of the male deacons. And probably has to do with something about uh, the roles that they played within the church. And those were... Uh, sexually differentiated roles. They had different purposes because the church understood that male and female are distinct. They're different. And therefore, the way that these ministries are going to operate was based in that, that kind of complementarity between male and female and what they were called to do. You had mentioned the uh, deaconess rule died out in about the 12th century. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on why that was? Uh, what, what happened? Probably just suppositions based on what we know the deaconesses actually did. So in the in the time when deaconesses flourished, one of the primary functions was in bringing people into the church. You had this large number of adults being received into the church, being catechized, and being baptized. And what we know about what the function of the deaconess was from various writings is that uh, they were responsible for, first of all, catechizing women because women were separated from men in classrooms at that point. They had, you know, for lots of different reasons. And so the, the deaconess 
would be ideally a trained person and they receive and they receive a blessing from the bishop because technically the bishop is the the teaching authority in a church and so he's giving a blessing to the deaconess to teach the women uh, and catechize them and prepare them and then in the actual baptism all baptisms at that time were completely in the nude mm -hmm. and so for the sake of seemliness the deaconess was involved in the actual uh taking the women into the water on, be, on behalf of the presbyter and bishop that was present and also administering the holy chrism because that was put over the naked body after they got out of the water including on on the uh, the private parts of the person it was the whole body was anointed with with the holy chrism at that time hmm. and so the the male clergy who were there either had to avert their eyes look the other way or there was some there's Perhaps there were some, you know, curtains or sheets, but they were professing the sacramental words. You know, you were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whereas the deaconess would be the one with the woman down in the water doing the physical act for the sake of uh, propriety. So they had an important role there. And as this movement of adults coming to the church sort of faded out in Byzantium, one of the major functions of the deaconess faded out as well. And in addition to that, now that we have a lot of adult converts coming back into the church, we have not returned to that custom of fully nude baptism, at least not that I'm aware of anywhere. Right. When we do right. it in practice. So this is something that, that changed as well, is, is the way that we, we baptize adults. Generally speaking, we, we put some type of a robe on them or something like that as they are baptized today. So I think that's one of the, the reasons that um, they kind of faded out. Another thing is that we've kind of moved away from all these different visible signs of separating the sexes. So for example, it is very uncommon today in Chalcedonian churches, Byzantine tradition churches, to separate the men and women on opposite sides of the church. You know, it used to be that the men stood on one side of the church, usually the right side. The women with their children, young children, stood on the left side. There's oftentimes uh, a raised, you know, kind of a, a barrier that would split the church that went towards the um, the cathedra uh, or Amvon in the middle of the uh, the church that physically kept them on opposite sides. And the deaconesses helped keep order on the women's side and also helped lead the uh, the responses. So the Lord have mercies, the hymns, you know, there was some sense that the, the deaconess was, was uh, responsible for leading those responses. There's no evidence that they ever intoned anything like a male deacon would have. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence of that, but there's definitely evidence that the deaconess would have been there as kind of a choir director, so to speak, right? Uh, leading the, mm -hmm. the women in responding to the, you know, and also keeping order. So if there's talking or whatever, they would, uh, they would have gone over and quieted down the, the women or children that were talking or making noise. So they had a very important function there, but we don't separate the churches pretty much anymore. Um, I think I've only seen it on a few occasions in traveling around mm -hmm. the Orthodox world. Uh, so that's another another aspect of this. And we generally don't separate education any longer. We don't catechize men and women separately. And so therefore, you know, there wouldn't be a, a need to have a educated woman with a certain uh, authority given by the church to do that catechism for all the women in isolation from the men. So these okay. are all things that have changed over time. So our project is about examining the call for restoration that we're hearing mm -hmm. about uh, today. And so as you think about that current call to restore the female diaconate, I'd love to know your thoughts in, in light of what you have told us uh, historically, uh, what that function was. Sure, well, I think, I think part of the problem is that the, the question might be coming from the wrong place. So first of all, the, the idea of like a restoration, so that word is, is the one being used frequently Anytime we speak of restoration, it's, it's always fraught with major problems because it's a type of archaeology. It's like a, it's going through texts. It's looking at little references here and there and trying to rec recreate something. But it's impossible to see the whole picture. It's impossible to, to know all the little facets of this and how it was actually practiced. So it's not really a living tradition within the Byzantine or Chalcedonian churches. It's not something that we can look to and say, oh, but this, uh, you know, this part of Russia or this part of Greece has maintained this in exactly the same form for the last thousand years. So we can kind of look to that. Uh, we're actually recreating it from from texts. And that always leads to 
to concerns for how it's going to be uh, recreated and whether it's authentic or not. I think also I, I am familiar with, uh, you know, Father Alexander Schmemann was asked uh, when he was alive about female ordination in general. And he said that he thought the question was coming not from the bosom of the church, but more so from the secular world, from ideas of egalitarianism, from accusations of clericalism. So I would be very hesitant to, you know, to uh, dive into this, this idea of restoration when it oftentimes seems that, that many of the opinions about it seem, seem rooted in, in modern political discourse and philosophical ideas that, that aren't really coming from the heart of the church's theology and sort of its biblical and, and patristic tradition. One of the evidences I see of that is that many of the proponents of, of restoring the deaconesses, they oftentimes ignore or, uh, or want to reinterpret the, the canons that we mentioned. So I don't see those, those proponents stating that they will uh, only want to have older women ordained, nor women who are absolutely celibate, wh whether widows or you know, lifelong virgins. In fact, it seems like many of the descriptions I'm finding from various proponents sounds more like they want a female version that is identical to the male diaconate, which as I mentioned, the canons make very clear that there's some kind of distinction here. When you ignore the original context, the original canons, original descriptions, you're, you're really creating something new. You're not restoring anything. I think a good example comes from there have been multiple churches in, uh, in North America over the last maybe 30 years that tried to, they said, restore the kiss of peace during the divine liturgy for the laity. You know, the clergy still do it, but they wanted to bring back the kiss of peace for the laity. But the, the circumstances in which that happened, there was this sense that you only gave the kiss of peace to someone who was in the same station as you uh, spiritually or theologically. So in the, in the altar, only the bishop gives the kiss of peace directly to another bishop, only a presbyter, presbyter, and deacon to deacon. In the laity, the men and women were separated, and only the men gave the kiss of peace to other men, and the women on the other side gave the kiss of peace to each other. So there was a sense of propriety. That doesn't prevail anymore. So trying to restore it, obviously, a lot of people didn't want to do that. So they tried to recreate something and sometimes even borrowed from, say, the Protestants and, and turned it into the handshake of peace, hmm. you know, so for more for you know, because they wanted to create something. So here you see something that, uh, you know, a, a very minor example of something that they have tried to restore, but it does not really get to the heart of what the original intention was and doesn't take into consideration the difference in circumstances between then and now. So kind of a restoration without historical context. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, and from the literature I've read, I think that there's a, uh, that many of the people in favor of it are just simply ignoring the original biblical and patristic vision of, of male-female complementarity. There's a sense that they think that women should be offered some sort of route into ministry that is equal to what a man does. But we just don't have evidence that the female diaconate was identical to the male diaconate for all the different you know, opinions about it. Uh, and we don't have the exact same situation that would that would warrant it. So it, it seems to me that it's not rooted in that original vision. And many of the other things that went along with emphasizing the the distinction between male and female, uh, for example, head coverings and uh, separation, you know, in, in, the, in the laity between male and female. Nobody wants to restore that. You know, very few people are saying, let's bring all that back. Let's go back uh, and restore this complementarity and make it clear that there's this vision in the scripture and in the fathers of male and female, that although we are distinct, our distinctions come together and fulfill each other. For example, the way St. Maximus, the confessor, describes the way that male and female uh, sort of move toward one another in a unity, but they don't lose what it means to be male or female. They come together and overcome the, the tension or distinction of the fall, but not becoming something they're not. There's, there's no sense of that in the, in, the, uh, in the literature of the fathers. There's a sense of sanctifying what's good about being male or being female. But I'm concerned that this idea of, of bringing back the deaconess is really just about trying to create some kind of an egalitarian movement beyond sexual differentiation. If there's any sense of that whatsoever, 
it certainly is not a reflection of the tradition of the church, which really saw men and women uh, and their respective gifts being sanctified within the life of the church. We have equal access to God, but we're not identical. You know, we're not identical in the, in the way that we, we interact with God or interact with one another as male and female. So as an Orthodox priest, if it wasn't the case that the real motives were kind of, we were wondering about, you know, what, what is really being asked for is, uh, you know, an egalitarian approach, what would you say about the actual need of female deacons uh, today in our culture? Do you, do you sense that there is anything legitimate in that uh, request? They can see a place for, for women to be more involved. I don't think that they necessarily have to have some kind of ordained position, especially one that's kind of modernized and recreated for a very different circumstance. So, for example, there still may be instances in which a priest going into a certain situation might be going into an intimate space, like going to a, a female shut-in or something like that where there's no one around. We don't have that as much today because a lot of times, for example, uh, as a priest, when I go visit those who are ill, and sometimes they're in a assisted living facility or something where there's nurses and there's staff around. It's not very private. Mm -hmm. So it's not really an intimate space. But you still might have those, those instances. But there's no sense that you have to have uh, a deaconess do this. So, for example, the sense that there may be necessity to have a female present for propriety. Why not the priest's wife, for example? Why is there not a, a movement to subsidize uh, clergy wives that they don't have to work other jobs or they can be with their husbands and, and go to these, these intimate spaces? You know, many of them are seminary trained themselves. Many priest wives have gone to seminary with their husbands or, or met their husbands in seminary. Uh, why not just, uh, you know, train females? Uh, in my parish, I have, I have a couple of ladies in my parish who make visits to the sick all the time. They see themselves as modern day mirror bearing women and they go out and they they go and visit and they do these calls and to the the sick and elderly in the parish and they they certainly help me out and i don't have to give them some sort of a official title to do that you know they they do that as part of just their personal christian ministry the idea that there has to be an, uh, a rank and order for them to do this i don't think that is clericalism because the idea that you you if you don't have an ordained position with a title to go along with it, uh, you know, that your ministry somehow is not effective or real, that is actually clericalism. That's, that's the idea that, you know, and when, when all this, this pushback, you know, about clericalism has happened in the last decades, you would think that we would want to uh, empower the laity to do more, which is what most priests are doing, I think, today. Most, most priests I know are training and empowering their laity to go and do more, to do more charity, to do more uh, you know, ministry to people in need in their parish, those who, uh, you know, who need that, that assistance. And, you know, I don't know how often I've, uh, various ladies in my parish, when we have gone, when we've gone to the hospital, I've had little crews of women go with me and help out and uh, be present, sometimes sing the service with me when I do the, the, the service for uh, uh, distributing the Eucharist to the, to the sick. Mm -hmm. And so, they don't need a special title to do that, per se. I, I think that it, it, it definitely smacks of clericalism to think that we have to have a title and, and just to, to sort of wrench something from antiquity that had a very unique place, a very unique function for that time, and then to try to reinvent it for now so that someone can have a title, um, I think is, is, uh, is something problematic. Well, this has been very helpful. Is there anything else, Father Joseph, that you'd like to add to the discussion? I think the, the only other thing I would say is that, um, is that I'm concerned that there, there might be also another, another hint of hypocrisy because the very same voices that say that there really is no difference between male and female, that, that sort of egalitarian push, are the ones who, who say that women need to have their own ministry. Because if there really is no difference, as they're saying, then why can't the man do everything then? Why does there have to be a separate ministry? So I think it's really it's really an Ouroboros. You know, they're kind of it's they're eating their own tail if they think that on the one hand, male and female are identical and can do everything the same, but yet we have to have a separate thing for women that acknowledges that they can do it this way. You know, this distinct female way. So it's kind of 
it, it seems like a, a an, an internal contradiction to me when I when I think about mm. it. Well, we want to thank Father Joseph Lucas, an Orthodox Christian priest, theological scholar, and practical philosopher. He received his Ph.D. in theology from the St. Irenaeus Orthodox Theological Institute at Radboud in the Netherlands. Thank you, Father Joseph. Thank you. Author, speaker, and podcaster Frederica Matthews Green has been the wife of an Orthodox priest for over 30 years. She and her husband, Father Gregory Matthews Green, came to Orthodoxy from the Episcopal Church, where Father Gregory was a priest. I asked her about her perspective on the current call for a restoration of the female diaconate today. There was something that I've observed, and I guess I, I should say first, I don't really have an opinion one way or the other. I realize that it's there's so much material to digest in order to understand it. Um, so I never did formulate any opinion, but I did notice something. That even though there was so much emphasis, discussion of this, there was the, for example, the 1988 consultation in Rhodes, um, which made it, it's concluding recommendations were that we should revive the female diaconate. Um, well, here's what I noticed. Do you know what happened after that, John, after that consultation? Nothing happened. There wasn't a response of a yearning for female deacons arising throughout the whole church, lay people and parish clergy and hierarchs, monastics. If the Holy Spirit wanted this to happen, wouldn't there be a hunger for it all through the church, even all around the world, we would see people saying we, we long for a return of the female diaconate. The monks on Mount Athos <laughs> would be demanding it. Elders, living saints everywhere would be saying, yes, we, we greet this with joy. We want this to happen. And that just didn't happen. But it could have, you know, if it was the Holy Spirit's will. And maybe it could happen sometime. But the thing is, in our church, you really can't do anything from the top down. You can't um, make a proposal for something to change and then have it kind of trickle down. We don't have what the Catholics have, which is a magisterium that would formulate what we believe and just hand it down to us. What we have instead in Orthodoxy is community. We have community memory. So a change like this needs to find a responsive bubbling up from the roots, from the whole congregation, the whole community, every monastery and every land, there would be a responsive yearning. And that's not what happened. What, what happened was basically nothing. And so I, I felt like if this was the right moment, if this was the Holy Spirit, then it's like we would arise with joy and embrace it. And that, that just didn't happen. There was one other thing I've noticed that I wanted to mention, which is for some reason when a cause like this emerges, um, something that is designed to, it's a longing to bring orthodoxy more into alignment with contemporary norms on other issues as well. For some reason, it always emerges out of academia. It's always Orthodox people who are associated one way or another with a college or a university. It's, it's not the Orthodox doctors or Orthodox lawyers, it's Orthodox professors. And I don't know why that's true, but I, I have noticed that as a, as a consistent um, a way that this tends to go. And then the other thing is that other sorts of ideas like that about sexuality or, or other things, but just like with this one, it doesn't seem to find a responsive longing within the community as a whole. The ideas don't really take root. Um, they, they're vehemently <laughs> argued about online, of course, but it doesn't trickle down into ordinary Orthodox life. You don't see, you know, monasteries and parishes joyously embracing this. So then what about the current need? 
As a longtime Korea in the Anayoki Orthodox Church and now living with Father Gregory in retirement, attending your son's GOA parish in Tennessee, where do you see a need for deaconesses on a practical level? Yes, yes, and um, uh, it, it seems to me that the needs are being met as best they can by people who are not ordained. I don't see that ordination would make uh, would be a great advance, or I, if I was ordained, I, I don't think it would help me. What I need is wisdom, you know? What I need is a better prayer life, and if I was, um, you know, a deacon, I, I don't see how that would make a difference. It might make me more impressive to the person I'm talking to or comforting. You know, on the other hand, it might seem like there's a barrier between us and you're up on a different level. Um, I, I would have to say that our deacon's wife, uh, Ina Odell, Shamasi Ina Odell, was a much better priest's wife than I was to watch her going into the parish and helping people, praying for them and being there for them. You know, when I was traveling and writing and doing other things, you don't even have to be the priest's wife. You just need a heart for it. And I think she was very effective, and I hope I was too. I don't see that ordination would make much difference. One of the reasons given for needing a restored female diaconate is the ministry of one woman to another. Some of the issues women face can make it difficult or embarrassing to speak to their male priest. What has been your observation, Federica? Well, there's, there's no reason they couldn't unburden their soul to a woman um, the woman cannot grant absolution or hear a confession, but the woman can be a friend that helps and supports her. I don't think that ordination is required to be a good listener, you know, to be a helper, to be somebody who other women would lean toward. I, I certainly saw that with excellent Shamasi Ina Odell. People flocked to her and she, she didn't need to be ordained to help them. Um, if it's a question of what are required to say something in confession, but you're too embarrassed or too chagrined, um, too ashamed uh, to speak it out loud, boy, everybody has that. And we can deal with it in different ways. We can use um, euphemisms and talk around something. And the priest has been hearing so many confessions over the years. He's heard it all, and he will probably figure out what you're not quite saying. Just do your best in the confession and um, leave it up to the Lord and receive the absolution that the priest offers you. I know you attended Episcopal Seminary with your husband prior to coming to Orthodoxy, but were you ordained back then? <laughs> no, I actually wasn't. I went to seminary, my husband and I at the same time, the Episcopal Ser Seminary in Virginia. And um, I wanted to be ordained. We wanted to have a team ministry, but they had just approved women's ordination. And so we felt like, well, let's wait a few years, you know, and he was ordained. I would wait and then we would start off. Um, and what happened was I saw how very difficult the life of a, of a priest is. And I decided that it required so much patience and so much just strength that I was not cut out for that. So I've taken a much easier line of work. <laughs> so you and Father Gregory found a home in Orthodoxy after observing the eventual path the Episcopal Church took toward women's ordination and other issues. There are some who cite that path as a reason to be concerned about the female deaconesses in Orthodoxy today. What would you say to that? Hmm. I, I would say if it's a concern, it's a valid concern. We need to listen to people and not dismiss what they're saying. You know, don't, don't call somebody stupid or saying, you know, you're just not connecting the dots or something like that. If people are concerned about that, then respect that and honor their sense of concern, their worry. Listen to them. Listen to what they're saying. Understand, even if you don't agree with it, understand what they're saying. Um, I think my husband would respond emphatically that that is what he saw. Um, I was never quite as involved at the, um, like the official Episcopal level. I wasn't looking up at the National Church. I was looking at our Episcopalian congregation more of the time. I don't have as vivid sense of it as my husband does, but he would emphatically agree. Some are asking where the more pan-Orthodox call is. 
Most of the momentum seems to be rooted only in one jurisdiction, although not exclusively, if you look at the advisors and supporters of the St. Phoebe Center. Well, it, it would be a concern of mine for the reason I stated earlier, which is if the Antiochians and OCA are not, you know, they're hearing this and they're not convinced, then maybe there's something not quite, we're not quite ready for it. Maybe this is not the time, or maybe it's just off, off base in some way or another. Um, so that itself should be a sign that we should be doing things all together. We should be a community, and you should be hearing the demands for women deacons coming out of Mount Athos, as I said. Without that, if it's kind of a lone ranger thing, and if it's mostly an academic thing where people are, you know, they're, they're in the business of discussing and debating ideas, and it's not actually in the grassroots, all of that would be a sign to me that it's something that takes more uh, probably takes more reflection. Now, I, I want to say I did see that in, in the Episcopal Church as times changed. When I was in seminary in the mid-70s, I was emphatically in favor of women in the priesthood, and I rejoiced to see that and see my friends ordained and hoped that before long it would be me. So I had no problem with that. But um, what what I did see is the National Church went gradually from saying... Uh, no women's ordination to, yes, you know, the, a bishop can choose to do it, and there are very few bishops then. And then, well, now it's the accepted thing, and then you're not allowed to not receive a woman priest, even if you don't want to ordain her. If somebody else has ordained her, she has to be able to serve as a priest. So it was like the, the knot kept getting tighter and tighter, until finally the ones who had held the historic position were completely disenfranchised. So it was a, it was a gradual thing, but I did see that happen. Well, as you know, it's far too easy for discussions to get contentious, especially on social media, where you don't have to sit in a room with the person you disagree with. Somehow you found a way down through the years to engage more ironically to your credit. What is the key to disagreeing agreeably without personal attack. Yes, um, and I, I think that has, um, it's been easy for me perhaps because back when my, most of my work was for the pro-life cause, I spent a lot of time just doing dialogues with pro-choice people. And I learned how to you know, use the term they want to call themselves by and how to be patient and calm, even just face to face with people I totally disagreed with. So I, I find that it's, I would say it's more productive. You have a better chance of persuading. If you, if you are kind, if you're gentle, reflect back to the person what they're saying. Reflect it accurately. Don't, you know, mischaracterize it or distort it. You can say, what I hear you saying is this. This is your concern. And make it a, a generous and accurate and comprehensive analysis. And then you can say, here's where I disagree. But listen to people and let them know they've been listened to. There is never any reason to be ad hominem. And I, I came to that conclusion because I realized that being angry in the abortion issue, being angry at the other side, was not going to work because we needed to persuade people. You don't win anything unless you can persuade people that what you're saying is right. And you can't persuade people by humiliating them. If you went to a debate and the side you were on, the guy did a terrible job and got kicked around the block, you wouldn't say, oh, I guess the other side is right. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't change your mind. You just feel angry because your side didn't win. So remember, your goal is to gently persuade someone, get them to rethink what they are very sincerely thinking, honor their sincerity, listen to them, reflect accurately what they're saying, and then you can say, now I want to tell you what I think. And you can ask them to reflect back to you. I used to say in, that, um, in the abortion issue that the two sides were not trying to come to an agreement. We were not intending to agree with each other. We were trying merely to understand each other. And we wanted to be able to come to an understanding without having to agree. And that was my goal, and that can be the goal with this issue as well. 
And I wanted to add one more thing, that um, I have found much more scope for my particular gifts, such as they are, and my ministries in the Orthodox Church than I ever had in the Episcopal Church. That in the Episcopal Church, I was on the wrong side, you know, because I was pro-life, because I was conservative. Even when I was still liberal on, on the women's ordination thing and looking forward to ordination one day, um, I, I was not invited to come and speak at Episcopal churches. But pretty much the minute I became Orthodox, people were reaching out to me from Orthodox conventions and um, groups and churches and wanting me to do retreats, like immediately inviting me to write for them. It, this whole world opened to me where I was at last able to exercise my communication gifts that had been denied to me in the Episcopal Church because I was, quote, on the wrong side. So I'm very happy to be an Orthodox Christian and a priest's wife, and I feel that doors have been opened to me. You know, when Protestants say to me, oh, you can't ordain women, you can't have women preachers. I say, what about St. Nina? What about St. Mary Magdalene? What about, you know, there's a whole list of women preachers. There are so many things women can do outside the altar, the whole world is open to lay people. Most of God's work gets done in the world. You don't have to be within eight feet of an altar to do it. And um, most women, women in orthodoxy can do most of the things that a Protestant pastor does, including preaching and teaching and counseling. Um, you, you would have to be ordained in some of those churches to be allowed to do those things. But we don't need that in orthodoxy. So I rejoice to be here, and I'm very, very grateful. Well, and the orthodox world is grateful to you, Frederica, for your writing, speaking, and insights into the faith, which frankly has helped show many of us the truth and beauty of orthodoxy. Thanks be to God, and I thank God for ancient faith and for providing uh, the platform that we can operate from. I appreciate that. Dr. Mary Ford, recently retired after 33 years as Associate Professor of New Testament at St. Tikhon's Orthodox Theological Seminary, wrote an article in the Rule of Faith Journal entitled, Continuing the Pattern, Orthodox Church Architecture in Light of the Old Covenant Temples and Its Implications for a Controversial Contemporary Issue. This section was particularly relevant to our topic. It seems hard to understand how those who are calling for women to be ordained as deacons and priests, including those who believe that their daughters and granddaughters will never feel at home in the Orthodox Church unless they see women serving in the altar, can imagine that girls and women are not being honored or valued when our church in every liturgy entrusts all the lay people, men, women, boys, and girls, to pray and to prepare for receiving Christ's body and blood, and to strive to become saints. How is this not enough, when every girl and every woman can achieve the highest possible goal for any human being, deification, becoming a saint, or even becoming equal to the apostles, like St. Mary Magdalene? Not to mention the fact that the prime example of that highest achievement for any human being, whether male or female, is a woman, our All Holy Lady Theotokos. In this very confused and troubled time in which we find ourselves, we especially need to have the male sacramental priesthood. We need to relearn about complementarity, about how we as men and women need to be united while fully appreciating our real differences and rejoicing in them with thanksgiving to our all-gracious Lord who had made us this way. We need to better understand the crucial role of the laity and of prayer, the true means of making spiritual progress, of attaining holiness. We need to overcome clericalism, believing that only the clergy are doing what's really important, and to overcome a feminist tendency only to value what men usually do or customarily have done. In our Orthodox history, we have vastly more women saints than saints who were priests. Mm -hmm. 